16. Nate wasn't surprised to find Bing Karlovsky had a sheet. It wasn't a big shock to assistant to find charges of assault and battery, simple assault, aggravated assault, resisting arrest, drunk and disorderly on that sheet. Running names, whether or not he officially had a case, was basic procedure. Patrick Galloway might have died while Nate was still learning to handle his first second-hand car, but Max Hallbaker had died on his watch. So he ran Bing. He ran Patrick Galloway and printed out his record of minor drug pops, loitering, trespassing. He worked steadily down his list, discovering that Harry Minor had a disorderly conduct and injury to property. Ed Wolcott had a sealed juvie, a DUI. Max had racked up a few trespassing, disorderly conducts, and two possession pops. John Malmont, two D&Ds. Jacob E2 came out clean, and Mackey Sr. had a fistful of D&Ds, simple and aggravated assaults, and injuries to property. He didn't spare his deputies, and saw that Otto had mixed it up a few times in his younger days with disorderly conducts, assault and battery. Charges dropped. Peter, as he'd suspected, was as clean as fresh snow. He made lists, notes, and added them to his file. He played it by the book as much as he was able. The problem was, as he saw it, he hadn't read the book starring the small-town chief of police nipping his way up the investigative food chain behind a state cop. He considered it wise, or at least politic, to filter all his inquiries through Coben. Hardly mattered, Nate decided when he hung up the phone, as none of those inquiries could be answered. Yet. Anchorage was urban, which meant it had all the bogging red tape and backups of an urban area. Autopsy results, not yet in. Lab results, not yet in. The fact that the chief of police of lunacy knew in his gut Maxwell Hawbaker had been murdered didn't carry much weight. He could take the easy way and let it drag him down. Nate figured he'd taken the easy way for a long time now. Or he could use his underdog status to rise to the occasion. Sitting at his desk, with the snow falling soft and steady outside his window, Nate couldn't quite see the way to rise. He had little to no resources, little to no autonomy, a force that was green as a shamrock and an evidentiary trail that pointed its bony finger straight to suicide. Didn't mean he was helpless, he reminded himself as he got up to pace. To study his case board, to stare hard into the crystal eyes of Patrick Galloway. You know who did you, he murmured. So let's find out what you can tell me. Parallel investigations, he decided. That's the way he was going to proceed. As if he and Coben were running separate investigations that ran along the same lines. Rather than sticking his head out the door, he went back and made use of the intercom. Peach, call over to the lodge and tell Charlene I want to talk to her. You want her to come over here? That's right. I want her to come over here. Well, it's still breakfast time, and Charlene sent Rose home. Ken thinks the baby might come a little earlier than expected. Tell her I want her to come over as soon as possible and that I shouldn't have to keep her long. Sure, Nate, but it might be easier if you just went over and... Peach, I want her here before lunchtime. Got that? All right, all right. No need to get snippy. And let me know when Peter gets back from patrol. I need to talk to him, too. Awful chatty today. She cut off before he could comment. He wished he'd gotten better pictures of the snowshoe prints. By the time he'd driven into town, picked up the camera, driven back to Meg's, fresh snow had been falling. He didn't know what the hell a bunch of snowshoe tracks was going to tell him, and he hesitated to pin them up. But it was his case board, for what it was worth. He was tromping around in the dark, just as he'd been tromping around in the woods the night before. But if he kept going, he got somewhere eventually. He grabbed a few tacks and pinned up his shots. Chief Burke? Apparently, Peach had taken a cue from him, as her formal tones came through his intercom. Judge Royce is here, and he'd like to see you if you're not too busy. Sure. He grabbed the buffalo plaid blanket he'd brought in as a makeshift drape for his board. Send him back, he said, and tossed the red and black checks over the board. Judge Royce was mostly bald, but wore the thin fringe that circled his dome long and white. He had Coke bottle glasses perched on a nose as sharp and curved as a meat hook. He had what the polite might call a prosperous build, with a wide chest and a heavy belly. His voice, at seventy-nine, resounded with the same power and impact as it had in his decades on the bench. 
His thick, dung-colored corduroy pants swished as he walked into Nate's office. With them he wore a matching corduroy vest over a tan shirt, and the off-key adornment of a gold loop in his right ear. Judge? Coffee? Never say no, he settled himself in a chair with a windy sigh. <sighs> Got a mess on your hands. Seems it's on the hands of the state authorities. Don't shit a shitter. Two sugars in that coffee. No cream. Carrie Hallbaker was by to see me last night. She's going through a bad time. Your husband ends up with a bullet in his brain. Yep, it's a bad time. Pissed at you. Nate handed the coffee over. I didn't put the bullet in his brain. Nope. Don't figure you did. But a woman in Cary State doesn't quibble at taking a shot at the messenger. She wants me to use my influence to have you removed from office, and hopefully run out of town on a rail. Nate sat, contemplated his own coffee. You got that much influence? Might, if I pressed the matter. Been here twenty-six years. Could say I was among the first lunatics in lunacy. He blew once on the steaming surface of his coffee, sipped. Never in my life had a decent cup of cop coffee. Me either. Are you here to ask me to resign? I'm cantankerous. You get to be when you hit eighty. So I'm practicing, but I'm not stupid. Not your fault Max is dead, poor slob. Not your fault there was a note on his computer claiming he killed Pat Galloway. His eyes were very alert behind those thick lenses as he nodded at Nate. Yeah, she told me that one, and she's trying to talk herself into you making that up, so you can tie things up neat and tidy. She'll get past that. She's a sensible woman. And you're telling me this because? It might take her a little while to remember how to be sensible. Meanwhile, she might try to make trouble for you. It'll help her through the grief. I'm gonna smoke this cigar. He pulled a fat one out of his shirt pocket. You can find me for it once I have, if you've a mind to. Nate pulled open a desk drawer, dumped out the contents of a tin of pushpins. Rising, he walked over, handed it to the judge as an ashtray. You knew Galloway? Sure. The judge puffed the cigar to life and filled the air with its subtle stink. Liked him well enough. People did. Not everybody, as it turns out. He glanced toward the draping blanket. That your dead board under there? When Nate didn't respond, he puffed and sipped. Puffed and sipped. I tried capital cases back in the dark ages. Presided over them when I was wearing robes. Now, unless you think I climbed up no name when I was past sixty and put an end to a man half my age. You should be able to cross me off your list of suspects. Nate leaned back. You had a couple of simple assault pops. Royce pursed his lips. Been doing your homework. A man who's lived as long as I have, lived up here as long as I have, and hasn't gotten into a tangle, couldn't be a very interesting man. That may be. A man who's lived here as long as you could probably handle the climb if he put his mind to it. And an axe against an unarmed man makes up for any age difference, theoretically. Royce grinned around his cigar. You got a point. I like to hunt and spend some time with Pat out in the bush a time or two, but I don't climb. Never did. You can verify that if you ask around. It only took once, Nate thought, but filed the statement away. Who did? Who did climb with them? Max did, as I recall. First season he was here. Ed most likely did, and Hop, both of them once or twice on easy summer climbs, I'd say. Harry and Deb, they both like to climb. Bing's been up a few times. Jacob and Pat did a lot of climbing, a lot of hiking and camping together, or working as a team to guide paying customers. Hell, more than half the people in Lunacy take a whack at the mountains. More than that, who've been here and gone? He was a good climber, from what I'm told. Made some of his living, such as it was, taking people up. A winter climb. Who around here would have been capable of a winter climb on that mountain? Don't have to be capable so much as willing to challenge the elements. He puffed and sipped some more. 
You going to show me the board? Since he could find no reason not to, Nate got up and removed the blanket. The judge sat where he was a moment, lips pursed. Then he pushed his bulk out of the chair and moved closer. Death robs youth, most times. You don't expect it to preserve it. He had potential. Wasted most of it. But Pat still had enough potential to make something of himself. Had that pretty, ambitious woman, smart, charming child. Had brains. Had talent. Problem was, he liked to play the rebel, so he pissed most of that away. A man would have to get fairly close in to dig an axe into another man's chest that way, wouldn't he? Seems to me. Pat wasn't much of a scrapper. Peace, love, and rock and roll. You're too young to know that era. But Pat was the sort who embraced all that crap. Make love, not war, flowers in your hair, and a roach clip in your pocket. The judge sniffed. <laughs> Still, I can see him standing there quoting Dylan or whatever when somebody came at him with an ice axe. If he knew who it was, trusted him, didn't take it seriously. There were a lot of possibilities. Max being one of them. The judge shook his head as he shifted his attention to the photographs of Max Hawbaker. I wouldn't have thought so. Get to be my age, nothing much surprises you. But I wouldn't have thought it of Max. Physically, Pat could have swatted him down like a fly. Which you've thought of? The judge said after a moment. Harder to swat flies armed with deadly weapons. Point. Max was a decent enough climber, but I wonder if he was good enough to get down that mountain in February without the help of someone with Pat's skill. I wonder how he managed that and how he lived with settling down here, marrying Carrie, raising his kids, knowing Pat was up there, that he was responsible for killing him. The argument's going to be he couldn't live with it. Sure is handy, isn't it? Pat's body found through more luck than sense, and a few days later, Max confesses and kills himself. Doesn't explain. Doesn't spell it all out. Just I did it. I'm sorry. Bang! Handy, Nate agreed. But you're not buying it. I'll be saving my money for the time being. When the judge left, Nate made additional notes. He'd need to talk to several more people now, including the mayor, the deputy mayor, and some of the town's most prominent citizens. He wrote Pilot on his pad, circled it. Galloway had gone, reportedly, to Anchorage to pick up some winter work. Had he found any? If Galloway had been playing it straight with Charlene had fully intended to come back after a few weeks, that would narrow the time of the murder to February. A big if, but working with that theory, it would be possible, with time and legwork, to verify that Max had been out of lunacy during that time frame. If so, for what purpose? If so, had he gone alone? How long had he been gone? Had he come back alone, or with a companion? He was going to have to pick his way through Carrie's memories for the answers. She wasn't going to be amenable just now. Maybe she'd talk to Coben, but if the Emmy ruled suicide, would Coben bother to follow up? There was a knock, and even as Nate rose to cover the board again, Peter stepped in. You wanted to see me? Yeah. Close the door. Question. Yes, sir, Chief. You know any reason somebody would be out snowshoeing in the woods by Meg's place in the dark? Sorry? I'm just guessing here. But I don't think most people would go out shooing around in the woods in the dark for sport. Well, I guess you could, if you were going to visit or something, or couldn't sleep. I don't get it. He gestured to the board. I found those tracks last night, when I was out practicing, giving the dogs a last run. I followed them from the road, about fifty yards up from Meg's place, and to the edge of the woods by the back of her house. Sure they weren't yours? I'm sure. How do you know they were made at night? Somebody, most anybody, might have taken a hike there any time, wanted to do some hunting or take a walk across from the lake. Good points, Nate conceded. Meg and I were out there the night Max died. Took a dip in her hot tub. Peter looked politely at the wall, cleared his throat. <clears throat> well. While we were out there, the dogs got antsy, took off into the woods. They were barking like they'd scented something carried on long enough that Meg was on the point of calling them back, but they settled down. Now, before you point out they could have treed a squirrel or chased down a moose, I found a spot where it looked like they'd rolled around in the snow, in the tracks. 
The snowshoe tracks indicated somebody stopped and stood there. I'm not Daniel Friggin Boone, Peter, but I can follow the dots. He tapped a finger on the photographs. Somebody entered the woods, far enough from Meg's as not to be seen, then walked in a reasonably direct line as someone who knew the layout and had a purpose toward the back of her house. The dog's behavior indicates they recognized this individual and considered him or her friendly. This individual then stopped at the edge of the screen of trees. If, um, I was hiking around and happened to spot you and Meg taking a dip in her hot tub, I'd probably be, you could say, hesitant to make myself known. I'd probably back off and leave with the sincere hope you didn't spot me. It'd be embarrassing otherwise. Seems to me it'd be less embarrassing altogether not to go sneaking around by her house in the dark. It would. Studying the pictures, Peter pulled on his bottom lip. Maybe it was somebody setting or checking traps. It's really Meg's property right there by her house. I mean, but a little poaching, maybe. She wouldn't like it because of her dogs. I bet she had the music going. She did. So, somebody might have headed toward the house just to see, especially if he was checking traps. Okay. It was reasonable. How about you and Otto taking a run out there, see if you can find any traps? If you do... I'd like to know who set them. I don't want to see one of the dogs hurt. We'll get right on that. He glanced back toward the board. He might have been green, but he wasn't slow. You think somebody was spying on her? Somebody who's involved in all this? I think it's worth finding out. Rock and Bull wouldn't let anybody hurt her. Even if they considered the individual friendly, anybody made any kind of threatening move on her, they'd attack. That's good to know. Let me know about those traps one way or the other, as soon as you can. Uh, Chief, I think you should know Carrie Hallbaker has been making a lot of calls, talking to a lot of people. She's saying you're trying to smear Max's character so you can puff yourself up. Most people know she's just upset and a little crazy right now, but, well, some of them, maybe some who didn't much like the idea of bringing in someone from outside, are stewing about it. I'll handle it, but I appreciate the heads up. There was concern in his dark eyes and a hint of anger on his face. If people knew you were working so hard to try to find out the whole truth, they might settle. Let's just do the job for now, Peter. Cops never win popularity contests. He wasn't going to win one with Charlene either, Nate decided, when she stormed into his office an hour later. I'm up to my ears over at the lodge, she began. Rose isn't in any shape to wait tables or anything else. And I don't appreciate you calling me over here like I'm some criminal. I'm in mourning, goddammit. And you should have some respect. I've got nothing but respect, Charlene. If it'll help any, you can cross my room off the housekeeping schedule until things get back to routine. I can deal with it myself. That's hardly gonna make a difference. With every other person in town coming in to gossip and sniff around about my pat and about poor Carrie. You think because Max went and killed himself she's got more grief than I do? I don't think it's a contest. She tossed her head, jutted up her chin. Nate figured she'd stomp her foot next, but she folded her arms instead. If you talk to me that way, I don't have a thing to say to you. Don't think I'm going to tolerate you taking that attitude with me just because you're banging Meg. You're going to want to sit down and shut up. Her mouth dropped open. Her cheeks flamed. Who the hell do you think you are? I think I'm the chief of police. And if you don't stop being a pain in my ass and cooperate, I'm going to put yours in a cell until you do. Her mouth, painted Caribbean coral, opened and closed like a guppy's. You can't do that. Probably not, Nate thought, but he was past playing with her. You want to sit around sulking and playing the injured party? I know that tune, and it gets old and boring for everybody who has to hear it. Or do you want to do something about it? Do you want to help me find out who killed the man you say you loved? I did love him, the stupid, selfish bastard. She dropped into a chair, burst into tears. He debated for five seconds on how to handle her. He walked out, grabbed the box of tissues Peach kept on her desk, and ignored his dispatcher's wide eyes. Back in the office, he dropped the box on Charlene's lap. Go ahead, have a jag. Then mop yourself up, pull it together, and answer some questions. I don't know why you have to be mean to me. If you treated Carrie like this, no wonder she's saying terrible things about you. 
I wish you'd never come to Lunacy. You won't be the only one to wish it once I find the man who killed Patrick Galloway. She lifted her swimming eyes at that. You're not even in charge. I'm in charge of this office. I'm in charge of this town. The anger that was stirring inside him felt good. It felt just. Cop juice, he realized. He'd missed it. And right now, I'm in charge of you. Did Pat Galloway leave town alone? You're nothing but a bully. You're... Answer the damn question. Yes. He packed a bag, tossed it in the truck, and left. And I never, ever saw him again. I raised our child alone, and she's never once been grateful for... Did he have plans to meet up with anyone? I don't know. He didn't say. He was supposed to get some work. We were about tapped. I was tired of living hand to mouth. His family had money, but he wouldn't even consider... Charlene, how long did he plan to be gone? She sighed, began to shred the damp tissue. Winding down, Nate thought. A couple of weeks... Maybe a month. He never called. Got in touch. No. And I was mad about that, too. He should have called after a week or two to let me know what was going on. You try to get in touch with him? How? She demanded. But the tears were dried up now. I badgered Jacob. Pat always talked to him more than me. But he said he didn't know where he was. He could have been covering for him for all I know. Jacob was still flying regularly then. So? Making regular runs, the way Meg does now. Her answer was a shrug, so Nate kept probing. Was he, or anyone else he can think of, out of town for, let's say, a week, or ten days during February of that year? How the hell am I supposed to know that? I don't keep tabs on people, and it was sixteen years ago. This month, she added, and he could see the fact that it was a kind of anniversary had just occurred to her. Sixteen years ago, Pat Galloway disappeared. I bet if you put your mind to it, you could remember a lot of details about those weeks. I was scrambling to pay the rent, just like I was more than half the time. I had to ask Hall for more hours' work at the lodge. I was a hell of a lot more worried about myself than what other people were up to. But she leaned back, closed her eyes. I don't know. Jacob left about the same time. I remember because he came by to see Pat, the day Pat left and said he'd have flown him into Anchorage if he'd known he was going. He was flying Max down and a couple others, I think. Harry. Harry was hitching a ride to Anchorage to look into a new supplier or something. Or maybe that was the year after. Or before. I don't know for sure, but I think it was then. Good. He made notes on his yellow legal pad. Anyone else? It was a slow winter. Hard and slow. That's why I wanted Pat to find some work. Town was dead. We couldn't get the tourists in. The lodge was damn near empty. And Carl gave me busy work just to tide me over. Help me out. He was a sweet man. He looked out for me. Some people went hunting. Some holed up and waited for spring. Max was trying to get the paper off the ground and was hunting up advertisers, pestering people for stories. Nobody took him seriously back then. Was he in town the whole month? I don't know. Ask Carrie. She was chasing him like a hound chases a rabbit back then. Why do you care? Because I'm in charge of this office, of this town, of you. You didn't even know, Pat. Maybe it's like some people are saying. You just want to make a big stir, get some press before you go back where you came from. I'm from here now. He answered a couple of calls including another residential chimney fire and a complaint about the Mackey brothers blocking the road with an overturned Jeep Cherokee. It wasn't like we did it on purpose. Jim Mackey stood in the thickly falling snow, scratching his chin and scowling at the Jeep that lay on its side like a tired old man taking a nap. We got it cheap, and we were hauling it home. Gonna rebuild the engine, paint her up, and sell her again. Unless we decided to keep her, his brother put in. Hook a plow up to her and give Bing some competition. Nate stood in the snow, in the miserable cold, and studied the mess. You don't have a trailer hitch, a tow bar, or any of the standard towing equipment. You just figured you'd haul this heap twenty miles with a couple of rusted chains hooked onto your truck with, what is this, bailing wire? It was working, Bill furrowed his brow. 
till we hit that rut and she rolled over like a dog playing dead. It was working fine. We were working out how to get her up again. No cause for everybody to go crazy about it. He heard the howl of what had to be a wolf, eerie and primal in the ghostly gloom. It served to remind him he was standing on a snowy, roll road on the edge of the Alaskan interior with a couple of lame brains. You're blocking traffic and obstructing the town plow from clearing the road for people who have enough sense to drive responsibly. If this had happened five miles the other way, you could have hampered the fire department on a call. Thing's gonna get this thing upright and tow it to your place. You're gonna pay a standard fee. Son of a bitch! And the fine for towing a vehicle without proper equipment or signage. Bill looked so pained that Nate wouldn't have been surprised to see tears run from his eyes. How the hell are we supposed to make a profit on this if you go around fining us and making us pay that penny-pinching Bing's towing fee? That's a puzzle, all right. Hell! Jim kicked the bald rear tire of the Jeep. Seemed like a good idea at that time. Then he grinned. We'll fix her up good. Maybe you'll want to buy her for the police department. Hook a plow to her. Cheap enough. Be useful. Take it up with the mayor. Let's get this off the road. It took Bing, his helper Pargo, both Mackies and Nate to get the job done. When it was over and Bing was towing the jeep away, Nate tried to roll the kinks out of his back. How much you pay for it? Two thousand. Bill got a gleam in his eye. Cash! He calculated, loosely, what it would cost to make it roadworthy. How much Bing would skin them for over the towing. I'm going to let this go with a warning. Next time you boys decide to be enterprising, get a tow bar. You're all right, Chief. Both Mackies slapped him on the back and nearly sent him pitching face first into the snow. Pain having cops around, but you're all right. Appreciate that. He drove the short distance back to town and swung to the curb when he saw David helping Rose out of their truck in front of the clinic. Everything okay? He called out. Baby's coming, David yelled back. Nate jumped out and took Rose's other arm. She continued to take slow, steady breaths, but she smiled at him with those melted chocolate eyes. It's okay. Everything's fine. She leaned against her husband as Nate opened the door. I didn't want to go to the hospital in Anchorage. I wanted Doc Ken to deliver. Everything's fine. My mother has Jesse, David told him. He was looking a little pale, Nate thought, and he felt considerably pale himself. Do you want me to stay? Do anything? Please say no, he thought. Call anyone? My mother's coming. Rose let David help her out of her coat. Doc said I could go any time when I saw him last checkup. Looks like he was right. Four minutes apart, she told Joanna, who hurried over. Steady and strong. My water broke about twenty minutes ago. And that, Nate decided was about all a man, even one with a badge, needed to hear. I'll let you get to it. He took Rose's coat from David, hung it up. Call if... whatever. Peter's out doing something for me, but I'll call him in if you want. Thank you. They disappeared into the back, to do things he didn't care to think about. But he dug out his phone. It rang in his hand. Burke. Chief, it's Peter. We didn't find any traps... Any sign of them, either. If you want, we can extend the search. Um, widen the parameters? No, that'll do. Head on back. Your sister's in the process of making you an uncle again. Rose? Now? Is she okay? Is she... She looked fine to me. She's here at the clinic now. David's with her. His mom has Jesse and your mom's on her way. So am I. Nate stuffed the phone back in his pocket. He should probably stand by at least until more of the family arrived. The waiting room of the clinic was as good a place as any to sit and think about tracks in the snow, and what he would tell Meg when she returned to lunacy. 17. It was a girl, eight full pounds of one, with the requisite complement of digits and a thatch of black hair. Her name was Willow Louise, and she was beautiful. This information came from Peter, who rushed into the station four hours after he'd rushed into the clinic. Knowing his job, Nate had stopped by the corner store and picked up cigars, and while he was there found a sturdy five-ring binder. It was army green, 
rather than the black he would have preferred, but he bought it, charged it to the Lunacy PD account. It would hold his notes, copies of all the reports and photos. It would be his murder book. He passed the cigars out with some ceremony to Peter, Otto, and an amused Peach. The gesture warmed the cold shoulders she'd given him since he'd snapped at her that morning. After some backslapping and smelly smoke, he gave Peter the rest of the day off. Nate hunkered back in his office, spent some time with the hole punch and the copier. He put his murder book in order. Having it and the board gave him that tangible foundation. It was cop work. It was his work. He intended to spend the next part of his shift harassing Anchorage with more calls, but Peach came in. She shut the door, sat down, and folded her hands in her lap. Problem? You think those tracks back at Meg's place are something to worry about? Well, Otto told me since you didn't. I, uh... If you told me what's what around here, I wouldn't get so irritable. Yes, ma'am. Her lips twitched at that. And don't think I'm not on to you, Ignatius. You use that agreeable tone when you want to change the subject or make someone think you're agreeable when you're not. Busted. I thought it was worth checking out, that's all. And you don't mention it to your dispatcher because maybe you don't think she's smart enough to know you're spending as much free time as you can manage out there snuggled up with Megan Galloway? No. Watching her, he tapped the corner of his murder book right, tapped it left. But maybe I didn't want to discuss said snuggling with the woman who brings me sticky buns, because she might get the wrong idea. And Peter and Otto wouldn't? They're guys. Mostly guys only have one idea about snuggling, so it didn't apply. I'm sorry I was short with you this morning, and I'm sorry I didn't keep my valued and respected dispatcher in the loop. You've got a smooth way about you, she said after a minute. You worried about Meg? I'm wondering what business anybody had sneaking around there, that's all. She'd be the first to tell you she can handle herself, and always could. But I'm of the opinion it never hurts a woman to have a good man looking out. People around here, they don't hurt each other. Oh, some fist fights now and then, or some backbiting, what have you. But it's a place you feel safe. Well, you know if you had trouble, somebody'd lend a hand. She drew the pencil out of her bun, ran it through her fingers. Now this happens, and you wonder if feeling safe was just an illusion. People get worked up, get scared and spooked. And a lot of those people are armed and territorial. And a little bit crazy, she added with a nod. You're going to want to be careful. Who did Max trust enough to let get back close, Peach? Close enough to put a bullet in his head. She played with the pencil another moment and then stuck it firmly back in her bun. You're not going to let it be suicide. I'm not going to let it be what it's not. She sighed twice. <sighs> Can't think of anybody who wouldn't have trusted. Same goes for me, and just about everyone in lunacy. We're a community. We may argue and disagree and kick some ass now and then, but we're still a community, and that's next door to family. Put it this way, who would Max have climbed with back when Galloway went missing that he'd trust well enough today? God Almighty! Staring at him, she pressed a fist to her heart. You're scaring me some. Putting it that way, you're making me think which one of my neighbors, my friends, might be a cold-blooded killer. I don't know that it's cold. But you are, she realized suddenly. When it comes down to this, you are. Bing, Jacob, Harry, or Deb, Lord God, a hop or Ed, though hop was never too keen on climbing, Mackie Sr., drunk Mike if he was sober enough, even the professor went up a couple of times, short summer climbs as far as I know. John always had a thing for Charlene. Holy hell, Nate. Just getting a picture, Peach. I guess so. Long as I can remember, anyway. Not that she looked twice at him. Well, any more than she looked twice or three times at any man when she was with Pat. Then she married Carl Hydell, what, about six months after Pat left? 
Everybody knew, including old man Hardell, that she married him for his money, for the large. But she was good to him. Okay. Her gaze flicked to his board, away again. How am I gonna look at these people straight on now? Downside of being a cop. She looked a little dazzled, and a little chagrined at being termed a cop. Guess it is. She pushed to her feet, stood in her red sweater with pink Valentine hearts around the hem. I want you to know before I say this last thing that I like Meg. I've got a lot of affection and respect for her, but I've got a lot of affection and respect for you too, and I'm hoping she doesn't break your heart. Noted. He waited until she had gone out to swivel around in his chair and stare out at the snow. A few weeks before, he hadn't thought there was enough left of his heart to break. Now he didn't know whether to be pleased or annoyed to realize there was. Recovery, he wondered, or stupidity. Maybe they were the same thing. He swiveled back and made the calls. She didn't come back that night. Nate spent it at her place with her dogs. He worked off some frustration and a growing anger in her weight room. In the morning, when the snow had slowed to a thin drizzle, he drove back to lunacy and the job. She hadn't contacted him, and that was deliberate. Inconsiderate, Meg admitted, when she settled back in the cab at Anchorage Airport. He'd probably worry some. He had worry about the woman genes if she was any judge. He'd be hurt, and he'd be mad, and that was also deliberate on her part. The man had spooked her. There'd been a look in his eye when he'd watched her climb into her plane. More than that was the sensation that look had caused to roll around inside her. She wasn't after that sort of depth and feeling and contact. Why the hell couldn't people just enjoy some good, simple sex without mucking it up with... whatever. Loyalty was one thing, and she'd give and get that, as long as the blood ran hot. She wasn't her mother, ready to roll with whoever came along. But she wasn't a woman looking to share home and hearth for the long term either. That's what he was about, and she'd known it. She'd known what was behind those sad, wounded eyes the first time she'd looked into them. She'd had no business sleeping with a man who'd want or expect more than sex. Wasn't her life complicated enough right now without feeling obliged to make adjustments for anybody else? For a man, for God's sake? She'd been smart to take the extra jobs, and she loved the feeling of being flush. She'd been smarter yet to stay away from him and lunacy for a couple extra days, settle herself down. God knew she needed to be settled for what she was about to do. She hadn't contacted Nate, but she'd contacted Coben. The body had been recovered and brought to the facilities in Anchorage. Now she was on her way to the morgue to identify her father. Alone. Another deliberate act. She'd been living her life, handling her affairs, dealing with her own details alone nearly as long as she could remember. She had no intention of changing that now. If it was her father in the morgue, and she knew in her gut it was. Then he was her responsibility, her grief, and, in a strange way, her release. This she wouldn't share, even with Jacob, the only person she loved absolutely. What she was doing was a formality, more a courtesy. Coben had made certain, in his flat and polite way, she knew that. Patrick Galloway had a record, and his prints were on file. Officially, he'd already been identified. But she was next of kin and permitted to see him, to confirm the identity, to sign papers, give her statement. Deal with it. When she arrived, she paid off the cab, steeled herself. Coben was there, waiting. Miss Galloway. Sergeant? She offered her hand, found his cool and dry. I know this is difficult. I want to thank you for coming. What do I have to do? There's some paperwork to clear. We'll streamline it and make this as quick as we can. He led her through it. She signed where she needed to sign, accepted her visitor's badge, and hooked it onto her shirt. She kept her mind blank as he led her down a wide, white corridor and did her best to ignore the vague and persistent odors that snuck into the air. He took her into a little room with a couple of chairs and a wall-mounted TV. There was a window, covered on the other side by tight, white blinds. Bracing herself, she walked to it. Miss Galloway? He touched her shoulder lightly. If you'll look at the monitor. Monitor? Confused, she turned, 
stared at the dull gray screen. The television? You're going to show him to me on television? Christ! Don't you think that's more ghoulish than just letting me... It's procedure. It's best. When you're ready. Her mouth had gone dry, with a sandy coating that tasted foul. She was afraid to try to swallow it, afraid that it would simply come up again, erupt out of her in ripe sickness before she'd even begun. I'm ready. He lifted a phone from the wall, murmured something, and picking up a remote, aimed it at the screen and clicked. She saw him only from the tops of his shoulders. They hadn't closed his eyes, was her first panic thought. Shouldn't they have closed his eyes? Instead they were staring, the icy blue she remembered filmed over. His hair, mustache, the stubbly beard were all the pure, dark black she remembered. There was no ice now to silver them, to sheen like glass over his face. Was he still frozen? She thought dully. Internally? How long did it take for heart and liver and kidneys to thaw out when a hundred and seventy pound man had been frozen solid? Did it matter? Her stomach shuddered, and she felt the tingling in the tips of her fingers, the tips of her toes. Can you identify the deceased, Miss Galloway? Yes. There was an echo in the room, or in her head. Her voice seemed to go on forever, shimmering back, tinny and soft. That's Patrick Galloway. That's my father. Coben clicked off the screen. I'm very sorry. I'm not finished. Turn it back on. Miss Galloway, turn it back on. After a brief hesitation, Coben complied. I should warn you, Miss Galloway. The media... I'm not worried about the media. They're going to splash his name around whether I worry about it or not. Besides, you might have enjoyed that. She wanted to touch him, had prepared herself for that. She couldn't say why she'd wanted that contact, her skin against his skin. But she could wait, wait until they'd done what they needed to do to the shell of him. When they had, she'd given that last touch, the touch she'd denied herself in childish peak so many years ago. All right, you can turn it off. Would you like a minute? Would you like some water? No. I'd like information. I want information. But her legs betrayed her, going loose at the knees so she had to let herself fold into a chair. I want to know what happens now, how you intend to find the person who killed him. It might be best if we discuss this elsewhere. If you come back with me to... He broke off when Nate stepped into the room. Chief Burke. Sergeant. Maggie should come with me. Jacob's waiting upstairs. Jacob? Yeah, he flew me in. Without waiting for assent, Nate took her arm. He pulled her up letter from the room. I'll get Ms. Galloway to the station, Sergeant. Her vision was blurry. Not tears, but shock, she realized. It was seeing her father dead on that screen. Dead on TV, as if his life, the end of it, had been some sort of episode. A cliffhanger, she thought giddily. One hell of a cliffhanger. So she let him guide her and said nothing to him, nothing to Jacob, nothing at all until they walked outside. I need some air. I need a minute. Pulling her arm free, she walked half a block. She could hear the traffic, busy city traffic, and could see out of her periphery the smears and blurs of color from people passing her on the sidewalk. She could feel the cold on her cheeks and the thin winter sunlight that filtered through those thickly overcast skies on her exposed skin. She drew on her gloves put on her sunglasses, and walked back. Coben contacted you? She asked Nate. That's right. Since you've been out of touch, there are some things you need to know before we talk to him again. What things? Things I don't want to discuss on the damn sidewalk. I'll get the car. Car? She said to Jacob when Nate strode away. He rented one at the airport. He didn't want you in a cab. He wanted you to have some privacy. Consider it? which I'm not. You don't have to say it, she went on when Jacob stood in silence. I can see it in your eyes. He tended your dogs while you were gone. Did I ask him to? She heard the bitchiness in her voice and swore. Damn it! Damn it, Jacob! I'm not going to feel crappy for living my life the way I've always lived it. Did I ask you to? He smiled a little, and the pat of his hand on her arm nearly broke the wall she'd built viciously against tears. They put him on a television screen. 
I couldn't even look at him. Not really. She walked to the curb when Nate pulled up in a Chevy Blazer, and climbing in, squared her shoulders. What do I need to know? He told her of Max, in the detached, straightforward style he would have used to inform any civilian with a need to know in regards to a case. He continued to speak, continued to drive with his eyes on the road, even when she turned her head to stare at him. Max is dead? Max killed my father? Max is dead, that's a fact. The medical examiner ruled it suicide. The note left on his computer claimed responsibility for the murder of Patrick Galloway. I don't believe it. There was too much churning inside her, too much beating against that defensive wall. You're saying Max Hawbaker went homicidal all of a damn sudden, stuck an ice axe in my father's chest, then climbed down the mountain and strolled back into lunacy? That's just bullshit. That stupid cop tie it up and forget it bullshit. I'm saying that Max Hawbaker is dead, that the Emmy ruled it a suicide, determining same from physical evidence, and that there was a note written on the computer, which was decorated with some of Max's blood and brains, that claimed responsibility. If you'd bothered to contact anyone over the last few days, you would have been apprised and updated. His voice was flat, and so, she noted, were his eyes. Nothing there, nothing that showed. She wasn't the only one with walls. You're being awfully careful not to express your opinion, Chief Burke. It's Coben's case. He left it at that, and pulled into the visitor's slot at the parking lot of the state police. Hallbaker's death had been ruled a suicide, Coben stated. They gathered in a small conference room. Coben had his hands folded on a file on the table. The weapon was his, and his prints. Only his prints were found on it. Gunpowder residue was found on his right hand. There was no sign of break-in or struggle. A whiskey bottle and a mug thereof were on his desk. Autopsy results prove he'd consumed just over five ounces of whiskey prior to his death. His prints, and only his, were on the keyboard of the computer. The wound, the position of the body, the position of the weapon, all indicate self-infliction. He paused. Hallbaker was acquainted with your father, Ms. Galloway. Yes. And you're aware he had occasion to climb with your father from time to time? Yes. Were you aware of any friction between them? No. You may also be unaware that Hallbaker was fired from the paper in Anchorage for drug use. My investigation indicates that Patrick Galloway was known to use recreational drugs. As yet, I found no evidence that your father sought or had gainful employment in Anchorage, or elsewhere, after he left lunacy, purported to seek same. She spared him a glance. Not everyone works on the books. True. It would appear that Hawbaker, whose whereabouts during the first and second week of February of that year cannot, as yet, be determined, met Patrick Galloway, and together they sought to climb the south face of No Name. Supposition would be that during that climb, perhaps influenced by drugs and physical distress, Hawbaker murdered his companion and left the body in the ice cave. It could be supposed that pink pigs fly... Meg returned. My father could have snapped Max in two without breaking a sweat. Physical superiority wouldn't hold up against an axe, particularly in a surprise attack. There was nothing in the cave that indicated a fight. We will, of course, continue to study and evaluate all evidence. But sometimes, Ms. Galloway, the obvious is the obvious because it's truth. And sometimes crap floats. She got to her feet. People always say suicide's a coward's way. Maybe that's valid. But it seems to me it takes a certain amount of guts and determination to put a barrel of a gun to your head and pull the trigger. Either way, Max doesn't fit the bill for me. Because either way is extreme, and he just wasn't. What he was, Sergeant Coben, was ordinary. Ordinary people do the unspeakable every single day. I'm sorry about your father, Ms. Galloway. And I give you my word that I'll continue to work the case to its conclusion. But at this time, I have nothing more to tell you. Another minute, Sergeant? Nate turned to Jacob and Meg. I'll meet you outside. He closed the door behind them himself. What else do you have? What aren't you telling her? Do you have a personal connection with Megan Galloway? Undetermined at this particular time and irrelevant. Give and take, Coben. I can tell you that there are a good half a dozen people still living in lunacy who could have climbed with Galloway that winter. People Max knew as friends and neighbors and who could have sat in that office with him on the night of his death. The Emmy's determination was made on facts, but he doesn't know the town, the people. He didn't know Max Hawbaker. 
and you barely did. Coben held up a hand. But I have evidence there were three people on that mountain at the probable time of Galloway's death. Evidence that only two of them were in that cave. Evidence, I believe, was written by Galloway's own hand. He pushed the file toward Nate. He kept the journal of the climb. There were three of them up there, Burke, and I'm dead sure Hall Baker was one of them. I'm not sure he was the second man in that cave. There's a copy of the journal in the file. I'm having an expert verify it's Galloway's writing from another sample, but eyeballing it, I'd say it is. It's up to you if you want to share that with his daughter. You wouldn't. Against the grain, so I'm to share it with you. Just like it is to admit you've got more homicide experience than I do, and a better handle on the people of that town. Lunacy fits, Burke, because I'd say you've got at least one certifiable lunatic living under your nose. He flew back with Meg, with the file tucked under his parka. After he'd read it, he decided if he'd tell her about it. Decide if he'd tell anyone. Since he couldn't quite pull off the denial that he was in the air, he did what he could to enjoy the view. Snow. More snow. Frozen water. Icy beauty with dangerous pockets. Not unlike his current pilot. Is Coben an asshole? She asked abruptly. I wouldn't say so. Is that because you cops stick together, or is it an objective opinion? Some of both, maybe. Following the evidence doesn't an asshole make. It does if either of you seriously believes Max whacked my father with an axe. I expect it better from you. See where expectations get you. She took the plane into a deep, left dip that had his stomach sloshing toward his throat. Before he could object, she dipped right. You want me puking in your cockpit, you just keep it up. Cop ought to have a stronger stomach. She nosed down with such speed he could see nothing but that white world hurtling toward them and his own mangled body in twisted, burning wreckage. His vicious, violent cursing had her laughing as she shot the plane up again. You got a death wish? He shot out. No, you? I did, but I got over it. You pull that again, Galloway, and when we're on the ground, I'm gonna knock you on your crazy ass. You wouldn't. Guys like you don't hit women. Oh? Just try me. She was tempted, was feeling just crazed enough to be tempted. You ever knock the cheating Rachel around? He looked over. There was a wildness about her, in her eyes, vivid on her face. Never even considered it. But I'm forging new territory every day. You're pissed off at me. All mopey and hurt because I didn't radio in every hour to make kissy noises. Just fly the plane. My ride's at your place. That's where Jacob picked me up. I didn't need you there. I didn't need you coming in to hold my hand. I don't believe I offered to hold your hand. He waited a beat. Rose and David had a girl, eight pounds, named her Willow. Oh? Some of that wild temper eased out of her face. A girl? They're okay? Fine and dandy. Peach says she's beautiful, but when I went to see, she looked like a really irritated guppy with black hair. Why are you talking to me conversationally when you're mad enough to pop me between the eyes? I prefer to keep things neutral as Switzerland until you land the damn plane. Fair enough. Once she had, she grabbed gear, hopped out. Slinging what she could over her shoulders, she bent to greet her excited dogs. There you are. There's my guys. Miss me? She shot a glance up at Nate. Going to deck me now? If I did, your dogs would rip my throat out. Sensible. You're a sensible man. Not always, he said under his breath as he followed her to the house. Inside, she tossed her gear aside, then went directly to the fire to stack logs and kindling. She needed to deal with the plane, drain the oil, and haul it to the shed to keep it warm, cover the wings. But she wasn't feeling practical and efficient. She wasn't feeling quite sane. Appreciate you looking out for Rock and Bull while I was gone. No problem. He turned his back, carefully laying the file under his parka. Busy, were you? Making hay. She got the fire started. Jobs fall into my lap, I take them. Now I've got a couple of nice fat fees to bank. Good for you. She dropped into a chair, hooked a leg over the arm. All insolence now. Back now. 
And it's good to see you, lover. You got time. We can go upstairs for some welcome home sex. She smiled as she began unbuttoning her shirt. Bet I could get you up for it. That's a poor imitation of Charlene, Meg. It wiped the smile off her face. You don't want to fuck me? Fine. No need to insult me. But there seems to be a need for you to hurt me, make me mad. What is it? Your problem. She pushed up, started to shove by him, but he gripped her arm and swung her back. Nope, he said, and ignored the warning growl from the dogs. It appears to be yours. I want to know what it is. I don't know! The distress in her tone turned the growls into snarls. Rock, bull, relax. Relax, she said more calmly. Friend. She knelt down, hooked an arm around each of them, nuzzled. Damn it! Why don't you yell or storm out or tell me I'm a cold, heartless bitch? Why don't you give me a damn break? Why didn't you bother to contact me? Why have you been spoiling for a fight since you saw me? Hold on a minute. She got up, snapped her fingers for the dogs to follow her into the kitchen. After digging out milk bones, she tossed one to each dog. Then she leaned back against the counter and looked at Nate. Not quite gaunt anymore, she thought. He'd put on a little weight in the last month or so. The kind that looked good on a man. The sort that spoke of muscles toning. His hair looked wild and sexy, and a little past trimming time. And those eyes, calm and wrenchingly sad and irresistible stayed level and patient on hers. I don't like being accountable to anyone. I'm not used to it. I built this place, built my business, built my life a certain way because they suit me. Are you worried I'm going to start holding you accountable? Expecting you to change the order of things for me? Aren't you? I don't know. Maybe I see a difference between accountability and caring. I was worried about you. For you and your dogs weren't the only ones who missed you. As to the order of things, I'm still working on my own, a day at a time. Tell me something. No bullshit. Are you falling in love with me? Feels like it. What does it feel like? Like something coming back inside me, warming up and trying to find its rhythm. It feels scary, he said, crossing to her. And good. Good and scary. I don't know if I want it. I don't know if I've got it. Me either. But I do know I'm tired of being tired and empty and just going through the motions so I can get by. I feel when I'm with you, Meg. I feel. And some of that's painful. But I'll take it. He cupped her face in his hands. Maybe you should try that for now, too. Just take it. She closed her hands over his wrists. Maybe. 18. Journal Entry. February 19th, 1988. He's gone crazy. Out of his freaking mind. Too much dex and Christ knows what else. Too much altitude. I don't know. I think I've calmed him down. Storm came up, so we've taken shelter in an ice cave. Hell of a place. Like some sort of miniature magic castle with ice columns and arches and sudden drops. Wish all of us had gotten here. I could use a little help bringing old Darth back to Earth. He's got some whacked out idea that I tried to kill him. We had some trouble on the rappel, and he's screaming at me into the wind that I want to kill him. Came at me like a maniac, and I had to knock him flat. Calmed him down, though. Got him calm. He apologized. Laughed about it. We'll just take a breather here and pull ourselves together. We've been playing the first thing I'll do when I'm back in the world game. He wants a steak. I want a woman. Then we both agreed we wanted both. He's still jittery, I can see it. But hell, the mountain does that to you. We need to get back to Han, get moving down, get back to lunacy. Weather's clearing, but there's a feeling in the air. Something's coming down. It's time to get the hell off the mountain. In his office, with the door shut, Nate read the last entry in Patrick Galloway's climbing journal. Took you another sixteen years to get off the mountain, Pat, he thought, because something sure as hell came down. Three went up, he thought, and two came down, and two kept silent for sixteen years.
but there were only two in that cave, Galloway and his killer. Nate was more certain than ever that the killer hadn't been Max. Why had the killer let Max live for so long? If Han equaled Max, Max had been injured. Not seriously, but enough to make the descent difficult. He'd been the least experienced and hardy of the three if he was reading correctly between the lines of Galloway's journal. But the killer had brought him down, let him live another sixteen years. And Max had kept the secret. Why? Ambition? Blackmail? Loyalty? Fear? The pilot, Nate decided. Find the pilot and the story he had to tell. He locked the copy of the journal in a desk drawer, along with his murder book, pocketed the keys. When he went out, he found Otto just coming in from patrol. Ed Woolcott said somebody broke the lock on his ice-fishing shack and took off with two of his rods, his power auger, a bottle of single malt scotch, and defaced the shack with paint. His face pink from the cold, Otto headed straight to the coffee pot. Kids, most likely. I told him he's the only one around here who locks his shack. And that just makes kids want to break in. How much is it worth, altogether? He says about eight hundred. Strike Master Power Auger runs about four hundred. Both disgust and derision covered his face. That's Ed for you. You can pick up a good hand auger for maybe forty, but he's got to fly first class. We have a description of the property? Yeah, yeah. Any kid stupid enough to show off a rod that has Ed's name brass-plated on it deserves to get busted. Scotch? They likely drank themselves sick on it. Probably just drilled a hole through the ice somewhere with the auger, did a little fishing and drinking. I expect they'll ditch the gear somewhere and try to sneak it back to the shack. It's still breaking and entering and theft, so let's follow it through. You can bet they're insured, and for more than he paid for them. You know he talked to a lawyer about suing Hawley for running him off the road back around the first of the year? A lawyer? Jesus H. Christ! I'll talk to him. Good luck! Otto sat at his desk with his coffee and scowled at his computer screen. Gotta write this up. I'm heading out, doing a follow-up on something. He paused. You do much climbing these days? What do I want to go up a damn mountain for? I can see them fine from here. But you used to. Used to tango with loose women, too. Yeah? Amused, Nate sat in the corner of Otto's desk. You're a deep pool, Otto. These women wear tight dresses and skinny high heels. Humor battled grouchiness. They did. With those sexy slits in the skirt, on the side so their legs slid out like a slice of heaven when they moved. Otto's glower lost its war with a smile. Those were the days. Bet they were. I never learned to tango or climb. Maybe I should. Stick with the tango, chief. Sure to live through that. The way some people talk about climbing, it's like a religion. Why'd you give it up? Got tired of flirting with frostbite and broken bones. His eyes darkened as he looked down into his coffee. Last time I went up was on a rescue. Party of six. Avalanche took them. We found two. The bodies. You've never seen a man taken out by an avalanche. No, I haven't. Count your blessings. That was nine years back next month. I never went up again. Never will. You ever climb with Galloway? Couple times. He was a good climber. Damn good for an asshole. You didn't like him. Otto began to play hunt and peck with the keyboard. If I disliked every asshole I met, there wouldn't be many left. Guy got himself stuck in the sixties. Peace, love, drugs. Easy way out, you ask me. In the sixties, Nate thought, Otto had been sweating in a jungle in Nam. That sort of friction, soldier and hippie, could blow up under less stress than a winter climb. You yammer about living the natural life and save the friggin' whales. Otto went on as he jabbed at keys. And what you're doing is sitting on your ass living on the government you bitch about all the time. Got no respect for that. I guess you wouldn't have had a lot in common, what with you coming from the military. We weren't drinking buddies. He stopped typing, looked up at Nate. What's all this about? 
just trying to get a full picture of the man. As he rose, he asked, casually, When you did climb, who'd you use as a pilot? Mostly Jacob. He was right here. I thought Jacob did some climbing, too. You ever go up with him? Sure. Get Hank Fielding, maybe, out of Talkeetna to fly us, or two toes out of Anchorage, Stokey Luke's if he was sober. He shrugged. Plenty of pilots around to take up a party if you got the money to pool. If you're really thinking of going up, you get Meg to take you and get yourself a professional guide, not some Yahoo. I'll do that, but I think I might settle for the view from my office. Smarter. Interrogating his own deputy didn't give him any pleasure, but he'd write up the conversation in his notes. He couldn't picture Otto going berserk on speed and attacking a man with an axe but he couldn't picture him doing the tango with a woman in a tight dress, either. People did a lot of changing in sixteen years. He went to the lodge and found Charlene and Sissy serving the early dinner crowd. Skinny Jim worked the bar, and the professor manned his stool, nursing a whiskey and reading Trollope. Got a pool starting on the Iditarod, Jim told him. You want in? Nate sat at the bar. Who do you like? I'm leaning toward this young guy, Triple Horn, and a lute. He's gorgeous, Sissy commented when she stopped by with empties. Doesn't matter what he looks like, Sissy. It does to me. Need a moose head and a double vodka rocks. Sentimental money's on this Canadian, Tony Keaton. We're sentimental over Canadians? Nate wondered as Jim poured the vodka. Nah, the dogs. Walt Noddy bred his dogs. Twenty, then, on the Canadian. Beer? Coffee. Thanks, Jim. While Jim and Sissy dealt with drinks and continued to argue over their favored mushers, Nate turned to the man beside him. How you doing, John? Not sleeping very well. Yet. John marked his page, set the book down. Can't get the image out of my head. It's tough. You knew Max pretty well. Wrote some articles for his paper. Monthly book reviews. The occasional color piece. Didn't pay much, but I enjoyed it. I don't know if Carrie will keep the paper going. I hope she does. Somebody told me Galloway wrote some pieces for the lunatic, back in its early days. He was a good writer. He'd have been a better one if he'd focused on it. I guess that's true of anything. He had a lot of raw talent, in several areas. John glanced over his shoulder toward Charlene. But he never buckled it down. Wasted what he had. Including his woman? I'd be biased on that subject. In my opinion... He didn't put much effort into his relationship or much of anything else. He had a couple of chapters of several novels, dozens of half-written songs, any number of abandoned woodworking projects. The man was good with his hands, had a creative mind, but no discipline or ambition. Nate weighed the possibilities. Three men, drawn together by location, avocation, the writing, and the climb, and two of the three in love with the same woman. Maybe he'd have turned that around if he'd had the chance. John signaled for Jim to refill his glass. Maybe. You read his stuff? I did. We'd sit around over a beer or two or some other recreational drug, John added with a half-smile, and discuss philosophies and politics, writing in the human condition, young intellectuals. John lifted his glass and toast who were going absolutely nowhere. You climbed with him. Ah, adventure. Young intellectuals don't come to Alaska without needing to have them. I enjoyed those days, and wouldn't have them back for a Pulitzer. Smiling the way a man does over past glories, he sipped at the fresh whiskey. The two of you were friendly. Yes, we were friends, on that intellectual level, in any case. I envied him, his woman, that was no secret. I think it amused him and made him feel a bit superior to me. I was the educated one. He'd tossed the prospect of a superior education away, yet look what he had. John brooded into his drink. I imagine he'd still be amused that I continue to envy him, his woman. Nate let that sit a minute, drank coffee. Did you two climb with the group or alone? Hmm... John blinked like a man coming out of a dream. Memories, Nate thought, were just another kind of dream.
or nightmare. Groups. There's camaraderie in the insanity. The best I remember was a summer climb on Denali. Groups and solos picking their way up that monster like ants on a giant cake. Base camp was like a little town all its own, and a crazed little party. You and Pat? Mmm. Along with Jacob, Otto, Deb and Harry, Ed, Bing, Max, the Hops, Sam Beaver, who died two years ago from a pulmonary embolism. Ah, uh, let's see. Mackie Sr. was there, as I recall. He and Bing started to beat the snot out of each other for something, and Hop, the deceased Hop, broke it up. Haldy was there, but he fell over drunk and cracked his head. We wouldn't let him climb. And there was Missy Jacobson, a freelance photographer with whom I had a short, intense affair before she moved back to Portland and married a plumber. He smiled at that. Oh, yes, Missy, with her big brown eyes and clever hands. Those of us from Lunacy had put our party together like a holiday. We even had a little flag we were going to stick on the summit for photo ops for the paper. But none of us made it to the top. None of you? No, not then. Pat did later, as I recall, but on that climb we were plagued with bad luck. Still, that night at base camp, we were full of possibilities and goodwill, singing, screwing, dancing under that wonderful endless sunlight, as alive as I think any of us had ever been. What happened? Harry was sick. Didn't know it. But by morning he was running a fever. Flu. He said he was fine, and nobody wanted to argue. He didn't make it five hours. Deb and Hop got him back down. Sam fell, broke his arm. Missy was getting sick. Another group coming down took her back to base. The weather turned, and those of us who were left pitched tents and huddled down, praying for it to pass. It didn't. It got worse. Ed got sick. Then I got sick. One thing after another until we had to call it and go back. Miserable end to our little town holiday. Who got you back to town? Sorry. You have a pilot? Oh. I remember being stuffed into that plane, everyone sick or pissed or sullen. Can't remember the pilot. Some friend of Jacob's, I think. I was dog sick. That I recall vividly. I wrote about it at some point, tried for a little humor in a piece for the lunatic. He polished off the whiskey. I always regretted not hoisting that flag. Nate let it go and wandered to Charlene. Can you take a break? Sure. When Rose is back on her feet. Five minutes. You're not that crowded yet. She shoved her order pad in her pocket. Five. If we don't keep things moving here, people will start going to the Italian place. I can't afford to lose my regulars. She clipped her way out of the restaurant into the empty lobby. The sound of her heels made Nate think of the tango, and he wondered what sort of vanity would overcome a woman's need for comfort when she was going to be hopping on her feet for a few hours. To your knowledge, Patrick Galloway was going to Anchorage to look for work. We've been through this? Indulge me. If he went there and got a wild hare to do a climb, who would he most likely hire to fly him to Sun Glacier? How the hell am I supposed to know? He wasn't supposed to be climbing. He was supposed to be looking for a job. You lived with him for close to fourteen years, Charlene. You knew him. If it wasn't Jacob and he was in Anchorage, it would probably have been Two Toes or Stokey. Unless he got that hair when neither of them were around, then he'd have hired whoever was handy. Or more likely have bartered something for the flight. He didn't have any money to spare. I only gave him a hundred out of my household fund. Any more, I knew he'd piss it away. You know where I can find either of those pilots? Ask Jacob or Meg. They run in that world. I don't. You should have told me they brought him back down, Nate. You should have told me and taken me to see him. There was no point in putting you through that. No, he said before she could object. There wasn't. He nudged her into a chair, sat beside her. Listen to me. It won't help you to see him that way. It won't help him. Meg saw him, and it ripped her up. I was there. I know it. You want to do something for him, for yourself? You want to find your closure? Make time to go see your daughter. Be your mother, Charlene. Give her some comfort. She doesn't want comfort from me. She doesn't want anything from me. Maybe not, but offering it might help you. He got to his feet. I'm going out to see her now. Anything you want me to tell her? 
You could tell her I could use a hand around here for the next couple of days. Unless she's got something more important to do. Okay. It was full dark when he got back to Meg's. He could see she looked calmer, steadier, and more rested. The position of the pillows and the throw on the sofa told him she'd had a nap in front of the fire at some point. He'd figured out the best way to handle things and handed her a bouquet of mixed mums and daisies he'd picked up at the corner store. They weren't particularly fresh, but they were flowers. What's this for? See? I realized we were working backward, in the traditional sense. I got you into bed, or you got me, so that pressure's off. Now I'm romancing you. Is that right? She sniffed at them. Maybe it was a cliché, but she had a weakness for flowers, and men who thought to offer them. Then the next step would be what? A pickup at a bar? I was thinking more of a date. Dinner, say. Well, you could pick me up in a bar. That works for me, too. Meanwhile, I'd like you to pack some things and come back with me to the lodge for the night. Oh. So we can still have sex during this romancing period? You could get your own room, but I'd rather have the sex. You could bring the flowers, too, and the dogs. And why would I leave the comfort of my own home to have sex with you in a hotel room? She twirled the flowers, watched him over them. Oh, for the thrill factor in our backward relationship. It's stupid enough to appeal to me, Burke, but I'd as soon stay here and we can pretend we're in some cheap motel room. We can even see if there's any porn on cable. That sounds really good. But I'd like you to come back with me. Someone was skulking around in your woods the other night. What are you talking about? He told her about the tracks. Why the hell didn't you tell me about this when it was light, so I could see for myself? She tossed the flowers down on the table and headed for her parka. Hold on. It snowed a good six inches. You won't be able to see anything. Otto and Peter already tromped around in there anyway. I didn't tell you before because you had enough on your plate. This way you had a nap and some quiet time. Pack what you need, Meg. I'm not going to be driven out of my house because somebody walked around in the woods. Even if I want to take a page out of your book of paranoia and conclude he or she was spying or up to some nefarious plan, I wouldn't be driven out. I can... Handle yourself. Yes, I know. You think I can't? She spun on her heel, marched into the kitchen. When he came in behind her, she was yanking a rifle out of the broom closet. Meg, just shut up. She checked the chamber. To his distress, he saw it was fully loaded. Do you know how many accidents go down because people keep loaded weapons in the household? I don't shoot anything by accident. Come out here. She pulled open the door. It was dark, it was cold, and he had an irritated woman with a loaded rifle on his hands. Why don't we just go inside and... That branch, two o'clock, seven feet up, forty feet out. Meg. She shouldered the rifle, got her bead, and fired. The blast of it boomed in his head. The branch exploded, six inches in. Okay, you can shoot a rifle. Gold medal for you. Come inside. She fired again, and the six inches of branch jumped on the snow like a rabbit. Her breath steamed out as she fired again and obliterated what was left. And she picked up her spent shells, walked back inside, and replaced the rifle. A plus on marksmanship, Nate commented. And though I have no intention of letting it come to that, I will point out that blasting the shit out of a tree branch isn't anywhere near the same level as putting a bullet into flesh and bone. I'm not one of your dainty lower 48 women. I've taken down moose, buffalo, caribou, bear. Ever shot a human being? It's not the same, Meg. Believe me, it's not. I'm not saying you're not smart or capable or strong, but I am asking you to come back with me tonight. If you won't, I'll stay here. But your mother could use some help with the lodge with Rose out. She's overworked and churned up about your father. Charlene and I, I can't connect with mine, you know? My mother? She barely speaks to me, and my sister stays away from both of us because she just wants to have a nice, normal life. Can't blame her. I didn't know you had a sister. She's two years older. Lives in Kentucky now. I haven't seen her in... five years, I guess. The Burks aren't big on family gatherings. She didn't come to see you when you were shot? She called. We didn't have a lot to say to each other. When Jack was killed and I was shot up, my mother came to see me in the hospital. I thought, as much as I was thinking, that maybe just... 
Maybe something would come out of all that horror. I thought we'd work our way back to each other. But she asked me if I'd stop now, if I'd resign from the force before she had to visit my grave instead of my hospital bed. I told her no, that it was all I had left. She walked out without another word. I don't think we've exchanged more than a dozen words since. The job cost me my best friend, my wife, my family. No, it didn't. She couldn't stop herself from taking his hand, lifting it to her cheek, rubbing it there. You know it didn't. Depends how you turn it, that's all. But I didn't give it up. I'm here because even at the bottom, it was the one thing I kept. Maybe it's what stopped me from sinking all the way down. I don't know. But I do know you've got a chance to make some sort of peace with your mother. You ought to take it. She could have asked me to give her a hand. She did. I'm just the filter. On a sigh, she turned around and gave the under-the-sink cabinet a testy little kick. I'll chip in some time. But don't look for happy ever after on this, Nate. Ever after is too long to worry about anyway. He dropped her off at the lodge, then went back to the station. He spent some time writing up notes from his conversations with Otto and John, then began search and run on the names of the pilots Otto had given him. He found no criminal on Stokey Luke's, nothing more than a few traffic violations. He lived in Fairbanks now and was employed as a pilot for a tour organization called Alaska Wild. Their webpage promised to show clients the real Alaska and help them bag game, reel in enormous fish, and capture scenes of the great alone, all for various package prices. Group rates available. Fielding moved to Australia in 93 and died of natural causes four years later. Thomas Kaczynski, a.k.a. Two Toes, was a different story. Nate found several pops for possession of controlled substances, intent to distribute, drunk and disorderlies, petty larceny. He'd been kicked out of Canada and his pilot's license had been suspended twice. On March 8, 1988, his body had been found stuffed in a trash bin on a dock in Anchorage, multiple stab wounds. His wallet and watch had been missing. Conclusion? Mugging. The perpetrator or perpetrators had never been identified. Shine a light on it another way, Nate thought as he printed out the data, and you have a clean-up rather than a mugging. Pilot takes three, brings back two. A couple weeks later, the pilot stabbed and stuffed in the garbage. Made a man stop and think. With the station quiet around him, Nate uncovered his case board. He brewed more coffee and dug up a can of processed ham from the storeroom to make himself what passed for a sandwich. Then he sat at his desk, studying the board, reading his notes, reading Patrick Galloway's last journal, and spent the long evening hours thinking. 19. He didn't tell her about the journal. When a woman ended the day tired and irritable, it seemed unwise to give her one more thing to add to the mix. He had to give Meg points for shoving up her sleeves and pitching in at the lodge, and bonus points for rolling out of bed the next morning and handling the breakfast crowd, especially since the tension between her and Charlene was thick enough to slice up and fry alongside the bacon. Still, when he took a table, she walked over, coffee pot at the ready. Hi, I'm Meg. I'll be your server this morning. Since I'm looking for a really big tip, I'm going to wait until after you eat to bash this pot over Charlene's head. I appreciate that. How long before Rose comes back on? Another week or two anyway, and then Charlene's going to let her set her own schedule until she feels ready for full time. You gotta say that's obliging. Oh, she's plenty obliging with Rose. She shot a short and bitter look over her shoulder in Charlene's direction. She loves her. It's me she can't tolerate. What'll it be, handsome? If I say the two of you are probably after the same things in different ways, are you going to bash me over the head with that coffee pot? I might. Then I'll have the oatmeal. You eat oatmeal? She wrinkled her sexually crooked nose. Without somebody holding a knife to your throat? It sticks with you. Yeah, for weeks. With a shrug, she walked off to take more orders, topped off mugs of coffee. He liked watching her move. Quick, but not rushed. Sexy, but not obvious. She wore the ubiquitous flannel shirt, open over a white thermal. A silver pendant bounced lightly from his chain between her breasts. She'd slapped some makeup on. He knew because he'd watched her, and slapped was the operative word. 
Fast, efficient, absent, quick brushes of color on the cheeks, shadowy stuff on the eyes, then careless flicks of mascara on those long, dark lashes. And when a man noticed how a woman handled mascara, Nate mused. He was sunk. Charlene came out with an order. Meg went back with her pad. They didn't acknowledge each other, except for the sudden dip in temperature. He picked up his coffee, pulled out his notebook to use as a shield when Charlene headed in his direction. Even a man who was sunk had enough self-preservation to stay out of the middle of two sniping women. Want me to top that off for you? She get your order? I don't know why she can't be more pleasant to the customers. No thanks. Yes, she did. And she was pleasant. To you, maybe. Because you're bawling her. Charlene. He caught the unmuffled snickers from the booth where Hans and Dexter habitually sat. God. Well, it's no secret, is it? Not any more, he muttered. Spent the night in your room, didn't she? He set his coffee down. If that's a problem for you, I can take my things to her place. Why should it be a problem for me? Despite his no thanks, she topped off his coffee in an automatic gesture. Why should anything be a problem for me? To his utter terror, her eyes filled with tears. Before he could think how to handle it, or her, she rushed out of the room, coffee sloshing in her pot. Women, Bing said from the booth behind him. Nothing but trouble. Nate shifted around. Bing was plowing through a plate of eggs, sausage, and home fries. There was a sneaky grin on his face, but if Nate didn't mistake it, a little gleam of sympathy in his eyes. You ever been married, Bing? Was once. Didn't stick. Can't imagine why. Thought about doing it again. Maybe I'll get myself one of those Russian mail-order women like Johnny Trevani's doing. He's going through with that? Sure. Got it down to two, last I heard. Thought I'd see how it works out for him, then look into it. Uh-huh. Since they were having what passed as a conversation, Nate decided to probe. Do you do any climbing, Bing? Used to some. Don't like it much. I got free time, I'd rather go hunting. You looking to recreate? Might be. Days are getting longer. You got city all over you, and a skinny build. Stick with town, chief, that's my advice. Take up knitting or some shit. I've always wanted to macrame. At Bing's blank look, Nate only smiled. How come you don't have a plane, Bing? Guy like you, likes his independence, knows his machines, seems like a natural. Too much work. I'm gonna work, it's gonna be on the ground. Besides, you have to be half crazy to pilot. So I hear. Somebody mentioned some pilot to me. Funny name. Six toes? Something? That'd be two toes. Lost three of them on one foot to frostbite or some shit. Now that was one crazy bastard. Dead now. That's so. Crashed? Nah. Got himself beat up in a fight. Oh, uh, no. Bing's brow wrinkled. Stabbed. City crime. <laughs> Teach you to live with that many other people. There you go. Did you ever go up with him? Once. Crazy bastard. Flew a bunch of us out to the bush for caribou. Didn't know he was higher than a friggin' moon until he damn near killed us. Blackened his eye for it, Bing said with relish. Crazy bastard. Nate started to respond, but Meg came out of the kitchen, and the front door opened. Chief Nate! Jesse flew in, steps ahead of David. You're here! You too! Nate flicked a finger down the boy's nose. David! How's Rose and the baby? Good. Really good. We're giving her a break having a man's breakfast here. Can we sit with you? Jesse asked. Cause we're all men. You bet. And the best looking men in lunacy. Meg slid the oatmeal, a plate of wheat toast and a bowl of mixed fruit in front of Nate. You driving yet, Jesse? He laughed and scooted into the booth beside Nate. <laughs> no. He bounced. Can I fly your plane? When your feet reach the pedals. Coffee, David? Thanks. You sure this is all right? He asked Nate. Sure. I've missed my usual breakfast buddy here. How's it feel to be a big brother? I don't know. She cries, loud, and then she sleeps, a lot. But she held my finger. She sucks on Mom's booby to get milk. Really? Was all Nate could think to say. Why don't I get you some milk in a glass? Meg poured coffee for David. 
Rose heard you were pitching in for her. David added sugar to his coffee. She wanted you to know she appreciates it. We all do. No problem. Meg glanced over when Charlene came back in. I'll get that milk while you decide what to have for your manly breakfast. Nate left his truck for Meg and walked to the station. The sunlight was weak, but it was light. The mountains were misted by clouds, the kind he now knew carried snow with them. But the bitter wind and the cold it whipped up had mellowed. The walk warmed his muscles, cleared his head. He passed familiar faces, exchanged greetings in the absent way people who saw each other almost every day were wont to do. And he thought, with some surprise, that he was making a place for himself. Not just an escape, a refuge, or a stopgap, but a place. He couldn't remember the last time he'd thought about leaving, but just drifting to some other town, some other job. It had been days since he'd had to force himself out of bed in the morning, or since he'd sat in the dark for hours, afraid to face sleep and the nightmares that ran with it. The weight could still come back, into his head, his shoulders, his gut. But it wasn't as heavy. It wasn't as often. He looked to the mountains again, and knew he owed Patrick Galloway. Owed him enough for cracking open that dark so that he couldn't and wouldn't give up trying to find him justice. He stopped when Hop swung her four-wheel over. She rolled down her window. I'm on my way to see Rose and the baby. Give them my best. You ought to pay a call yourself. Meanwhile, a couple of things. Feds will be setting off a controlled avalanche the day after tomorrow, so the road between here and Anchorage is going to be blocked. Say that again? Fed set off an avalanche from time to time, clear the mountain. Got one scheduled for about 10 o'clock a.m. day after tomorrow. Pete just got the dispatch and told me when I stopped in. You'll need to get a bulletin out. I'll take care of it. And there's a damn bull moose wandering around the schoolyard. And when a couple of kids decided to chase it, it bashed into a couple of parked cars, then chased back. They've got the kids inside now, but that moose is pissed. What are you grinning at? she demanded. You ever see a pissed-off moose? No, ma'am, but I guess I'm going to. If you can't head it out of town, you're going to have to take it down. She nodded when he stopped grinning. Somebody's going to get hurt. I'll take care of it. He quickened his pace, damned if he was going to shoot some stupid moose, especially on school grounds. Maybe that labeled him an outsider, but that's the way it was. He pushed into the station and saw his staff, and... Ed Wolcott. Otto's face was flushed with temper, and his nose and Ed's were all but bumping. Avalanches, a pissed-off moose, pissed-off deputy, pissed-off banker. A well-rounded morning. It's about damn time, Ed began. I need a word with you, Chief, in your office. You'll have to wait. Peach, get the information on the scheduled avalanche to KLUN. I want it announced every half hour through the day and make up some flyers, get them posted around town. Peter, I want you to ride out. Personally inform anyone residing south of Wolverine Cut that this is coming, and they'll be cut off until the roads are cleared. Yes, sir. Chief Burke, just a minute, he said to Ed. Otto, we've got an angry moose down at the school. Already some vehicular damage. He strode to the weapon cabinet as he spoke. I need you to come with me, see if we can herd it out. He unlocked the cabinet chose a shotgun with the sincere prayer he wasn't going to have to use it. I've been waiting ten minutes, Ed complained. Your deputies are capable of handling a simple wildlife situation. You can wait here, or I'll come by the bank as soon as the situation is under control. As deputy mayor, you're being a real pain in the ass, Nate finished. Otto, we'll need your car. Mine's back at the lodge. Let's go. Looked like a landed trout, gulping, Otto said when they were outside. He's gonna wanna fry you for that, Nate. Sure as God made little green apples. Ed doesn't take to being stonewalled. He's outranked. The mayor told me to deal with the moose. I'm dealing with the moose. He climbed in Otto's car. We're not shooting it. Why do you have the shotgun? I plan to intimidate him. The town schools were a connected trio of small, low-slung buildings, with a pretty grove of trees on one side and a little squared-off field on the other. He knew the younger kids were allowed out into the field twice a day for a kind of recess, weather permitting. Since most of the kids had been born there, it took some pretty serious weather to cancel recess. The high schoolers liked to use the grove to hang out, maybe smoke or fool around, before and after classes. There was a flagpole, 
and at this time of day, both the U.S. and the Alaskan flag should have been up and waving. Instead, they were a little under half-staff and flicking fitfully in the disinterested wind. Kids must have been hoisting the flags when they spotted it, Nate muttered, decided to chase after it. Just going to irritate it doing that. Nate glanced at the two smashed-up cars in the tiny lot. Looks like. He spotted the moose now at the edge of the grove, rubbing his antlers on bark. He also saw a light trail of blood. Since no one had reported an injury, he assumed it was moose blood. Doesn't look like he's causing any trouble now. Looks like he cut himself up bashing those cars, so he's not going to be in a good mood. If he decides to stay around, he'll be trouble, especially if some idiot kid slips by a teacher and decides to chase it again or runs home to get a gun and shoots at it. Well, shit. Get as close as you can, and maybe it'll move off. Charge, more likely. I'm not shooting some moose while it's scratching itself on a tree, Otto. Somebody else will, if he sticks close to town. Moose meat's a good meal. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be within town limits, damn it. He saw the moose turn as they edged closer, and saw to his consternation a look more fierce than dumb in those dark eyes. Hell. Shit. Damn. Fuck. Blast the horn. Moose weren't slow. Where had he gotten the idea they were? It galloped toward them, apparently more challenged by the sound of the engine and horn than intimidated. Still cursing, Nate hitched himself out of the window, aimed the gun toward the sky, and fired. The moose kept coming, and adding his own oaths to the mix, Otto swerved to avoid collision. Nate pumped, fired into the air again. Shoot the son of a bitch, Otto demanded as he whipped the wheel and nearly dumped Nate out of the window. I'm not doing it. Pumping the shotgun again, Nate fired into the snowy ground, a foot in front of the moose. This time it was the moose that veered off, and with his ungainly trot, headed into the trees. Nate fired, twice more to keep it going. Then he dropped back on the seat, huffed out two breaths. From behind them came the sounds of hoots and cheers and laughter as kids and students popped out of the school doors. You're crazy. Otto pulled off his cap to scrub a hand over his crew cut. You've got to be crazy. I know you shot a man dead back in Baltimore and sent him to hell. And you can't put some buckshot into a moose? They took another deep breath and pushed the image of the alley out of his mind. The moose was unarmed. Let's go, Otto. I need to deal with the deputy mayor. You can come back and take the reports. The deputy mayor had not deigned to wait. In fact, Peach told Nate, he'd stormed out after a short diatribe on why it had been a mistake to hire some lazy, puffed-up outsider. Taking it in stride, Nate passed a shotgun to Otto, snagged a two-way, and set out to walk to the bank. Somewhere in the wide, wide world, Nate imagined, there was a place colder than February in Lunacy, Alaska and he hoped to God he never paid a visit there. The sky had cleared, which meant any stingy heat had lifted up and away. But the sun streamed, so with luck they might hit a sweaty twenty degrees by mid-afternoon. And the sun, Nate saw, was ringed by a rainbow circle, a colorful halo of reds and blues and golds. What Peter had told him was called a sun dog. People were out and about, taking advantage of the bright morning to do their business. Some of them called out greetings to him or flipped waves, he saw Johnny Trevani, the hopeful groom, chatting on the sidewalk with Bess Mackey, and Deb outside the store washing windows as if it had been a fine spring day. He lifted a hand to Mitch Dauber, who sat in the window of KLUN, spinning records and observing life in lunacy. He expected Mitch would have something philosophical to say about the moose before the end of the day. February. It struck him as he stood on the corner of Lunatic and Denali. Somehow it had gotten to be so far into February that they were nearly to march. He was coming right up on the line of his sixty days, his own point of return, and was still here. More than here, he thought, settling into being here. Thoughtful, he crossed over and into the bank. There were two customers doing business at the bank counter, and another picking up mail from the post office. From the way they and the tellers eyeballed him, Nate imagined Ed had still been in a temper when he'd come in. In the silence that fell, he nodded, and stepped through the short, swinging gate that separated the bank lobby from the offices. It didn't boast a drive through and there were no ATMs lurking outside, but the bank had a nice carpet, a few local paintings on the wall, and a general air of efficiency. He walked to the door that had Ed Wolcott's name on a shiny brass plaque, and knocked. 
Ed opened it himself, sniffed. You'll have to wait. I'm on the phone. Fine. When the door shut in his face, Nate simply slipped his hands into his pockets and studied the paintings. He noted one of a totem in a snowy woods was signed by Ernest Noddy, one of Peter's relatives, he wondered. He still had a lot to learn about his lunatics. He glanced around. There was no protective glass between teller and customers, but there were security cameras. He'd checked the place out already before he'd opened his own accounts. Now that conversation had started up again, he tuned in to Snatches. Movie night, an upcoming bake sale to benefit the school band, the weather, the Iditarod. Small town, small talk, and nothing like what he would have heard if he'd walked into one of the branches of his bank in Baltimore. Ed kept him waiting ten minutes, a little power flex, and was stone-faced with a little flush on his cheekbones when he opened the door. I want you to be aware I've made a formal complaint to the mayor. Okay. I don't like your attitude, Chief Burke. Noted, Mr. Wolcott. If that's all you want to tell me, I need to get back to the station. What I want to know is just what you're doing about the theft of my property. Otto's handling that. My property was vandalized and damaged. Expensive fishing gear has been stolen. I believe I'm entitled to the attention of the chief of police. And you've got it. The report has been duly filed, and the officer in charge is pursuing the matter. The theft isn't being taken lightly by me or my staff. We have a detailed description of the stolen property, and if the thief is dumb enough to use it, talk about it, or try to sell it within my jurisdiction, we'll make an arrest and recover your property. Ed's eyes were slits in his rawhide face. Maybe if I was female you'd take more interest. Actually, I don't think you'd be my type. Mr. Wolcott, he continued, you're upset and you're angry. You've got a right to be. You were violated. The fact that it was most likely kids being stupid doesn't lessen that violation. We'll do everything we can to get your property back. If it helps, I'll apologize for being abrupt with you earlier. I was concerned that children might be injured, and that took priority. You have two children in that school. I assume their safety would take precedence over an update on your stolen property. The flush had died down, and a long huff told Nate the crisis had passed. Be that as it may, you were rude. I was, and distracted. To be frank, I've got a lot on my mind just now. Patrick Galloway's murder, Max's apparent suicide. He shook his head, as if overwhelmed. When I signed on for this job, I expected to be handling, well, at worst, the sort of theft you've experienced. Tragic. Ed sat now, and was gracious enough to gesture Nate to a chair. It's so damn tragic and shocking. Max was a friend. A good one. He rubbed the back of his neck with his hand. I thought I knew him, and had no idea, no clue, that he was contemplating suicide, leaving his wife, his kids that way. He held up his hands, kind of silent apology. I guess I'm more upset about it than I've wanted to admit, and it's been eating at me. I owe you an apology, too. Not necessary. I've let this theft build up. Defense mechanism. It's easier to get riled about that than think about Max. I've been trying to help Carrie with the details on his memorial and some of the finances. A lot of paperwork comes along with death. It's hard. It's hard to deal with it. Nothing harder than burying a friend. You knew him a long time. A long time. Good times. Our kids have grown up together. And this on top of finding out about Pat. You knew him too. He smiled a little. Before I married Arlene, or as she'd say, before she tamed me, I wasn't always a solid citizen and family man I am now. Pat was an adventure. Those were good times, too. In their way. He looked around his office, as if it belonged to someone else, and he couldn't quite remember how he'd come to be there. It doesn't seem possible. None of it. It's been a shock for everyone to find out about Galloway. I thought he'd taken off. Everyone did. And it didn't surprise me. Not really. He was restless, reckless. That's what made him so appealing. You climbed with him. God. Ed sat back now. I used to love to climb. The thrill and the misery. Still do love it, but I rarely have or take the time. I've been teaching my son. I've heard Galloway was good. Very good. Though that recklessness was there. A little too much of it for comfort for me. Even when I was thirty. Do you have any thoughts on who he would have been climbing with that February? 
None, and believe me, I have thought about it since we heard the news. I suspect he might have picked up someone or a group and taken them up for a winter climb. It was the sort of thing he might do on impulse, to earn a little money, and for the buzz. And one of them killed him. God knows why. He shook his head. But aren't the state police handling that investigation? They are. I'm just curious, unofficially. I doubt they'll ever find out who it was, or why. Sixteen years. God, how things change, he murmured. You hardly notice as they do. You know, I ran the bank single-handed at one time, lived here too. Kept the money in that safe right over there. He gestured to a black floor safe. I didn't know that. I was twenty-seven when I landed here. Got to carve my place out of the wilderness, civilize it to my liking. He smiled now. Guess I did just that. You know, the Hops and Judge Royce were my first customers. Took a lot of faith for them to put their money in my hands. I never forgot it. But we had a vision, and we built this town out of it. It's a good town. Yes, it is. And I'm proud of my part in making it. Old man Idell was here, with the original lodge. He banked with me, too, after a while. Other people came along. Peach, with her third. No, it was her second husband. They lived out in the bush a while. Came here for supplies and company from time to time. She came back for good when he died. Otto, Bing, Deb, and Harry. Take strength of character and vision to make a life here. Yes, it does. Well, he drew air and through his nose. Had that vision. Of his own kind. And he was a character. I don't know about that strength. He was an entertaining bastard, though. I hope this will all be put to rest properly. Do you think we'll ever know, for certain, what happened up there? Odds aren't favorable. But I think Coben will give it the proper time and effort. He'll look for the pilot and anyone who might have seen Galloway in the days before he went up. They might want to talk to you about who he used as a pilot on his climbs. It would have been Jacob, most usually. But surely if Jacob had taken him up... He'd have reported it when Bat didn't come back. He lifted his shoulders. So, logically, it would have to have been someone else. Let me think. He picked up a silver pen, tapped it absently against his desk blotter. When we climbed with Jacob, as I recall, he sometimes used... What was his name? Vietnam vet. Lakes. Lukes. That's it. Then there was this maniac. Two toes, they called him. You think I should call this Coben and tell him? Couldn't hurt. I should get back. He rose, held out a hand. I hope we're square now, Mr. Wolcott. Ed. And we are. Damn, Auger. I paid too much for it. So it's a double annoyance. It's insured, so are the rods, but it's the principle. Understood. Listen, I'll take a ride out to your ice shack, take a look around. Satisfaction settled over Ed's face. Now, I appreciate that. I put a new lock on. Let me get you the keys. Since Moose and apoplectic deputy mayors had been dealt with, Nate swung by to see Rose. He made what he hoped were appropriate noises over the baby, who looked like a black-headed turtle swaddled in a pink blanket. He called in, let Peach know he was taking a run out to the lake to run another check of Ed's ice shack. On impulse, he stopped by the dog run at the lodge, sprang rock and bull, and took them with him so they could have an hour of free reign. It was a nice ride, with the radio turned from Otto's choice of country western to Nate's preference for alternative rock. He drove to the lake to the bouncy beat of Blink-182. Ed Shack sat alone on a rippled plate of ice. It was, Nate estimated, about the size of two generous outhouses, stuck together and was fashioned out of what he thought might be cedar shakes. A little more upscale than he'd expected, with the sides silvered by weather and topped by a peaked roof, and set well apart from the huddle of other shacks. He decided it looked like the manor house and the peasant village, amusing himself. The dogs raced over the ice like a couple of kids on school holiday, while Nate slipped and slithered his way across. The quiet was amazing, like a church, with a kind of musical hush from that light wind through the snow-drenched trees. The sun dog shimmered in the icy blue sky and had the frozen lake gleaming. The sense of silence and solitude was so strong that he jumped, reached for his weapon when he heard the long, echoing call overhead. The eagle circled, gold-brown and gorgeous against the heavy sky. The dogs bumped each other playfully, 
and dived into the bank of snow at the edge of the lake. He could see Meg's plane from here, he realized, the red flash of it just at the long curve of the frozen water, and other little snips of civilization if he cared to look. There, a stream of smoke from a chimney, a glimpse of a house through the thick trees, his own breath streaming out. He let out a short laugh. Maybe he should give this ice-fishing business a shot. There had to be something to be said for the primitive rush of dropping a line through a hole in the ice and sitting in the quiet on a plate of frozen water. He crossed to the shack and saw the sloppy, spray-painted, Dick Shit, spewed across the door in virulent yellow. Another sign of civilization, Nate thought as he fished out the keys. Ed had bolted on two new padlocks, each with a fat, shiny chain. He dealt with them, stepped in. The graffiti artists had been at work inside, obscenities squirreled around the walls. He adjusted his annoyance with Ed. He'd have been royally pissed, too, to find this sort of thing in one of his sanctuaries. He could see the rack where the rods had been, as well as the utter tidiness under the disorder the vandals had caused. The tackle, the Coleman stove, the chairs hadn't been touched, but a cabinet he suspected had held the scotch, Glen Fittich, according to Otto's report, and some food supplies was empty and open. He found cleats that snapped on boots and made a mental note to buy some for himself. He found a first aid kit, extra gloves, hat, an old worn parka, snowshoes, and a couple of thermal blankets. The snowshoes were hung on the wall, just over a screaming yellow asshole. If they'd been used recently, Nate couldn't tell. There was fuel for the stove, a fish scaler, and a couple of wicked-looking knives, a number of magazines, a portable radio, extra batteries. Nothing, he supposed, that you couldn't expect to find in an ice-fishing shack in Alaska. When he walked out again, he circled around. He looked down toward Meg's plane, then across where her woods began. He tried to picture Ed Wolcott, pompous but tough skulking around the woods on snowshoes. Twenty. The moose was the hot topic for most of the week. Nate was razzed or congratulated on his moose-dispersing techniques, depending on the source. Nate considered the moose a kind of blessing. It took people's minds off murder and death, at least for a little while. He'd considered going back to speak with Carrie, and some strategies for getting past the probability she'd slam the door in his face and refuse to see him. The notification that the body had been released and cremated, and that Meg was flying Carrie into Anchorage to pick up the ashes, decided him. I'm going to need to come with you, he told Meg. Look, Chief, it's going to be hard enough to deal with coming and going without you there to rub the circumstances in her face. I don't intend to do any rubbing. I'm going to see her now. We'll meet you at the river. Nate? She finished dragging on her boots. Maybe you think the Lunacy PD has to be represented here for whatever cop reason, but send Otto or Peter. Fair or not, you're the last person Carrie wants to see today. We'll meet you at the river. He was halfway to the door of the room they were temporarily sharing when it struck. He turned, grinned. Rock and bull. I'm slow, but I just got it. Must be all the moose talk. Rocky and Bullwinkle. You are slow. Or you had a deprived childhood. No, I just figured they were macho names like, I don't know, boxers, the rock, raging bull, whatever. Her lips tipped up at the corner. Why was it he could charm her even when she was annoyed with him? The rock's a wrestler? Close enough. See you in an hour. He had already informed his staff, who had the same pessimistic attitude as Meg that he'd be making the trip to Anchorage that morning. So he drove straight to Carrie's. The door swung open before he was halfway up the walk. She stood in a black sweater and pants, blocking the door. You can just turn around and go back to your car. I don't have to talk to you, and I don't have to let you into my house. I'd like five minutes, Carrie. I sure as hell don't want to stand out here shouting what I have to say to you through a closed door. I don't think you'd like that either. It'd be easier on both of us if you'd give me that five minutes inside especially since I'm going to be on the plane with you in an hour. I don't want you with me. I know that. If you still feel that way after you hear what I have to say, I'll send Peter instead. He could see the struggle on her face. Then she turned, walked away, leaving the door open to him and the brisk cold. He walked in, shut the door. She stood in her living room, her back to him, her arms folded against her chest tight enough that he saw her knuckles whiten against her own biceps. Are your kids here? 
No, I sent them to school. They're better off with the routine with their friends. They need some normal. How can you come here like this? She whirled around. How can you come here and harass me on the day I'm going to bring my husband's ashes home? Do you have any heart, any compassion? I'm here officially, and what I'm going to say to you is confidential. Officially? She all but spat it. What do you want? My husband's dead. He's dead and he can't defend himself against the terrible things you say about him. You won't say those things in his house. This is Max's house, and you won't say those horrible lies about him here. You loved him. Did you love him enough to give me your word that what I do say here won't be repeated? To anyone. Anyone, Carrie. You dare ask me if I loved. Just yes or no. I need your word. I've got no interest in repeating your lies. Say whatever you have to say and get out. I'll promise to forget you were even here. It would have to do. I believe Max was on the mountain with Patrick Galloway at the time of Galloway's death. Go to hell. I also believe there was a third person with them. Her mouth trembled open. What do you mean, a third person? Three of them went up. Two of them came down. I believe that third person is responsible for Galloway's murder. And I believe he killed Max, or induced Max to kill himself. While she stared, her hand groped out, fumbled its way to the back of a chair. Her body seemed to sink into it. I can't understand you. I can't give you all the details, but I need your cooperation. I need your help, he amended, to prove what I believe. There was a third man, Carrie. Who was it? I don't know. God, I don't know. I... I told you someone killed Max. I told you he didn't kill himself. I told Sergeant Coben. I keep telling him. I know. I believe you. You believe me? Tears gushed out of her eyes, rained down her cheeks. You believe me? I do. But the fact is the Emmys ruled it suicide. Coben may have his doubts, and he may have his instincts, even a certain amount of circumstantial evidence, but he doesn't have the investment we do. He doesn't have the room or the time to push on this the way I do. We're going to need to go back a long time. You're going to need to try to remember details, feelings, conversations. It's not easy. And you're going to need to keep this to yourself. I'm asking you to take a risk. She brushed the tears. I don't understand. If we're right and someone killed Max because of what happened on that mountain, that someone may be watching you. He may wonder what you know, what you remember, what Max might have told you. You think I could be in danger? I think I want you to be very careful. I don't want you discussing this with anyone, not even your kids, not your best friend, not your priest. No one. I want you to let me go through Max's things, his personal papers, everything, here and at the paper. And I don't want anyone to know about it. I want you to go back and think about that February. What you did, what Max did, who he spent time with, how he behaved. Write it down. She stared at him, with something that looked like hope fighting through the grief. You're going to find out who did this to him? To us? I'm going to do everything I can. She mopped at her cheeks. I said terrible things about you two, to anyone who'd listen. Some of them were probably true. No, they weren't. She pressed her fingers to her eyes now. I'm so confused. I'm sick, sick in my heart, in my head. I made myself hire Meg to take me to bring us back because I needed to prove I didn't believe that I wasn't ashamed. But part of me was... She dropped her hands, and her eyes were shattered. If he was up there, he must have known. We're going to work all that out. Some of the answers may be hard, Carrie, but it's better than just having questions. I hope you're right. She got to her feet. I need to fix myself up a little. She started out, then stopped and turned around. That business with the moose out at the school? Max would have loved that. He would have loved writing that up. Troublemaking moose expelled from lunacy high, or something like that. That sort of story just tickled him. A man like that. A man who could find such pleasure in something so foolish. 
He couldn't have done what was done to Pat Galloway. I wanted to marry him almost as soon as I met him. I liked the way he talked and talked about starting up a town paper, how it was important to record the little things just as much as the big ones. Carrie looked out the window in her seat beside Meg, and Nate could see her gaze was on the mountains. I came here to teach, and I stayed because it got inside me. I wasn't a very good teacher, really, but I wanted to stay, and I liked the odds, a lot more men than women. I was looking for a man. She slid a sideways glance at Meg. Who isn't? Carrie laughed a little, but the sound was hoarse. <laughs> I wanted to get married and have kids. One look at Max and I decided he fit the bill. He was smart, but not too smart. Cute, but not so handsome I'd worry other women would be after him. A little wild. More that he wanted to be wild. But the sort you knew you could fix up with some time and effort. She broke off, and her hitching breaths were an obvious fight against tears. Do women make checklists of stuff like that? You know, like you're doing a house you're thinking of buying? Fixer-upper? Solid foundation but needs new trim? That kind of thing? Nate asked. Carrie let out a watery giggle, pressed her hand to her lips. <laughs> we do. Or I sure did the closer I got to thirty. I didn't love him right off. I mean, not like some huge hot burst. But I got him into bed and that part was good. Another check on the plus column. There was another beat of silence. Then Nate cleared his throat. <clears throat> uh, are those particular checks size-specific or color-coded? Don't worry, Burke. You got a nice fat check in that column, too, Meg interjected. She flipped him a glance that was full of appreciation and understanding. He was keeping it light and easy for the widow, as much as he could. She looked over at Carrie. You always looked good together, like a team. We were a good team. Maybe I never got that big, hot burst, but I'll tell you when I fell in love with him. Really, absolutely, no going back in love with him. It was when he held our daughter for the first time. The look on his face when he lifted her up that first time. The way he looked at me when he did. All that shock and wonder. The thrill and the terror. All of it. On his face. So I didn't get an explosion, but what I got was warm and steady and real. He didn't kill your father, Meg. She looked out the window again. The man who held that baby the way he did, he couldn't have killed anyone. I know you have reason to think different, and I want you to know how much I value and appreciate your kindness in taking me today. We both lost someone we loved. It wouldn't prove anything if we slapped each other about it. Women, Nate thought were tougher and more resilient than any man he knew, including himself. He tracked down Coben as soon as they landed, and though it felt callous, he left Meg with Carrie to deal with the arrangements and release of Max's ashes. Thomas Kaczynski, a.k.a. Two Toes. He looks like the best bet. There's a pilot, Luke's, works out of Fairbanks now, and a couple others Galloway used occasionally. He set the list he'd made on Coben's desk. But Kaczynski pops for me. He ends up dead a couple of weeks after Galloway. Stabbing investigated and deemed a mugging. Coben drew in a breath. Kaczynski played with some bad boys. He gambled pretty heavy. Was suspected of running drugs. Time of his death, he had markers out for somewhere in the neighborhood of Ten Large. Investigating officer believed one of his IOUs was collected in flesh, but he couldn't prove it. And you're buying that kind of coincidence? I'm not buying anything. The fact is, Kaczynski lived a bad life and met a bad end. If he happened to be the pilot who took Galloway on his last climb, he isn't going to tell us about it. And it shouldn't be a problem for you to give me a copy of the file on him. Coben sucked air through his nose again. I've got the press of my ass on this, Burke. Yeah, I've caught some of the reports. I've given some reporters an official statement. You've seen crap like this? He yanked a copy of a tabloid out of a drawer, tossed it down. The headline screamed. Iceman recovered from frozen grave. There was a picture of Galloway, as he'd been in the cave, in lurid color under the bold-faced type. You had to expect shit like this, Nate began. One of the recovery team had to take that shot. One of them cashed in, made a few bucks by selling it to the tabloids. My lieutenant's breathing down my neck. I don't need you doing the same. There was a third man on the mountain. 
Yeah, there was, according to Galloway's journal. Of course, we can't prove he died after that last journal entry. With 16 years between, we've got a lot of room on time of death. Could have been then, or a month after. Six months after. You know better than that. What I know, Coben lifted one hand. What I can prove, then the other. Emmy ruled suicide, and my lieutenant likes it. Too damn bad Hallbaker didn't name names in his note. Give me the file, and I'll get names. You can smell it the same as I can, Coben. If you want to close the lid on the stink, that's up to you. But I've got a memorial to go to and a woman with two kids who deserves to know the truth, so she can learn to live with it. I can take a few days and go hunting for information here in Anchorage, or you can give me the file and let me get back to lunacy. If I'd wanted to close the lid, I wouldn't have given you Galloway's journal. Frustration rippled around him in nearly visible waves. I've got brass to answer to, and they want the lid closed. The prevailing theory is that Hallbaker killed Galloway, and the third man, the one who was injured according to the journal. And if you look at this straight on, that's what plays. Why would Galloway's killer spare an injured man, a potential witness? Hallbaker does them both. In fear of exposure, remorse, and he offs himself. And that's tidy? Coben flattened his lips. Some like it, tidy. I'll get you the file, Burke but you keep your personal investigation low-key, the lowest. The press, my lieutenant, anybody gets wind you're poking around, and I'm helping you, it comes down on me. Done. Meg was so saturated with Carrie's grief that she didn't mind spending another evening waiting tables. Given a choice, she'd have preferred to load up her dogs and fly out to the bush. Somewhere. Anywhere she could spend a couple of days completely alone, away from the pulls and tugs of people and all their needs. That, she thought as she swung into the overheated kitchen at the lodge, was the Galloway gene. Take off. Flip it off. Shrug it off. Life's too short for hassles. But there was enough of something else in her. Christ, she hoped it wasn't Charlene, to make her stay and see it through. She hooked her orders on the turntable for Big Mike, two meatloafs, a vegetarian special, and the salmon surprise. She picked up the completed orders from her last trip in, balanced them with such ease it made her wince. Nothing against weight persons the world over, she thought as she carried the food out, but she wished she wasn't so good at it. It wasn't on the scope for her, even as a fallback career. God, she wanted the air. Some silence. Her dogs, her music, some sex. She was ready to pop. She worked another two hours. Through the clatter, the complaints, the gossip, the bad jokes. She could feel the pressure building up inside her, the desperate need to get out, get away. When the crowd thinned out, she caught Charlene at the kitchen door. That's all you get for tonight. I'm taking off. I need you to... You're gonna have to need somebody else. Shouldn't be hard for you. She headed for the stairs. She wanted a shower, and by God she was packing up her things and going home. This time it was Charlene who caught her. We're going to have another rush in an hour. People coming in to drink, to... Oddly enough, I don't care. She'd have closed the door in Charlene's face, but her mother was through the door and slamming it behind her. You never did. I don't care that you don't care, but you owe me. Forget the shower. She'd just pack. Bill me. I need help, Megan. Why can't you ever just help me out without being so bitchy about it? I inherited the bitch from you. Not my fault. She ripped open a drawer and dragged whatever was in it out, tossed it on the bed. I built something here. You benefited from that. I don't give a rat's ugly ass about your money. I'm not talking about money. Charlene grabbed clothes from the bed and hurled them into the air. I'm talking about this place. It means something. You never cared. You couldn't wait to get away from it and from me, but it means something. We've been written up in the paper, in magazines, in tour guides. I got people working here who depend on their paycheck to put food on their table and clothes on their kids' backs. I've got customers who come in here every damn night because it means something. You've got, Megan agreed. It's nothing to do with me. That's what he always said, too. Enraged, she kicked out a pair of jeans on the floor. You look like him. You sound like him. That's not my fault, either. Nothing was ever his fault. Bad run of luck playing poker. Gee, guess there's no money this week. 
Need a little space, Charlie. You know how it goes. I'll be back in a couple of days. Something will turn up. Stop nagging at me. Somebody had to pay the bills, didn't they? Charlene demanded. Somebody had to pay for medicine when you got sick, or come up with the cash to get you shoes. He could bring me all the wildflowers he could pick in the summer, or write me pretty songs and poems, but they didn't put food on the table. I put food on my table. I buy my own shoes. But she'd calmed a little. I'm not saying you didn't work. You did plenty of scheming on top of it. But it's your life. You got what you wanted. I wanted him. God damn it, I wanted him. So did I. So we both lost out there. Nothing we can do about it. She'd come back for her things, Meg thought. Right now she just needed out. She walked to the door, hesitated. I called Boston, talked to his mother. She's... She won't block you from claiming his body, from burying him here. You called her? Yeah, it's done. She opened the door. Meg, Megan, please, wait a minute. Charlene sat on the side of the bed, clothes strewn on the floor around her. Thank you. Hell, oh hell, Meg thought. It was just a phone call. It matters. Charlene gripped her hands together in her lap and stared at them. It matters so much to me. I was so mad at you for going to Anchorage to... to see him. For cutting me out. Meg closed the door, leaned back against it. That's not what I was doing. I wasn't a good mother. I wanted to be at first. Tried to be. But there was always so much to do. I didn't know there'd be so much to do. You were pretty young. Too young, I guess. He wanted more. She looked up then, shrugged. He just loved you to pieces, and he wanted more kids. I wouldn't let it happen. I just didn't want to go through it all again, getting fat and tired, going through that pain, then having all that to do, and the money that was never there when you needed it, or just wanted it. He pushed for it, and I pushed back with other things until it seemed we spent half the time pushing each other. And... I was jealous because he doted on you. And I was always the outsider, always the one saying no. I guess somebody had to. I don't know if we'd have made it. If he'd come back, I don't know if we'd have stuck it out. We started wanting such different things. But I know if we'd split, I know he'd have taken you. As if to keep her hands busy, she smoothed the bedspread on either side of her. He'd have taken you, she repeated. I'd have let him. You should know that. He loved you more than I could. It was hard. Harder than anything she could remember to walk to the bed and sit. Enough to scrape the money together to buy me shoes? Maybe not. But enough to take you camping so you could look at the stars? Enough to sit at the fire and tell you stories? I'd like to think you'd have made it if he'd come back. Charlene looked over, blinked. Really? Yeah. I'd like to think you'd have found a way to make it work. You'd already stuck together a long time. Longer than a lot of people do. I want to ask you something. This seems like the time. Was there a big, hot blast the first time you met him? When you fell for him? Oh, God, yes. Nearly burned me up. And it never stopped. I'd think it was dead, cold and dead, when I got mad enough or tired enough. But then he'd look at me, and it was back. I never had that with anyone else. I keep waiting for it. But I never get it. Maybe you should be looking for something else this time. Somebody told me recently about the benefits of a good, steady warmth. She rose, picked up scattered clothes. I can't go back down there and work tonight. Okay. I'll work breakfast for you, but I need you to get somebody else to cover for Rose. I've got to get back to my place. My life. Charlene nodded, pushed to her feet. You gonna take the sexy cop with you? Up to him. She packed up, tidied the room. Meg considered leaving Nate a note decided that was a little too rude, a little too wrong, even for her. Didn't have her car anyway, she remembered, not that she was above borrowing his, or someone else's, and telling them about it later. 
In the end, she slung her knapsack over her shoulder and hoofed it to the station after a detour by the Italian place. He'd said he'd be working late, covering the desk. Whatever. Since his car was locked, she debated briefly. She could dig out her handy set of keys, probably find one that would work. But he wouldn't appreciate it if he'd set the car alarm. Which, being city bred, he might have done. She carried her pack and the large pizza into the station. Awfully damn quiet, was her first thought. How did the man work without music? She tossed her pack aside, started to call out, but he peered in the doorway. If she hadn't been looking, she wouldn't have seen the way his hand rested on the butt of his holstered weapon, or the way it drifted away when he smiled at her. I smell food. And woman. Gets my caveman instincts going. Pizza, pepperoni. Figured you could use something hot, which includes me, about this time. That's a big affirmative to both. What's the knapsack for? She hadn't seen him look at it. I'm running away. Want to come with? Fight with Charlene? Yes, but that's not why. We sort of made up, actually. I just have to get the hell out of here, Burke. Too many people for too long. Gets me edgy. I thought pizza, then some sex back in my place would scratch that itch before I hurt someone and you had to arrest me. That's a plan. I was gonna just go, but I didn't. I want the points for doing it this way. Scoreboard's adjusted. Why don't you bring that back? I'll dig up something to wash it down with. Got that. She dug one-handed into her duffel, pulled out a bottle of red, liberated it from the bar at the lodge. We'll have to drink it all to dispose of the evidence. She passed him the bottle as she walked past him, then turned into his office and set the pizza on his desk. He'd closed his files, both hard copy and computer, and had tossed the blanket over the board when he heard the outer door open. Napkins? she asked. It wasn't gentlemanly, but he couldn't leave her alone in the office. Under Peach's counter. He pulled out his Swiss army knife, levered out the corkscrew. Never actually used this one before. A lot of damn work, but hey. He muscled out the cork as she came back in. Success. She tossed down the napkins, got two mugs from beside his coffee maker. What's this? She tugged the side edge of the blanket with a finger. Don't. At her look of surprise, he shook his head. Just don't. Let's eat. They sat, divvied up wine and pizza. Why are you working so late, and alone? Are you killing time until I finish my moonlighting for the night? That's one part. But tell me, what did you fight with Charlene about? You're changing the subject. Yes, I am. Her being demanding, me being ungrateful, and so on and so forth. Then we came around to my father and other things. And some of it made sense to me. Enough for me to be able to admit he wasn't the easiest guy to be with as a partner, and that she, in her own strange and annoying way, probably did the best she could. That we both loved him more than we can love each other. She poured more wine, deliberately picked up a second slice of pizza though her stomach had gone naughty. Under that blanket's about my father, isn't it? I've seen enough cop movies, enough cop TV, Burke, to know you people stick up photographs and reports and what have you when you're investigating. I'm not investigating anything officially. Yes, it has to do with your father, and I want you to leave that blanket where it is. I told you before I'm not delicate, and I'm telling you now there are some things I don't share. Won't ever. She was silent, studying her pizza. That the sort of statement that had your wife doing another man? No he said evenly. She couldn't have cared less about my work. She closed her eyes a moment, then made herself open them and meet his. That was a cheap shot. I'm not above a cheap shot. She tossed the pizza down. I don't like myself very much tonight. That's why I have to get out, get away, get back to who I am when I like me. But you came here first to bring me pizza and wine. You've got a little hook in me somewhere. I don't know if it's going to stick, but it's there for now. I love you, Megan. Oh, Jesus, don't say that now! She sprang up, pulling out her hair as she paced. When I'm in this pissy, bitchy mood, do you look to be kicked in the face by women, Ignatius? Are you just itching for somebody else to smack your heart around? 
It was that big blast for me, he went on calmly. It took a big blast to break through, I'd guess, since I've been pretty busy wallowing for the last year. Most of the time lately, it banks down to a nice simmer. Easier to live with the simmer than the blast. Now and then it kicks up again, though. Goes right through me like a fireball. She stopped, dropped down again because her naughty stomach was busy doing flips. God help you. Yeah, I felt the same myself. But I do love you. And it's different than it was with Rachel. I had all this stuff planned out then. A nice, steady, sensible, normal kind of step and stage. And you're not looking for sensible and normal with me? It'd be a waste of time. Don't give me that. You've got home and hearth tattooed on your butt. Do not. You're the one with the tattoo, which I find incredibly erotic, by the way. Maybe when you decide you're in love with me, we can think about what happens next. But for now... When I decide? Yeah. When? I'm patient, Meg, and relentless in my way. I'm starting to get my edge back. It's been blunted a long time, but it's coming back. You'll just have to deal with that. Interesting. A little scarier than I expected, but interesting. And it's because I love you, and I trust you, that I'm going to show you this. He opened the file on his desk. Taking the copied pages of Patrick Galloway's journal, he handed them to her. He saw the instant she recognized the handwriting, the way her body went stiff and still, the quick, almost inaudible drawing in of breath. Her gaze flicked up to his once briefly, then riveted on the pages in her hand. She said nothing as she read them. She didn't weep or rage or tremble as another woman might have done. Instead, she picked up her wine again, sipped slowly, and read the pages straight through. Where did these come from? They're copies from the pages out of a notebook he had inside his parka. Coben gave them to me. How long ago? A few days. There was a little burn in the center of her belly. And you didn't tell me. You didn't show me. No. Because I needed to evaluate, and you needed to settle. Is that part of your edge, Chief? Making unilateral decisions? It's part of my professional responsibilities and my personal feelings. You can't discuss this with anyone until I determine otherwise. You've shown them to me now because in your professional opinion you've evaluated and I've settled. Something like that. She closed her eyes. You take care, don't you? Professionally, personally, it's pretty much the same to you, the caring. He said nothing, and she opened her eyes. No point in tossing a bunch of bullshit out at you when you did what you thought was right. Probably was right. Knowing it wouldn't go down easy now, she set the wine aside. What does Coben think? It's more what his superiors think at this point. The theory is Max killed Galloway, then killed the third man. When your father's body was discovered, fear of discovery and remorse drove him to suicide. That's how they'll write it up? Close it down? Whatever the cops speak for it is? I think so, yes. Poor Carrie. She leaned forward, laid the pages back on his desk. Poor Max. He never killed Patrick Galloway. No, Nate said and closed the file again. He didn't. 21. They packed into town hall for Max Hawbaker's memorial. It was the only place big enough to hold the crowd, it was interesting to Nate how many showed up, in work clothes or Sunday clothes, in Alaskan tuxedos or bunny boots. They came because he'd been one of them, and his wife and kids still were. They came, Nate thought, whether they thought he was a small-town hero or a murderer. And many did believe the latter. Nate saw it in their eyes, or heard it in snatches of conversation. He let it go. Max was eulogized with warmth and with humor, and the name Patrick Galloway was carefully omitted from any public statement. Then it was done. Some went back to work, and some went to Carrie's for what he always thought of as the post-funeral replay. Nate went back to work. Charlene ambushed Meg as she offloaded supplies from her plane. She grabbed her arm, tugged her away from Jacob. I need to see him. Who? You know who. I want you to fly me into Anchorage to the funeral home that's holding his body till spring. 
I have a right. Meg studied Charlene's face. Well, I can't. It's too late to fly to Anchorage today, and I've got jobs booked. I did a rods underway. People want to fly over the route, get pictures. I've got a right. What brought this on? Just because we didn't get married doesn't mean I wasn't his wife, his true wife, just the same as Carrie was to Max. Oh, shit. Meg paced out two tight circles. You know, I thought you showed a lot of class going to the memorial, looking Carrie right in the eye and giving her your condolences, and here you are working up a mad because she got all that attention. That's not it. Or only part of it, Charlene admitted to herself. I want to see him, and I will. If you won't take me, I'll call Jerk and tell Keaton to pay him to fly me down. You've been stewing about this since Max's memorial, haven't you? Just stewing and churning it around since then. What's the point, Charlene? You've seen him. Score one for me. How do I know he's gone? How do I know it's him unless I see for myself, the way Carrie got to see Max? I can't take you. You'd make me go with a stranger? Meg looked back at the river. There'd been some overflow, cracks and gaps in the shifting ice that had the water below welling up, freezing thin. Dangerous business, because the new ice looked just like the rest and would break under you and take you down. What you thought was safe would kill you. There were handwritten warning signs. Nate's doing, she knew. He was a man who understood all about thin ice and the dangers of what looked safe and normal. Would you settle for a picture? A photograph? What do you mean? She turned back. If I brought you a picture of him, would that do it? If you can go down and take his picture, why? I don't have to. Nate has pictures. I can get one, bring it to you. Now? No, not now. She yanked off her cap, drove her fingers through her hair. He wouldn't like it. Evidence or something. But I'll get it tonight. You can look at it, satisfy yourself, and I'll take it back. Outside the station, Meg flipped through her keys and found the one marked P.D. She'd left Nate sleeping and hoped he'd stay that way until she got back. She didn't want to explain this little bit of insanity to him. She let herself in, pulled out her penlight. Part of her wanted to poke around and enjoy the sensation of being somewhere she shouldn't. But more, she wanted to get this little chore over with and get back to bed. She went straight into Nate's office. Here she risked the overhead lights, flipping them on before crossing to the covered corkboard. She removed the blanket carefully and it fell to the floor from her numb hands as she took one wavering step in retreat. She'd seen death before, and had never known it to be pretty. But those stark and graphic photos of Max Hawbaker had her breath whistling out. Best not to think about it. Not quite yet. Better to take the photo of her father, how much cleaner his death seemed, and take it to Charlene. She slid the photo inside her jacket, turned the lights off, and went back out the way she came. Charlene was in her room, answered the door wearing a floral robe. There was a scent of whiskey, smoke, perfume. You'd better be alone, Meg said. I am. I sent him on. Where is it? Did you get it? You're going to look, then I'm taking it back, and I don't want to hear any more about this. Let me see. Let me see him. Meg drew it out. No, you can't touch it. You wrinkle it up or anything, Nate will know. She turned the photo face front. Oh. Oh. Charlene stumbled back, much as Meg had at the corkboard. God. No. She shot a hand out to stop Meg from putting the picture away again. I need to. She stepped forward again, and at Meg's warning look, clasped her hands behind her back. He. He looks the same. How can that be? He looks the same. All these years and he looks the same. He never had a chance to look different. It would have been quick, do you think? It would have been quick? Yes. He was wearing that parka when he left. He was wearing it the last time I saw him. She turned, cupped her elbows with her hands. Go away now. She shuddered and pressed both hands to her mouth. Meg! She began and spun around. But Meg was already gone. Alone, Charlene walked into the bath, turned on the lights, 
and studied herself in the hard glare. He'd look the same, she thought again. So young. And she didn't. She never would again. It was March in Alaska, but the longer days didn't make him think of approaching spring, however close the calendar crept toward the official day. Nate awoke to daylight now and most often on the left side of Meg's bed. When he walked through town, he saw more of the people's faces and less of sheltering hoods. The plastic eggs hanging from the branches of snow-draped trees, the plastic bunnies crouched on white carpets of lawn didn't make him think spring either. But his first breakup did. He watched with a kind of buzzy wonder, the little cracks creeping along the icy ribbon of river like crazed zippers. Unlike the overflow, these didn't fill in and freeze up. It astonished him so much that it took him twenty minutes to stop staring and head back to the office. There are cracks in the river, he told Otto. Yeah, a little early for breakup, but we've had a warm spell. Maybe, Nate thought, if he lived in lunacy for, oh, a hundred years, He'd think of a few days of forties and damp, chilly lower fifties as a warm spell. I want signs posted. I don't want a bunch of kids playing hockey falling through the ice. Kids got more sense than to. I want signs posted, like we did for overflow, but more so. Check at the corner store, see if they've got any more signboard. Either Peach or Peter needs to write them. Uh, no skating thin ice. It's not so much thin as, Otto, just get me a half dozen signs. He grumbled, but he went. And Nate noticed Peach's lips were folded tight on a smile she was trying to suppress. What? Nothing. Not a thing. I think it's a fine idea. It shows we've got concern for our citizenship and order. But I think you could just write, Break up and steer clear. Write whatever you think best. Just write it. He started through the station to head out the back and find what he could use for stakes. And don't let Otto write it. When he was satisfied the signs were underway, he wrote and printed flyers off his computer and set out to distribute them. He pinned them up in the post office, the bank, the school, worked his way to the lodge. There, Bing came over and read behind his shoulder, and snorted. Saying nothing, Nate read his own words. Break up in progress. No skating, walking, or other activities will be permitted on the river, by order of the Lunacy Police Department. I spell something wrong, Bing? Nope. Just wonder who you think's stupid enough to go skating around in the river during breakup. Same sort of person who jumps off a roof to see if he can fly after he's read a couple Superman comics. How long does breakup take? Depends, doesn't it? Winter started early, now spring's doing the same thing. So, we'll just see. River breaks up every friggin' year. So does the lake. Nothing new. A kid goes out there fooling around... Falls through the ice, we could be going to another memorial. Bing pursed his lips thoughtfully as Nate walked out again. He still had flyers in his hand when he saw movement behind the display window of the lunatic. He crossed over, found the door was locked. Knocked. Carrie studied him through the glass a minute, then opened up. Carrie, I'd like to post one of these in your window here. She took it, read it, then walked to her desk to get tape. I'll put it up for you. Appreciate it. He glanced around. You here alone? Yes. He'd interviewed her twice since the memorial, and each time her thoughts and answers had been scattered and vague. He tried to give her time, but time was passing. Have you been able to remember any more details from that February? I tried to think about it, write things down like you said, at home. She taped the flyer face out in the glass. I couldn't do it there. I couldn't seem to do it at my parents' when I took the kids down for a couple weeks. I don't know why. I just couldn't get the thoughts out, or the words down. So I came here. I thought maybe... That's fine. I wasn't sure I could come here. I know Hop and some of the other women came in and... cleaned up after... when they were allowed to, but... I wasn't sure I could come back here. It's hard. He'd gone back to the alley, forced himself to go back, and all he'd felt was numb despair. I had to come back. There hasn't been a paper since... It's been too long. Max worked so hard, and this meant so much to him. 
She turned around, drawing careful breaths as she looked around the room. Doesn't look like anything, really. Doesn't even look like a real paper. Max and I went to Anchorage, Fairbanks, even Juno to tour a real paper, real newsrooms. His eyes would just light up. Doesn't look like much here, but he was proud of it. I don't agree with you. I think it looks like a lot. She struggled to smile, nodded briskly. I'm going to keep it going. That's something I decided today, just today before you came in. I thought I'd let it go, that I just couldn't do this without him. But when I came back here today, I knew I had to keep it going. I'm going to put an addition together. See if the professor's got time to help me. Maybe knows a couple of kids who want to work, get some journalist experience. That's good, Carrie. I'm glad to hear it. I'll write something down for you, Nate. I promise. I'll think back and I'll try to remember. I know you wanted to go through his papers and such. I haven't been back there yet. She didn't have to look at the back office for Nate to know she meant the room where Max had been found. You can if you want. The state cops had been through that room, Nate thought. He still wanted his pass at it, but not now. Not when anyone walking by would see he was inside and wonder why. I'll come back for that. He kept an office at home? A little one. I haven't been through his things. I keep putting it off. Anybody at your place now? No. Kids are in school. Is it all right with you if I go in now, look around? If I need to take anything, I'll write you up a receipt. You go ahead. She went to her purse, fished out keys, and took one off a ring. This is to the back door. You keep it as long as you need it. He didn't want to park in front of the Hawbaker house. Too many people talked about something just that small. Instead, he parked by a bend in the river. He didn't notice any cracks in the ice and wondered if he'd jumped the gun on the ones in town. He hiked the back way, through a patch of woods. Colder here, he thought, colder under the trees where the sun couldn't fight through. There were tracks, snowmobile, skis, cross-country team, he decided, from the high school. He spotted other tracks that weren't human and hoped he wasn't going to come face to face with the moose he'd run off. He didn't know enough about them to be sure they didn't hold grudges. The snow was deeper than he'd anticipated and made him curse himself for not slapping on his snowshoes, so he did what he could to use the tracks. He saw a streak he thought might be a fox and, when he stopped to catch his breath, spotted a herd of shaggy-coated deer. They trudged along no more than fifteen feet to his north. He could only assume he was downwind as they didn't so much as give him a glance, so he stood watching them until they wound their way out of sight. He worked his way to Carrie's back door past what he assumed was a garden or tool shed, around the building on stilts that would be their cache. Someone had cleared the back stoop, and there was a stack of firewood covered with a tarp by the door. He used the key and stepped inside a combination mudroom and laundry area. Since his boots were wet and caked with snow, he took them off, leaving them and his coat. The kitchen was clean, almost to a gleam. Maybe that's what women did, or some women, when they were coping with grief. They got out the cleanser and the mop. And the polishing cloth, he thought as he continued through the house, the vacuum cleaner. There wasn't a speck of dust to be found, nor any of the usual clutter of living. Maybe that was the point. She wasn't ready to live again yet. He went up, identified the kids' room by the posters on the walls, the disorder on the floor. For now, at least, he bypassed the master bedroom where the bed was carefully made and a patchwork throw was draped over the back of a chair. Did she sleep there now, unwilling, unable to lie down on the bed she shared with her husband? Beside the bedroom was Max's office, and here was the clutter, the dust and debris of normal living. The desk chair had a strip of duct tape along one of the seams, the every man's repair job. The desk itself was scarred and battered, an obvious second or third hand purchase, but the computer on it looked new or very well tended. There was a desk calendar, one of those cubes that followed a theme and gave you a picture and a saying each day. Max's was a fishing theme, and it had a cartoon man holding up a minnow-sized fish and claiming it was bigger when he'd hooked it. The date was January 19th. Max hadn't made it back home to rip it off to reveal the next day's joke. There was no message written on it, no handy clues such as meet, insert name of killer, at midnight. Nate bent to go through the trash can under the desk. 
he found several other pages of the cube, some with notes. I did a rod art. POV dog? Bathroom tap dripping. Carry pissed. Fix. And the one from the day before his death, the one covered with scribbles of one word. Pat. Nate took it out, placed it on the desk. He found several envelopes indicating Max had sat there, paying bills on one of the days shortly before he died, a couple of candy wrappers. He went through the desk drawers, found the checkbook, $250.06 on the balance after the bill-paying stint, two days before he died. Three passbooks for savings accounts, one for each of his children, one joint for him and his wife. He and Carrie had a $6,010 nest egg. There were envelopes, return address labels, rubber bands, paper clips, a box of staples. Nothing out of the ordinary. In the bottom drawer, he found four chapters of a manuscript entitled Cold Snap, a novel by Maxwell T. Hawbaker. Nate put it on the desk and got up to search the shelf unit running along one wall. To his pile, Nate added a box of floppy disks and a scrapbook holding newspaper articles. Then he sat down to test his computer skills. It wasn't password protected, which told him Max hadn't thought he had anything to hide. A run through the documents netted him a spreadsheet on which Max had carefully listed mortgage and time payments. Family man, Nate thought, responsible with his money. Nothing he could find on finances showed any large sums, anything out of the ordinary. If Max had been blackmailing his killer, he hadn't recorded the income alongside his monthly debits. He found more of the novel and the start of two more. A check through the floppies showed that Max had conscientiously backed them up. There were a few bookmarked sites, phishing for the most part. He found some saved email, phishing buddies, responses from a couple of people regarding sled dogs, follow-ups Nate assumed on the planned Iditarod article. He spent an hour threading through, but nothing jumped out and yelled, Clue. Gathering up what he had, he carted it down to the mudroom where he confiscated an empty box to dump it all into. He wandered back into the kitchen. The kitchen calendar had a bird theme. No one had thought or bothered to turn it over to February, much less March. More than half the little squares had notes. PTA meeting, hockey practice, book report due, dentist appointment. Normal family routine. The dentist appointment had been Max's, Nate noted, and he'd been due for it two days after his death. He flipped it up, glanced over February at March. A lot of notes there, too, with Gone Fishing in large capital letters over the second weekend in March. Nate let the page fall again. Routine, normal, ordinary. But there was that single calendar page from the trash can upstairs, covered with the name Pat. Four pairs of snowshoes hung in the mudroom. Studying them, he put on his boots, his coat, hefted the box, and started out again. He was back in the woods again, up to mid-shin in snow, when the gunshot blasted through the quiet. Instinctively, he dropped the box, dug under the coat for his own weapon. Even as he gripped it, there was a thunder in the woods. A single deer, a thick-bodied, heavily-antlered buck, leapt into view and continued its leaping gallop. With his heart thudding, Nate started moving in the direction it had come from. He made it about twenty yards when he saw the figure melt out of the trees, and the long gun it carried. They stood for a moment in the echoing stillness, each with a weapon in hand. Then the figure lifted his left hand, shoved back his hood. He scented you, Jacob said. Spooked and ran, even as I fired, so I missed. Missed, Nate repeated. I'd hoped to take some venison to Rose. David hasn't been able to hunt lately. He lowered his gaze, slow and deliberate, to Nate's sidearm. Do you hunt, Chief Burke? No, but when I hear a gunshot, I don't go looking for who fired it unarmed. Jacob made an obvious business of clicking on the safety. You found him, and I go home without meat. Sorry. It was the deer's day, not mine. Do you know your way out? I can find it. Well then. Jacob nodded turned and moving with grace and ease in his snowshoes, melted back into the trees. Nate kept his weapon out as he walked back, as he picked up the box he'd dropped. He didn't holster it again until he was back in his car. He drove to Meg's to push the box into the back of a closet. It was something he had to pursue on his own time. 
Since his pants were wet to the knees, he changed, then went down to the lake with the dogs to check for any sign of breakup before he drove back into town. Signs are up, Otto told him. So I see. We've got two complaints already about minding our own business. Anybody I need to talk to? Nope. You got two calls, Chief, from reporters? Peach tapped the pink while you were out notes on her counter. About Pat Galloway and Max? Follow up, they said. They have to catch me first. Peter's still on patrol? We sent him out for lunch. It was his turn. Otto scratched his chin. Ordered you an Italian sub. That's fine, thanks. Would a man go hunting two, three miles from his own place when he's got acres of hunting ground where he lives? Depends, wouldn't it? On what? What he was hunting, for one. Yeah, I guess it would depend on that. The cracks in the river lengthened and widened as the temperatures held above freezing. From the banks, Nate saw his first sight of the cold, deep blue shimmer between the gleam of white. Fascinated, he'd watched it spread and heard what sounded like artillery fire. Or the crashing fist of God. Plates of ice heaved up, swamped and surrounded by that blue, then floated placidly like newborn islands. Something almost religious about your first breakup, Hop commented as she walked up beside him. My first breakup was with Pixie Newberry, and it was more traumatic than religious. Hop stood in silence as the ice crackled and boomed. Pixie? Yeah. She had these big almond-shaped eyes, so everybody called her Pixie. She dumped me for this kid whose father had a boat. It was the first wave in a sea of broken hearts for me. Sounds shallow to me. You were better off without her. Didn't seem like it at twelve. I didn't think this would happen so fast. Once nature decides to move, there's no stopping her. And you can bet she'll slap us back with a few more licks of winter before she's done. But breakup's a time for celebration around here. We're having an informal breakup party at the lodge tonight. You'll want to put in an appearance. Okay. You've been spending more time at Meg's than the lodge, sleeping arrangement-wise. She smiled when he merely looked at her. It's been mentioned, here and there. Is my choice of sleeping arrangement a problem, official-wise? No, indeed. She cupped her hand around a cigarette, used a thick silver zippo to light it. And on a personal front, I'd estimate that Meg Galloway's no pixie Newberry. It's been mentioned, too, here and there, that there are lights on at Meg's pretty late at night. Maybe we have insomnia. She was the mayor, Nate reminded himself, and Galloway's journal hadn't referred to a woman on the mountain. I'm spending some of my off time on the Galloway matter. I see. She stared out at the river as the blue and the white battled. Most people go fishing, read a juicy book, or watch TV on their off time. Cops aren't most people. You do what pleases you, Ignatius. I know Charlene's planning to bring Pat back here as soon as she's able and bury him. Wants a full-fledged funeral. The ground ought to be thawed enough to manage it by June, unless we get another long freeze. She drew in smoke, sighed it out again. Part of me wishes that would be that. The dead are buried and the living have to live. It's hard on Carrie, I know. But you keeping this going won't bring her husband back. I don't believe he killed Galloway, and I don't believe he killed himself. Her face stayed perfectly still. Her eyes stayed on the busy river. That's not what I want to hear. God's pity on Carrie, but that's not what I want to hear. Nobody wants to hear they may be living next door to someone who's killed twice. She shuddered now, once and violently, and drew on the cigarette. She puffed at it hard, expelling smoke in bursts. I know the people who live next door to me, and a mile away and three miles from that. I know them by face and name and habits. I don't know a murderer, Ignatius. You knew Max. Oh, God. You climbed with Galloway. Her eyes sharpened now and focused on his face. Is this an interrogation? No, just a comment. She breathed in and out while the ice cracked. Yes, I did. My man and I did. I enjoyed it, too. The challenge of it, the thrill of it, in my younger days. 
Bo and I settled for hiking, a night of camping and good weather the last few years he was alive. That Bo was alive, she said. Who'd he trust most when he was on the mountain? Who did Galloway trust up there? Himself? That'd be the first rule of climbing. You better trust yourself first and last. Your husband was mayor back then. It was more honorary than official in those days. Even so, he knew the people around here, paid attention. I bet you did, too. And, if you put your mind to it, thought back to February of 88, you might remember who, besides Galloway, wasn't in lunacy, who was away for a week or more. She tossed the cigarette down where it sizzled against the snow. Then she kicked snow over it to bury it from view. You're giving a lot of credit to my memory, Ignatius. I'll think about it. Good. If you remember anything, come to me. Just me, Hop. Spring's coming, Hop said. And spring can be a bitch. She walked away, leaving him by the river. He stood in the chilly wind, watching that river come back to life. 22. It wasn't just river ice that cracked and heaved during breakup. Streets, frozen through the long winter, burst with fissures the size of canyons and potholes wide enough to swallow a truck. It didn't surprise Nate that Bing had the contract for road repair and maintenance. What did surprise him was that no one seemed to give much of a damn that the repair and maintenance moved at the pace of a lame snail. He had other things to worry about. People, he discovered, cracked too. Some, who had held on to their sanity through the dark, relentless winter, appeared to think the tease of spring was a good time to let it go. His cells were revolving doors for the drunk, the disorderly, the domestic disturbances, and the just plain dopey. The sound of horns tooting and catcalls brought him to the bedroom window just after dawn. A light snow had fallen during the night, hardly more than a dusting that lay thin and sparkling on the streets and sidewalks under the rising sun. The lights on the barricades around the two-foot pothole he'd named Lunatic Crater blinked red and yellow. Around those blinking lights he saw a man dancing what appeared to be a jig. That might have been surprising enough for sunrise entertainment, but the fact that the man was buck-ass naked added a certain panache. A crowd was gathering already. Some were clapping, maybe keeping time, Nate speculated. Others were shouting, encouragement or derision in equal measures. With a sigh, Nate toweled off his half-shaven face, grabbed a shirt and shoes, and headed down. The dining room was deserted, with a few plates of half-eaten breakfast as testament to the draw of a naked guy dancing on Lunatic Street. Nate grabbed the jacket off a hook and walked out in his shirt sleeves. There were whistles and stomping feet, and a dawn temperature Nate judged hadn't quite come up to the freezing mark as yet. He nudged his way through the gathered crowd. He recognized the dancer now, Tobias Simsky part-time clerk at the corner store, part-time dishwasher at the lodge, part-time disc jockey at Lunacy Radio. He changed the jig to some kind of western movie Indian war dance. Chief! Rose, with Jessie's hand in hers and the baby snuggled in a pack at her breast, smiled serenely. Nice morning! Right. Is today some particular event, a pagan ritual I might have missed hearing about? No, just Wednesday. Okay, he passed through the onlookers. Hey, Toby, forget your hat this morning? Still dancing, Toby tossed back his long brown hair and threw out his arms. Clothes are only a symbol of man's denial of nature, of his acceptance of restrictions and loss of innocence. Today I merge with nature. Today I embrace my innocence. I am man. Just barely. Someone called out and gave the crowd a good laugh. Why don't we go talk about that? Nate took his arm and managed to flap the jacket over his hips. Man is a child, and a child comes naked into the world. I've heard that. Show's over, Nate called out. He tried to arrange the jacket while guiding Toby across the street. The man had grapefruit-sized goosebumps on every inch of exposed skin. Nothing much to see here anyway, he muttered under his breath. I drink only water, Toby told him. I eat only what I gather with my own hands. Got it. No coffee and donuts for you. If we don't dance, the dark will come back, and the cold winter, the snow. 
He looked around wildly now. It's everywhere! It's everywhere! I know. He got him inside, into a cell. Figuring Ken was the closest he had to a shrink, he contacted him to request a house call. In the next cell, drunk Mike snored away, sleeping off a tooth that had him wandering into a neighbor's house instead of his own the night before. Including drunk Mike, he'd had six calls between eleven and two, slashed tires on Holly's truck, a portable radio turned up to full blast and left on Sari Parker's doorstep, broken windows at the school, more yellow graffiti on Tim Bauer's new ski and on Charlene's Ford Bronco. Apparently, even the thought of spring stirred up the natives. He was thinking about coffee, about his missed breakfast, about what drove a man to dancing naked on a snowy street when Bing came slamming in. He was big as a tank and looked ready to commit murder. Found these in my gear. He slapped two fishing rods onto the counter and jabbed the auger, which looked like a curly sword, before slamming it down as well. I ain't no thief, and you better find out who stowed them there so I'd look like one. Would these belong to Ed Wolcott? Got his name engraved on the damn rods, doesn't he? Just like that prissy nad ass to have his name plated on overpriced fishing rods. I'm telling you right now, I'm not having him say I took them. Clean his clock good and proper if he does. Where did you find them? He worked his hands into fists. You try to say I took them, I'll clean your clock too. I didn't say you took them. I asked where you found them. In my shack. Went out last night. Gonna tow my shack in for the season. Found them then. Mold over what to do about it. And this is what I'm doing. He jabbed a finger at Nate. Now, you do what you're supposed to do. When's the last time you were in your shack before last night? Been busy, haven't I? Couple of weeks, maybe. If they'd been there, I'd have spotted them right off, just like I did. I don't use that prissy-ass gear. Why don't you come back to my office, Bing, and sit down? He readied meat slab fists again, bared his teeth. What for? You're going to make an official statement. Details, like if you noticed if anything else was disturbed, added, or subtracted. If your shack was locked. Who might want to get your non-prissy ass in hot water? Bing scowled. You're going to take my word on it? That's right. Bing jutted his bearded chin. All right, then. But it's going to have to be quick. I got work to do, don't I? We'll make it quick. You get that crater fixed on Lunatic before it swallows a family of five. Since Bing was a man of few words, the statement took under ten minutes. Do you and Ed have a history I should know about? I put my money in his bank, take it out as I need it. You two socialize? Bing's answer was a snort. <clears throat> I don't get invites to dinner at his place and wouldn't go if I did. Why's that? His wife a lousy cook? Likes to put on airs, both of them, like they were better than the rest of us. He's an asshole, but so is better than half the world's population. He shrugged his massive shoulders. It was like watching a mountain stretch. I got nothing against him, particularly. Can you think of anyone who'd have something against you, enough to want to cause you trouble? I mind my own and expect people to do the same. Anybody's got a problem with that, I'll... Clean their clock, Nate finished. I'll see Ed gets his property back. Appreciate you bringing it in. Bing sat another moment, drumming his thick fingers against his wide thighs. I don't hold with stealing. Me either. Don't see why you're so fired up to lock up a man who's had a few drinks or punches somebody who gets in his face. But a thief's different. Nate believed he spoke his own truth. There'd been violence on Bing's record, but no theft. And? Somebody took my buck knife and my spare gloves out of my rig. Nate pulled up another form. Give me a description. It's a goddamn buck knife, he hissed through his teeth when Nate simply waited. <sighs> Got a five-inch blade, closed lock back, wood handle, hunting knife. And the gloves? Nate prompted as he keyed in the description. Work gloves for Christ's sake. Cowhide fleece lining, black. When did you notice them missing? Last week. And you're reporting it now because... Thing didn't speak for a minute and moved those mountainous shoulders again. 
Maybe you're not a complete asshole. I'm touched. Let me blink these sentimental tears out of my eyes. You lock your rig? No. Nobody's been stupid enough to mess with my stuff. Always a first time, Nate said. When he was alone and waiting for the town doctor to come give Toby some sort of psych eval, Nate studied the reports on his desk. A decent stack of reports, he thought. Maybe not the sort of load he'd been accustomed to in Baltimore, but a definite stack. With petty theft and petty vandalism leading the pack. Enough so, he mused, that he'd been kept busy the last couple of weeks. So busy he'd had little time to spare for his unofficial investigation. Maybe it wasn't coincidence. Maybe it wasn't some cosmic reminder that he wasn't homicide any longer. Maybe somebody was nervous. He called Ed in and watched the man's face light up when he saw the rods and auger. I take it those are yours? They sure are. I'd given up on them, certain they'd made their way to some pawn shop in Anchorage. Good work, Chief Burke. You've made an arrest? There's no arrest. Bing found them mixed in with his gear in his ice shack last night. He brought them in to me first thing this morning. But is there any reason you can think of why Bing would have broken into your shack, defaced it, taken those, then brought them in to me today? No. Ed stroked a hand over each rod in turn. No, I guess not, but the fact remains he had them. The only facts are he found them and returned them. Do you want to pursue this? Ed blew out a breath, stood for a moment with his face reflecting a man struggling with some inner war. Well, I honestly can't see why Bing would have taken them, much less turned them in if he had. I have him back, and that's the important thing. But it doesn't address the vandalism or the theft of nearly a full quart of scotch. I'll keep the case open. Good. Good, then. He nodded toward the window, to beyond where ice flows floated on the deep, dark blue. You survived your first winter. Looks like. There are some who don't expect you to put yourself through the experience a second time. I've wondered myself if you plan to go back to the lower 48 after your contract. I suppose that depends on whether or not the town council offers to renew my contract. I haven't heard any complaints. Well, nothing major in any case. He picked up the rods, the auger. I should get these stowed. I need you to sign for them. Nate nudged a form across his desk. Let's keep it official. Oh, absolutely. He looped his signature on the proper lines. Thank you, Chief. I'm glad to have my property back. Nate noticed him glance at the draped blanket, as he had twice before, but there were no questions or comments about it. Nate rose to shut the door himself, then he walked to the board, uncovered it. On the list of names, he penciled the line connecting Bing to Ed, and added a question mark. The clouds rolled back in by afternoon, and through them Nate spotted the red slash of Meg's plane. He was on his way back from investigating a call reporting a dead body by the stream in Rancor Woods. It turned out to be an old pair of boots stuck in the snow, which the holidaying bird watchers renting the cabin had spotted through their field glasses. Tourists, Nate thought, as he tossed the boots, likely abandoned by other tourists in the back of his car. Then he heard the familiar thunder of the bush plane and watched Meg slide out of the clouds. By the time he got to the skinny dock on the river, she'd already landed. The floats on her plane were another sign of spring, he thought. He walked over, feeling the dock sway under him, while she and Jacob unloaded the supplies. Hey, cutie. She dropped the box on the dock and made it shudder. Saw you out by Rancor Woods. My heart went pity-pat, didn't it, Jacob? He chuckled under his breath and carried a large box down the dock to his truck. Bought you a present? Yeah, give it up. She reached into another box, pushed contents around, and pulled out a box of condoms. Thought you might be shy about buying your supply at the corner store. Whereas I wouldn't be shy about having you wave them around on a public dock? He grabbed them out of her hand, stuffed them in his jacket pocket. I got you three boxes, but I'll keep the other two in a safe place. She winked, then bent to pick up a carton. He lifted it first. I'll carry it. Careful with it. It's an antique tea set. Joanna's grandmother wanted her to have it for her 30th birthday. 
She hauled out another box, walked with him. What are you doing hanging around the docks, Chief? Looking for loose women? Found one, didn't I? She laughed, gave him a little elbow jab. <laughs> we'll see if you can make me looser later. It's movie night. Movie night Saturday. No, they moved it, remember? Conflict with the high school spring fling. Right, right. I've got a couple of dresses in this load for that. What's the movie? Double feature. Vertigo and rear window. I'll bring the popcorn. She loaded the box in the truck, studied him as he loaded his. You look tired, Chief. A lot of people seem to have spring fever. It's keeping me busy. Busy enough I haven't been able to give certain areas as much time or attention as I'd like. You're not just talking about my naked body. She looked back to her plane where Jacob was getting the last of the cargo. My father's been dead for sixteen years. Time's relative. I want to close this down for you. For him. For myself, too. She twined a lock of his hair around her finger. He'd let her trim it for him. A sign, she thought, of a courageous man. Or one loopily in love. Tell you what. Let's take the night off from all of it. Let's go to the movies, eat popcorn, and fool around. I've got more questions than I have answers. I'm going to have to ask you some of them. You may not like them. Then let's definitely take the night off. We've got to deliver this stuff. I'll see you later. She hopped in the cab of the truck and sent Nate a quick wave as Jacob pulled out. But she watched him in the side view mirror until they'd turned. He looks worried, Jacob commented. His kind always worries. Why do I find that so attractive? He'd like to shield you. No one else ever did. He smiled a little when she turned to stare at him. I taught you, listened to you, cared for you, but I never shielded you. I don't need to be shielded, or want to be. No, but knowing he would attracts you. Maybe. Maybe. She'd have to think about that one. But his wants and mine are bound to ram headlong into each other before long. Then what? That depends on which one is still standing after the collision. With a half laugh, she stretched out her legs. <laughs> he doesn't stand a chance. She'd hoped to have time to get home, clean herself up, polish herself up, and set the stage for a night of marathon sex. It was a way to keep things interesting and basic and, she admitted, thoughtless. But she believed it wouldn't hurt him to be thoughtless for a little while. He thought entirely too much, and it was contagious. But she didn't have time, not after delivering all the cargo, collecting her fees. She had to settle for popping the corn in the lodge's kitchen while Big Mike serenaded her with show tunes. It wasn't a hardship to listen to Big Mike sing as he worked. She caught up on the news as Rose passed in and out of the kitchen, and she cooed over pictures of Willow and new shots of Big Mike's toddler. It was, she thought, almost like being home in the warmth of the active kitchen, listening to chatter and music. And there was the added benefit of being able to pilfer a slice of Big Mike's applesauce cake. Got yourself a movie date. Big Mike said between tunes. Romantic. Meg ate the cake with her hands, standing beside the stove. Could be, unless he hogs the popcorn. Got little stars in your eyes. Little stars and hearts. Mm-mm. She managed with her mouth full. Sure do. Him too. He made kissy noises. An odd sound, Meg thought, with a laugh, coming out of a buff, bald, black man. I got them in my eyes the first time I saw my Julia. Still do. So here you are, baking great applesauce cake for a bunch of sourdoughs. I like baking cake. He plated fried fish, red potatoes, and French-cut green beans. But for Julia and my little princess Annie, I'd do just about anything. This is a good place to live, good place to work. But if you got love, any place is. He segued from show tunes to the Beatles, All You Need Is Love, while Meg polished off the cake and Rose came in for orders. It was a good place to live. Meg mused as she filled a paper bag with the popcorn, shook it to distribute butter and salt. She was just going to have to figure out what to do about the love. She walked over to the town hall in a chilly damp that promised rain. Nate was late, which surprised her. He hustled in just as the lights dimmed. Sorry, had a call, porcupine. Tell you later. 
He tried to settle into the movie, to the mood, to the moment. But his thoughts kept circling around. He'd connected Ed and Bing on his board that morning, drawn together by stolen fishing gear. Something that had all the earmarks of a prank or a kid's adventure. There were dozens of other connections linking person to person. They were all around him, sitting in the dark watching Jimmy Stewart play a cop after a breakdown. Been there, done that, made mused. Stewart would spiral down too. He'd suffer and he'd sweat his way into an obsession. And he'd get the girl, lose the girl, get the girl, lose the girl. A merry-go-round of pain and pleasure. The girl was the key. Was Meg? As Patrick Galloway's only child, wasn't she the living symbol of him? If not the key, another link. How long are you going to circle before you land? What? Looks like a holding pattern to me. Meg angled her head, and he realized the lights were back on for intermission between the features. Sorry. Zoned out. I'll say. You didn't get close to your share of the popcorn. She rolled up the bag, left it on the seat. Let's get some air before the second feature. They had to take it in the open doorway, like most of the movie crowd. The clouds that had rolled in had burst open sometime during Kim Novak's transformation. The rain Meg had scented gushed out of the sky, pummeled the ground. We'll have some flooding, Meg said, frowned through the clouds of smoke from those brave and drenched souls who stood just outside with cigarettes cupped in umbrellaed palms and black ice on the roads when the temperature drops a little more. If you want to get home now, I'll take you. I need to come back, keep an eye on this. No, I'll stay for the second feature, see how it goes. Just as easy turn to snow again. Let me check on a couple of things. I'll meet you back inside. There's a cop for you, ever vigilant. She saw his face change, rolled her eyes. Not a complaint, Burke. Jesus. I'm not going to whine and go pouty if I end up watching a movie by myself, and I can get myself home if I need to. I can even handle the rest of tonight's planned entertainment on my own if you're not around to service me. I have fresh batteries. You look at me and see her. It's going to piss me off. He started to say he hadn't, but she was already walking away. And it would have been a lie anyway. Conditioned response, he thought, and tried to roll the weight of it off his shoulders. Still carrying it, he picked Peter, Hop, Bing, the professor, out of the crowd. He spent intermission, and a little beyond it, coordinating and confirming procedure for flooding. By the time he rejoined Meg, Grace Kelly was trying to convince Jimmy Stewart to pay more attention to her than the people in the apartment he could see from his rear window. He took Meg's hand, linked fingers. Knee jerk, he murmured in her ear. Sorry. Leave off the knee and you've got it right. As she turned her head, brushed her lips over his. Watch the movie this time. He did, or tried to. But just as Raymond Burr caught Grace Kelly snooping around his apartment, the door banged open behind them. Light ran in behind Otto, causing most of the audience to boo and shout at him to close the damn door. He came in fast and wet, ignoring the curses as he zeroed in on Nate. Nate was already up and moving toward him. You need to come outside, Chief. For the second time that day... Nate went out in his shirt sleeves, this time to the sizzle of sleet on pavement and the icy sting of it on his skin. He saw the body immediately, and dragging the hair out of his face, moved through the wet to the curb. He thought at first it was rock or bull, and his heart went thick in his throat. But the dog that lay in blood and freezing rain was older than Meg's, with more white in his coloring. The knife that had been used to slash its throat lay buried in its chest. He heard someone scream from behind him. Get them back inside, he ordered Otto. Control the situation. I know this dog, Nate. It's Joe and Lara's old dog, Yukon. Harmless. Barely got a tooth left in his head. Get these people back inside. Either you or Peter bring me out something to cover him up with. Peter came on the run moments after Otto went in. Jacob gave me a slicker. God, Chief, it's Yukon. It's Steven's dog, Yukon. This isn't right. This just isn't right. Do you recognize the knife? Look at the handle, Peter. I don't know. There's a lot of blood and... I don't know. But Nate knew. His gut told him it was going to be a buck knife. It was going to be Bing's missing buck knife. We're going to take this dog down to the clinic. You're going to help me load him in the back of my car. But you're going to go over and get the camera first so we can record this scene. He's dead. 
That's right. He's dead. We're going to examine him at the clinic after we record the scene here. Once we have him loaded, I need you to go back inside, tell Joe and Lara their dog's with me, and where. Go get the camera now. He looked up, caught a movement out of the corner of his eye. When he straightened, he saw Meg on the sidewalk, holding his jacket. You forgot this. I don't want you out here. I've already seen what somebody did to that poor dog. Poor old Yukon. It's going to break Lara's heart. Go back inside. I'm going home. I'm going home to my own dogs. He grabbed her arm. You're going back inside, and when I've cleared it, you're going to the lodge. This isn't a police state, Burke. I can go where I want to go. You're going to do what the hell I tell you. I'm going to know exactly where you are, and it's not going to be alone five miles out of town. There's ice on the roads, hazardous conditions, flash flooding, and somebody who'd be cold enough to cut this dog's throat from ear to ear. So get your ass back inside until I tell you otherwise. I'm not leaving my dogs out. I'll get your dogs. Get inside, Meg. Get inside, or I'll haul you in and lock you in a cell. He waited five thrumming seconds, with nothing but the crackling hiss of sleet striking the ground. She spun around, stormed back in. He waited where he was, outside in the rain, beside a dead dog until Peter came roaring back. He took the camera, took several Polaroids, tucking them into the pocket of his jacket. Help me load this dog, Peter. Then you go in, follow the orders I gave you. I want you to tell Otto to escort Meg to the lodge and see that she stays there until I say different. Is that clear? Peter nodded. His Adam's apple bobbed, but he nodded. Uh, Ken's inside, Chief. I was sitting just behind him during the movie. Do you want him out here now? Yeah. Yeah, send him out. He can ride with me. He shoved his dripping hair out of his eyes, while thin fog twined around his ankles. I'm going to count on you to keep order, Peter. I want you to disperse the crowd inside. Send everyone on their way. Advise them to go home. Let them know we're taking care of things. They're going to want to know what... what happened. We don't know what happened yet, do we? He looked back at the dog. Keep everyone calm. You're good at talking to people. You go in there and talk to your people. And Peter, pay attention to who's in there. I want you and Otto to make a list of everyone who's inside. And, Nate thought, I'll know everyone who isn't. They loaded the dog into the vehicle. As Peter hurried back into town hall, Nate crouched down by his rear right tire. Beside it, just under the axle, was a pair of bloody gloves. He opened the door, dug out an evidence bag. Lifting the gloves by the cuffs, he sealed them. They would be Bing's, he thought, as the knife would be. A knife and gloves Bing had reported stolen only hours before. 23. It would have been quick. Ken stood over the dog and scrubbed his hands over his face. The neck wound did it, Nate prompted. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, what kind of a sick son of a bitch does this to a dog? You said, uh, you said the chest wound didn't show much blood. He was gone when whoever did this rammed the knife into the chest. You slice the neck like that, sever the jugular, that's game point. Bloody. Blood would have gushed. Yeah. God. Rain washed away some of it, most of it, but not all. And he was still a little warm when we found him. He'd been dead, what, maybe an hour, if that? Nate. Shaking his head, Ken took off his glasses, polished them on the tail of his shirt. This is way out of my league. Your guess on that would be as good, if not better, than mine. But, yeah, an hour's about right. Intermission been over around an hour. He wasn't there when we went out between movies, and there was too much blood left for him to have been killed somewhere else and dumped. You knew this dog. Sure, old Yukon. His eyes went shiny, and he rubbed them dry. Sure. You give anybody any trouble? Snap at somebody that you know of? Bite anyone? Yukon? Barely got enough teeth left to gum up his own food. Friendly dog. Harmless. Maybe that's why I'm having a hard time keeping it together. He turned away for a moment, struggling for control. Max. Well, Max was horrible. A human being, for God's sake. But this dog? This dog was old and sweet and defenseless. Sit down for a minute if you need to. But Ken stood where he was, looking down at the dog, at the fur matted with blood and still dripping with rain. Sorry, Nate. 
You'd think a doctor could handle himself better than this. He sucked in air, pushed it back out of his lungs. <sighs> what do you want me to do? Joe and Lara are going to be coming along in a minute. I need you to keep them out of here until I finish. What are you going to do? My job. Just keep them out until I'm done. He lifted his camera took more pictures. He wasn't a coroner, but he'd stood over enough dead bodies, witnessed enough autopsies to guess that the knife strike had been executed from over the dog's head, a little behind. A left-to-right stroke. Straddled him, lifted his head up, sliced. Blood jets out, coats the gloves, maybe the sleeves, maybe even splashes back some. Dog goes down, bury the knife in him. Ditch the gloves, walk away. A couple of minutes with the rain giving cover with a couple hundred people, maybe a little more, inside the building focused on Jimmy Stewart. Risky, he thought as he dusted the handle of the knife for prints, but calculated. Cold. There was nothing on the knife but blood. He bagged it, then dug up a plastic sack. He put the knife and the photographs inside and went out to speak to the wises. The rain had turned to a thin, wet snow by the time Nate tracked down Bing. He found him in his enormous garage by his log house. His weather radio was on as he tinkered under the hood of his truck. There were a couple of other vehicles inside and what looked like a small engine or a motor up on blocks. One of the drawers on a huge, rusted red toolbox was open. Above a long counter was a pegboard holding more tools, with a calendar beside it featuring a mostly naked blonde with enormous breasts. A muscular-looking sewing machine, sewing machine, sat on a wood table in the far corner, and over that was a moose head. The place smelled like beer stirred with smoke and grease. Bing squinted over at Nate, one eye closed against the smoke that drifted up from the cigarette clamped in his lips. We get more rain tomorrow, the river's gonna come up and kiss Lunatic Street. Gonna need the sandbags I got back of the truck. Sandbags, Nate thought with a glance at the sewing machine. He couldn't quite picture Bing sewing up sandbags, but he supposed there were bigger wonders in the world. You left the movie early. Seen enough? Gonna be busy by morning. What's it to you? Nate stepped forward, held out the bag knife. Yours? Bing drew the cigarette out of his mouth as he turned. You'd have to have been blinded by more than a little smoke to miss the blood on handle and blade. Looks like it. He tossed the cigarette down, heeled it to pulp on the oil-stained concrete. Yeah, it's my knife. Looks like it's been used some, too. Where'd you find it? And Joe and Lara's dog, Yukon. Bing took one step back. Nate saw it, the quick, jerking step of a man who'd been sucker-punched. What the hell are you talking about? Somebody used this to slit the dog's throat, then jammed it in his chest so I wouldn't have any trouble finding it. What time did you leave the movie, Bing? Somebody killed that dog? Somebody killed that dog? Awareness slid over the shock in his eyes. You're saying I killed that dog? His fist tightened over the wrench still in his hand. Is that what you're saying? You take a swing at me with that, I'll take you out. You want to spare yourself that humiliation? Because believe me, I can do it. Put it down. Now. Rage trembled over his face, quaked visibly through his body. You've got yourself a big bad temper, don't you, Bing? Nate said softly. The kind that's earned you some assaults on your record, had you spending a few nights here and there behind bars. The kind that's pushing you right now to crack my skull like an egg with that wrench. Go ahead. Try it. Bing heaved the wrench across the room where it smashed a chip out of the cinder block wall. He was breathing like a steam engine, and his face was red as brick. Fuck you! Sure I punched a few faces, cracked a few heads, but I'm no goddamn dog killer. And if you say I am, I don't need a wrench to bust your head open. I asked you what time you left the movie. I went out to catch a smoke at intermission. You saw me. You started in on how we had to prep for possible flooding. I came back here, loaded those damn sandbags. He jerked a thumb toward the bed of his truck, where at least a hundred sandbags were stacked. Figured I'd tune up the engine while I was at it. I've been here ever since. Somebody went to Joe's place and killed that dog. It wasn't me. I like that dog. Nick took out the bag gloves. Are these yours? 
Staring at them, Bing rubbed the back of his hand over his mouth. The red was dying out of his cheek, with clammy white rising. What the hell's going on here? Is that a yes? Yeah, they're mine. I'm not denying it. I told you somebody took them. Took my spare gloves and my buck knife. I reported it. Just this morning, too. A cynical person might wonder if you were covering yourself. Why the hell would I kill a dog? Damn stupid old dog! Bing scrubbed at his face and shook another cigarette out of the pack in his breast pocket. His hands shook visibly. You don't have a dog, do you, Bing? So that makes me a dog hater? Christ! I had a dog. He died two years ago this June. Got cancer. Bing cleared his throat, drew hard on his cigarette. <clears throat> cancer took him. Somebody kills a dog, you have to wonder if he had problems with the dog or the people who owned it. I didn't have any problems with that dog. I got no problem with Joe or Lara or that college boy of theirs. You ask them. You ask them if we had any problems. But somebody's got problems with me, that's for damn sure. Any idea why that might be? He shrugged jerkily. Only thing I know is I didn't kill that dog. Keep available, Bing. If you plan on leaving town for any reason, I want to know about it. I ain't gonna stand by while people point the finger at me. Stay available, Nate repeated and went out the way he'd come in. Meg nursed a beer and her temper as she waited. She didn't like waiting, and Nate was going to hear about it when he got back. He'd snapped orders at her like she was some sort of half-wit green recruit and he was the general. She didn't like orders, and he was going to hear about that too. He was going to get both ears full when he got back. Where the hell was he? She was worried sick about her dogs. No matter how the sensible part of her insisted, they were fine, and that Nate would keep his word and get them for her. She should have been allowed to get them herself, instead of being under some sort of half-assed house arrest. She didn't want to be here, worrying, helpless, sipping beer and playing poker with Otto, Skinny Jim, and the professor to pass the time. She was up twenty-two dollars in change, and she didn't give a damn. Where the hell was he? And who the hell did he think he was, telling her what to do, threatening to lock her in jail? He'd have done it too, she thought as she drew the eight of clubs to fill out a very pretty full house. He hadn't been sweet, sad-eyed Nate when he'd stood out in the rain beside that dog. Beside poor, dead Yukon. He'd been something else. Someone else. Someone she imagined he'd been back in Baltimore before circumstances had cut him off at the knees. Cut him off at the heart. She didn't give a damn about that either. She wouldn't give a damn. See your two dollars, she said to Jim. Raise it too, and tossed her money into the pot. Her mother had given Jim an hour break and was working the bar. Not that there was a lot of business, Meg thought, as the professor folded and Otto bumped her raise another two. Other than their table, there was a booth of four. Outsiders. Climbers waiting out the weather. The two old farts, hands, and decks had another booth, whiling away a rainy evening with beer and checkers. And waiting, she knew, for whatever gossip might come in the door. There'd be more in and out if the river rose people coming in for a few minutes of dry and warm, ordering up coffee before they went out to sandbag again. When it was done, there'd be more, piling in, wet and tired and hungry, but not ready to go home alone, not ready to break the camaraderie of bucking nature. They'd want coffee and alcohol and whatever hot meal was put in front of them. Charlene would see they got it. She'd work until the last of them were gone. Meg had seen it before. She tossed in two dollars to call when Jim folded. Two pair, Otto announced. Kings over fives. Your kings are going to have to bow to my ladies, she set down two queens, seeing as they're cozied up with three eights. Son of a bitch! Otto watched the nice little pile of bills and coins as Meg swept them away. Then he lifted his chin, pushed back his chair as Nate stepped in from the lobby. Chief? Meg jerked around. She'd sat facing the outside door, waiting to pounce the minute he opened it. Instead, she thought sourly, he'd snuck in behind her. Could use some coffee, Charlene. It's good and hot, she filled a large mug. I can fix you a meal. That'd be good and hot, too. No, thanks. Where are my dogs? Meg demanded. In the lobby? Otto, 
I ran into Hop and some others outside. Consensus is the river looks like it's going to hold, but we'll need to keep an eye on it. No more than a light snow coming down now. Forecasters say the system's going to head west, so we're probably in the clear. He drank down half the coffee, held the mug out to Charlene for a refill. It's flooded over on Lake Shore. Peter and I put hazard markers up there and across from the east edge of Rancor Woods. Those two spots are a problem if too many people piss on the side of the road, Otto told him. The system goes west. We won't have a problem in town. We'll keep an eye, Nate repeated and turned toward the stairs. Just one damn minute. Chief! Meg stood in the doorway, a dog on either side. I've got some things to say to you. I need a shower. You can say them while I'm cleaning up, or you can wait. Her lips peeled back into a snarl as he carried his coffee up the steps. Wait my ass! She stomped up behind him, the dogs in her wake. Who do you think you are? I think I'm chief of police. I don't care if you're chief of the known universe. You don't get off snapping at me, ordering me, threatening me. I did get off, but I wouldn't have had to do any of those things if you'd just done what I told you. What you told me? She shoved into the room behind him. You don't tell me. You're not my boss or my father. Just because I've slept with you doesn't give you the right to tell me what to do. He yanked off his soaked jacket, then tapped the badge on his shirt. No, but this does. He peeled off the shirt on the way to the bathroom. He was still someone else, she thought. The someone else who'd lived behind those sad eyes, just waiting to muscle his way out. That someone was hard and cold. Dangerous. She heard the shower start up. Both dogs continued to stand, their heads cocked as they looked up at her. Lie down, she murmured. She marched into the bathroom. Nate was sitting on the toilet lid, fighting off wet boots. You sick Otto on me like some sort of guard dog and leave me waiting damn near three hours? Three hours where I don't know what's going on? He looked at her, dead in the face with eyes like flint. I had work and more important things to do than keep you updated. You want the news? He set the boots aside, rose to strip off his pants. Turn on the radio. Don't you talk to me like I'm some sort of whiny, irritating female. He stepped into the shower, ripped the curtain shut after him. And stop acting like one. God, he needed the heat. Nate pressed his hands to the tile, dipped his head and let the hot water pour over him. An hour or two of it, he estimated, it might just reach his tired, frozen bones. A bottle or two of aspirin, parts of him might stop aching. Three or four days of sleep might just counteract the fatigue that trudging through icy flood water, hauling barricades, watching a grown man and woman weep over their murdered dog had drenched him with. Part of him wanted the quiet, the quiet dark that he could sink into where none of it really mattered. And part of him was afraid he'd find his way back there, all too easily. When he heard the curtain draw back again, he stayed as he was, arms braced, head down, eyes shut. You don't want to fight with me now, Meg. You'll lose. I'll tell you something, Burke. I don't like being shuffled off like a petty annoyance. I don't like being ignored, ordered around. I'm not sure I liked the way you looked outside Town Hall tonight, so I couldn't see anything I recognized on your face, in your eyes. It pisses me off, and... She slid her arms around him pressed her naked body to his so that he jerked straight. It stirs me up. Don't. He clasped his hands over hers, prying hers apart before he turned to hold her at arm's length. Just don't. Deliberately, she looked down. Deliberately, she smiled as she looked up again. Seems to be a contradiction here. I don't want to hurt you, and I would, the way I'm feeling right now. You don't scare me. You got me all churned up, spoiling for a fight. All of a sudden, I'm spoiling for something else. Give me something else. She reached up, ran her hand down his chest. We'll finish fighting after. I'm not feeling friendly. Me either. Nate, sometimes you just need something else. Just need to go somewhere else and forget for a little while. Burn up some of the mad or the hurt or the scared. Burn me up, she murmured. She gripped his hips now, squeezed. She'd have been better off if he'd pushed her away. He was sure of it. But he yanked her toward him, 
so that warm, wet body collided with his, so he could find her mouth, ravage it. She clamped around him, hooking her arms up his back so her fingers could dig into his shoulders, nails biting flesh. The heat pumped out of her, and it reached his bones, seared through them, scoring away the tired and the cold line of anger. Her hand streaked down him again, wet against wet, and her head dropped back to invite him to feast on her throat, her shoulders, anywhere he could find that soft, warm flesh. The sound she made, the sound that simmered against his lips, was one of erotic triumph. Here. She slid the soap out of the slot. Let's clean you up. I like the feel of a man's back under my hands, especially when it's all wet and slippery. She had a voice like a siren. He let her use it on him, use her hands on him, let her think she was guiding him. When he pushed her back to the shower wall, the sleepy look in her eyes sharpened with surprise. When she started to smile, he crushed his mouth to hers. She'd been right, she thought dimly. He was someone else, someone who took control, ruthlessly, who took away choice, who could make her surrender it. Even as his mouth took possession of hers, he twisted the soap from her hand. He ran it over her breasts, long, teasing strokes that had her nipples aching. Her breath trembled out in a sigh. The tickle low in her belly told her she was ready, that she wanted, she needed. Rubbing her lips down the side of his neck, she murmured to him, It's good with you. It's good. Be inside me now. Come inside me. You'll scream first. She laughed, nipped, not so gently. <laughs> no, I won't. Yes. He hauled her arms over her head, cuffed her wrists with one hand, pinned them there. You will. He slid the soap between her legs, rubbing it, sliding it, watching her as her body shuddered to orgasm. Nate! I warned you. Something like panic lit inside her, panic quickly tangled with razor-edged pleasure as his fingers dipped inside her. She twisted, looking for freedom, for more, for him. But he drove her, past the point she could hold it, past the point she thought she could bear it. Her breath sobbed out, half-mad pleas as the water poured hot over her shaking body, as the steam blurred her vision. When it burst in her, ripping a line between sanity and madness, he muffled her scream with his mouth. Say my name. He had to hear it. Had to know she knew who had her. Say my name, he ordered, as he hoisted her by the hips and buried himself inside her. Nate! Again. Say it again. His breath was raw in his throat. Look at me and say my name. Nate! She fisted a hand in his hair, dug her fingers into his shoulder. She looked at his face, looked into his eyes, and saw him, saw herself. Nate! He took her, took her, took her until he was empty, until she was limp as water, her head dropped on his shoulder. He had to brace a hand on the wet wall to catch his breath, to catch himself. He fumbled for the tap to shut off the shower. I need to sit down, she managed. I really need to sit down. Hold on a minute. Because he wasn't sure she would, he boosted her up, half slinging her over his shoulder as he levered them out of the shower. He grabbed a couple of towels, though he imagined with the heat they generated, the water would steam off them in a matter of minutes. The dogs got to their feet when he walked into the bedroom with her. You better tell your pals you're okay. What? The dogs, Meg. Reassure your dogs before they decide I've knocked you unconscious. Rock, bull, relax. She all but dripped out of his arms when he laid her on the bed. My head's buzzing. You better try to dry off. He dropped one of the towels on her belly. I'll get you a shirt or something. She didn't bother to dry off, but only lay there enjoying the used, lax sensation weighting her body. You looked tired when you came in. Tired and mean, with a thin coat of ice over it all. Same look you had outside Town Hall. 
I've seen it a couple of other times, a quick glimpse of it. Cop face. He said nothing, only pulled on an old pair of sweats, tossed her a flannel shirt. It's one of the things that stirred me up. Weird. The road's dicey out to your place. You're gonna need to stay here. She waited a moment, letting her thoughts coalesce again. You shrugged me off, before, before when we were outside. She could still see Yukon, the slash in his throat, the knife buried to the hilt in his chest. You shrugged me off, and you gave me orders, a kind of verbal strong-arming. I didn't like it. Again, he said nothing, but picked up the towel to dry his hair. You're not going to apologize. No. She sat up to draw on the borrowed shirt. I knew that dog since he was a puppy. Because her voice wanted to break, she pressed her lips together, controlled it. I had a right to be upset. I'm not saying you didn't. He walked to the window. The snow was barely a mist now. Maybe the forecaster was right. And I had a right to be worried about my own dogs, Nate. A right to go see to them myself. Part ways there. He stepped away from the window, but left the curtains open. Natural enough to worry, but there was nothing to worry about. They weren't hurt, but they might have been. No. Whoever did this went for a solo dog, an old dog. Yours are young and strong and have two sets of healthy teeth. They're practically joined at the hip. I don't see... Think for two seconds instead of just reacting. Impatience snapped in his voice as he tossed the towel aside. Say somebody wanted to hurt them. Say somebody, even somebody they knew, and let get close. Tried to hurt one of them. Even managed to do it. The other would be on him like God's own fury and tear him to pieces. And anybody who knows them enough to get close knows that. She drew her knees up to her chest, pressed her face against them and began to cry. Without looking up, she waved a hand to hold him off when she heard him move toward her. Don't. Don't. Give me a minute. I can't get the picture out of my head. It was easier when I was mad at you or turning that mad into sex. I hated sitting there waiting, not knowing. And I was scared for you under it. I was scared something was going to happen to you. And that pissed me off. She lifted her head. Through the blur of tears, she could see his face. And then he'd shut down again. I've got something else to say. Go ahead. I... I have to figure out how to say this so it doesn't sound lame. She dragged the heels of her hands up over her cheeks to dry them. Even being mad and being scared and wanting to plant my boot up your ass for making me both, I admire what you do. How you do it. Who you are when you do. I admire the strength it takes to do it. He sat. Not beside her, not on the bed, but on the chair so there was distance between them. Nobody I ever cared about. Nobody outside of on the job ever said anything like that to me. Then I'd say you cared about the wrong people. She got up, walked to the bathroom to blow her nose. When she came out, she stood leaning on the door jamb, watching him from across the room. You went out and got my dogs for me. With all that was going on, you went out and brought them back for me. You could have sent somebody else or just blown it off. Roads flooded, they'll have to wait. But you didn't. I have friends who'd have done the same for me, and me for them but I can't think of any man I've been with, any man I've slept with, who would have done it. The ghost of a smile touched his mouth. Then I'd say you've slept with the wrong men. I guess I have. She went over and picked up the shirt he'd discarded when they'd come in. With some care, she unpinned the badge, then brought it to him. This looks good on you, by the way. Sexy. He gripped her hand before she could step back. Still holding it, he got to his feet. I've got an awful need for you. It's more than I've had for anyone else, and maybe more than you want. I guess we'll find out. You wouldn't have admired me a year ago, six months ago, and you need to know that there are still days it seems like too much trouble to even get out of bed. Why do you? He opened his other hand, looked down at the badge. I guess I've got an awful need for this, too. That's not heroic. Oh, you're so wrong. Her heart was lost. In that one moment, it simply slid out and dropped at his feet. Heroism's just doing more than you want to do or think you can. 
Sometimes it's just doing the crappy things, the unhappy things other people won't do. She stepped closer, cupped his face in her hands. It's not just jumping out of a plane onto a glacier 10,000 feet up because there's nobody else there to do it. It's getting out of bed in the morning when it seems like too much trouble. Emotion swirled in his eyes, and he lowered his cheek to the top of her head. I'm so in love with you, Meg. And he kissed her hair, straightened. I need to go out. I want to check the river patrol before I turn in. Can a civilian and her dogs do a ride-along on that? Yeah. He ruffled a hand over her damp hair. Dry your hair first. Will you tell me what you know about Yukon? I'll tell you what I can. Twenty-four. He went back to the scene of the crime in the early morning drizzle. Ten steps from the door, Nate thought, left in plain view of anyone who might have come in or gone out of town hall. Plain view of anyone driving by, walking by. More than left, he amended, executed in plain view. He walked inside through the meeting center. He ordered everything left as it was. The folding chairs, the big projection screen remained in place. He brought it back into his head the way it had been the night before. He'd come in a little late, just before the lights had gone down. He'd scanned the crowd as much out of habit as looking for Meg. Rose and David had been in the last row, her first night out since the baby. They'd been holding hands. He remembered seeing them both at intermission, with Rose on the phone probably checking with her mother, who was home watching the kids. Bing had been near the back. Nate had ignored the flask he'd held between his knees. Deb and Harry, the professor, a small clump of high schoolers, the entire Riggs family who lived in a log cabin out past Rancor Woods. He'd estimated that half the population had been there, which meant half hadn't. Some had left at intermission. Any of those who'd stayed might have slipped out and in again. In the dark, while attention was focused on the screen. He walked back to the lobby when he heard the outer door open and watched Hop shove back her hood. Saw your car parked outside. I don't know what to think about this, Ignatius. I can't put two thoughts together about it. She lifted her hands, let them drop again. I'm going to go over and see Lara. Don't know what I'll say. This is such a crazy thing. Mean and crazy. I'll go with mean. But not crazy? Somebody carves up a harmless dog outside town hall and that's not crazy? Depends on why. Her mouth flattened at that. I can't see any why to it. A couple of people are saying we've got a cult, high school kids experimenting or some such thing. I don't believe that for one minute. It wasn't ritualistic. Others think it's some loony camped out near town. Maybe it's a comfort believing none of us could have done such an awful thing. But I don't know that it makes me feel any better to think we've got a crazy lurking around who'd kill a dog that way. She studied his face. You don't think that? No. I don't think that. Are you going to tell me what you do think? I think when somebody kills a local dog, in the middle of town, in front of a building where a good half of the town's sitting, he's got his reasons. Which are? I'm working on it. He drove along the river before heading to the station. It was a sulky gray today, with those plates and chunks of floating ice dull on its surface. Meg's plane was gone, a clear symbol that he couldn't box her up somewhere safe and close. Bing and a two-man crew were patching a section of road. Bing's only acknowledgement as Nate slowed to pass was a long, steady stare. He drove to the station to find Peach, urging coffee on Joe and Lara. Peter stood by, looking very much like a grown man struggling not to cry. Lara, her eyes swollen and beet red, sprang up the instant Nate stepped into the room. I want to know what you're doing about Yukon. What are you doing to find the bastard who killed my dog? Now, Laura. Don't now, Laura, me, she said, whirling on her husband. I want to know. Why don't you come back to my office? Peach, hold off anything that comes in except an emergency for the next few minutes. All right, Chief. Laura. She gripped Laura's hand in hers. I couldn't be more sorry. Laura managed a short bob of her head before she shot her chin into the air and sailed into Nate's office. I want some answers. Laura, I want you to sit down. I don't want... 
I want you to sit down. His tone was quiet, but the authority in it had her dropping into a chair. The town voted for this police department, voted to bring you in and to pay the tax that pays your salary. I want you to tell me what you're doing, why you're not out there right now looking for that son of a bitch. I'm doing everything I can do. Lara, he said in that same quiet tone before she could speak again. Don't think for a minute that I'm taking this lightly, that any of us are. I'm pursuing it, and I'll keep pursuing it until I can give you those answers. You've got the knife. The knife that... Her voice broke, and her chin bobbled, but she sucked in air, pushed back her shoulders. You ought to be able to find out who owned that knife. I can tell you that the knife was reported stolen yesterday morning, along with other items. I've talked to the owner, and I'm going to get statements from people who were in town hall last night. I can start with you. You think one of us killed Yukon? That's not what I think. Sit down, Lara, he said when she leaped to her feet. You were both at movie night. So let's go over what you saw, heard. She lowered, slowly this time. We left him outside. Tears swam into her eyes. He was getting so he couldn't hold his bladder, so he left them outside. It was only for a few hours, and he had his doghouse. If we'd left him in... You don't know if it would have made a difference. Whoever did this could have broken in, taken him out. From what I've heard, you gave that dog nearly fourteen good years. You've got nothing to blame yourself for. What time did you leave the house? Lara lowered her head, stared at her hands as her tears plopped onto them. Right after six, Joe said and began to rub his wife's shoulder. You go straight to town hall? Yeah. We got there about 6.30, I guess. Early, but we like to sit close to the front. We dumped our jackets on the chairs, three, four rows back on, on the left side. Then we socialized a while. They took them through it. Who they'd talked with, who sat near them. Anyone ever complained to you about the dog? No. Joe sighed. <sighs> well, maybe a few times when he was a puppy. He used to bark if a leaf stirred. And he got out once and chewed up Tim Tripp's boots from off his back stoop. But that was years ago, and Tim got kind of a kick out of it because the damn boots were almost bigger than Yukon. He settled down after he got out of the puppy stage. He settled down. How about the two of you? Have you had a problem with anyone lately? An argument? I got into it some with Skinny Jim over the Iditarod. It got pretty heated, but that sort of thing happens. People get worked up over the Iditarod, and they've got their favorites. I had to call Ginny Mann into the school because her boy hooked twice. Lara fumbled out a tissue. She wasn't happy about it, or with me. How old's her boy? Eight. She blinked rapidly. Oh, God. Joshua couldn't have done that to you, Nate. He's a good boy. Just doesn't much like school, but he wouldn't have killed my dog because he was mad at me. And Ginny and Don, they're good people. They could... Okay. If you think of anything else, you let me know. I want... I want to apologize for the way I jumped on you before. Don't worry about that, Lara. No, it wasn't right. It wasn't right and it wasn't... You saved my son's life. I wouldn't go that far. You helped save it, and that's the same thing to me. I shouldn't have come in here the way I did. Joe tried to calm me down, but I wouldn't be calmed. I love that damn dog. After they'd left... Nate uncovered his caseboard. As he pinned up the pictures he'd taken the night before, Peter came in. Okay, Chief? Yeah. Feel like I should have been able to handle Mrs. Wise. I got twisted up. I, well, Stephen and I hung out together a lot, and I grew up with that dog. My dad, he has the sled dogs, and they're great, but not the same as a pet. Even when Stephen went to college, I'd go over and see Yukon sometimes. I guess that's why I had some trouble with everything last night, too. You could have told me. I just... I was just twisted up. Um, Chief, is that going to be just an open case board now? I mean, should we put copies of notes and other case-related items on the board? No. But you've got Yukon up there now. That's right. You think what happened to Yukon's related to the others? 
I, I feel stupid, but I don't understand. Thinking they're related might be stupid. Peter stepped closer. Why do you? At this point, I've got no clear motive for anyone killing that dog. Nate walked around to his desk, unlocked a drawer, and took out the sealed knife and gloves. These belong to Bing. He reported them stolen yesterday morning. Bing? Peter's eyes widened. Bing? He's got a temper on him. He's got a sheet, and most of it deals with assaults. Violent behavior. Yeah, but... God! We've got a few ways to look at this. Bing gets in an argument with Joe somewhere along the line, or Joe and Lara do something that aggravates him. He stews about it, decides to teach them a lesson. So he decides to kill the dog, reports the knife and gloves is stolen. Then he goes off after intermission last night, knowing the wises are inside. He gets the dog, brings him back, kills him, leaves the knife and gloves figuring he's covered because he'd reported them stolen. Then he goes home and works in his garage. If he was mad at Mr. or Mrs. Wise, why didn't he just punch Mr. Wise in the face? Good question. Another way we can look at it is somebody wanted to cause Bing some trouble. He pisses a lot of people off, so that's no stretch. He eased a hip onto his desk, his eyes on the board. They steal his knife and gloves. They use them to kill the dog, leave them where they'll be found. Or, he moved to the counter, started a pot of coffee. We ask ourselves how Galloway's murder, Max's death, and the killing of a dog might be connected. That's just it. I don't see. The killer left us one big clue. Cryptic or obvious, depending on which angle you look from. The dog's throat was slit. That's what killed him. But the killer doesn't toss the knife aside. He takes another minute. Had to roll the dog over to do it, to bury the knife in its chest. Why? Because he's sick and he's mean and... Put that aside and look at the board, Peter. Look at Galloway. Look at the dog. He struggled with it. Nate could see. With looking close at the grisly pictures. Then he let out a little breath, as if he'd been holding it. Chest wound. They both have a blade of some kind in the chest. Could be coincidence, or maybe somebody's trying to tell us something. Now take another step. Where's the connection between Galloway, Max, and the Wises? Well, I don't know. Stephen and his parents moved here when I was about twelve, I guess. That was after Galloway was gone. But they knew Mr. Hallbaker. Mr. Wise ran an ad in the Lunatic most weeks for his computer servicing. And Mrs. Wise and Mrs. Hallbaker took some classes together. The exercise class at school and the quilting class Peach has going. Something else connects them. To our knowledge, they didn't know Patrick Galloway. But for 16 years, everyone believes Galloway just took off. Now they don't. Why? Well, because they found him when... Stephen. Stephen's the one who found him. Get away with murder for 16 years and some dumbass college boy and his idiot friend screw it up for you. Nate listened to the coffee plop into the glass pot. A pisser, all right. If they hadn't been up there, that time, that place, odds are things would be fine. Another avalanche. Nature's, or one the state set off to clear the mountain. That cave could have been buried again. For years, maybe forever if your luck held. He eased a hip down on his desk while the coffee brewed. Now... You've got to go and kill again. Kill Max, or induce him to kill himself. He'll get away with that, too. You believe that. You have to believe that. But there are cops in lunacy now. Not just state, but town cops right underfoot. What do you do about that? I... I can't keep up. You distract them. Vandalism, petty thievery. Little things that keep them occupied just in case they're thinking about more important things. You pay that dumbass college boy back and you give the cops something else to worry about at the same time. Two birds. But you can't resist being a little fancy, giving them an elbow in the ribs, so you mimic your first murder by shoving the knife in the dog's chest. He got up, poured coffee for both of them. Now, it could be you're so fucking arrogant and full of yourself that you use your own knife, your own gloves. Strong possibility when you profile Bing Karlovsky. Or you're so clever, so full of yourself, you plant them so the finger points elsewhere. If that's the case, why bang? Where's he connect? I swear I don't know. I'm trying to get all this into my head. Maybe it doesn't have to connect. Bing's ornery. He irritates people. 
or there was just an easy chance to steal the knife. None of its chance, not this time. We need to find out where Bing was, exactly where he was in February of 1988. How? Nate sipped his coffee. For a start, I'm going to ask him. Meanwhile, I want statements from everyone who was at the movie night, and everyone who wasn't. That's going to take time. You tell Peach to make a list that divides the township and outlying into three parts. We'll each take one. I'll tell her right now. Peter? Nate stopped him at the door. Weren't you scheduled to work last night? To cover the desk? Yeah, but Otto said he didn't feel like going to the movies, so we switched. That's okay, isn't it? Sure. Nate sipped his coffee again. That's fine. Go ahead and get Peach started on that list. Nate crossed to the board and drew lines connecting Joe and Lara Wise with Max and with Bing. Nate? Peach peeked in. You still want me to hold things out here? No, what you got? Had a report of gunfire and a bear sighting. Same people who reported the dead body that was a pair of boots. I gave both of them to Otto since he was already out on patrol. Gunfire was Dex Trilby's truck, which is older than I am, backfiring. And the bear was what? A squirrel standing on a log? No, the bear was a bear. Those idiot outsiders put up a bunch of bird feeders around the cabin, draw the birds in. Well, a bear can't resist fresh bird feed. Otto ran it off and made them take down the feeders. He's a little irritable after having to go out there twice already today. So if something else comes in, I thought I'd hand it off to you or Peter. You do that. Well then. Carrie Hallbaker just came in and wants to see you. She wants me to give her the items for the police log. Good. Go ahead. I guess we'll have the lunatic up and running again. Looks that way. She says she wants the official statement on what happened last night for the paper. Do you want me to take care of it? No. He flipped the blanket over his board. Send her on back. She looked better than the last time he'd seen her. Steadier and not quite so sunken around the eyes. Thanks for seeing me. How are you doing? He asked and closed the door. Getting through, getting by. It helps to have the kids. They need me and the paper. She took the chair he offered and set the canvas briefcase she carried on her lap. I'm not just here about the items for the police log, though. God, it's an awful thing about you, Con. It is. Well, I know you wanted me to think about back when Pat disappeared to write down details. I did some. She opened the bag to take sheets of paper. I thought I'd remember it all. I thought everything would just come flooding back, but it didn't. Nate saw the papers were neatly typed and written in a formal outline style. It looks like you remembered plenty. I put down everything, a lot of things that couldn't matter. It was long ago, and I have to admit now that I didn't pay much attention to Pat's leaving. I was teaching and wondering how I was going to get through another winter, my second here. I was thirty-one, and I'd missed my goal of being married by my thirtieth birthday. She smiled a little. That was one of the reasons I'd come to Alaska in the first place. The ratio was in my favor. I remember feeling a little desperate, a little sorry for myself, and annoyed with Max because he hadn't asked me. That's why I remember. You'll see it written there that he was gone a couple of weeks that winter. I think it was that February. I'm not absolutely sure. Days tend to freeze together in the winter. Especially if you're alone. Where did he tell you he was going? That I do remember, because I got snippy about it. He said he was going to Anchorage, down to Homer, a few weeks in the southeast, interviewing bush pilots and getting some of them to fly him around for the paper and research for the novel he was writing. Did he do a lot of traveling back then? He did. I put that down too. He said he'd be gone maybe four or five weeks, and that didn't sit well with me, especially with things still up in the air between us. I remember, because he was back sooner than he said, but he didn't even come to see me. People told me he'd hold up at the paper. Was practically living there. I was too mad to go see him either. How long before you did see him? It was a while. I was pretty mad, but finally I got mad enough to see him. I know it was the end of March or the very start of April. We had the classroom decorated for Easter. Easter hit the first Sunday in April that year. I looked it up. I remember sitting there with all those colored eggs and bunny drawings while I was stewing about Max. She ran her hand over her stack of papers. This part I remember perfectly. He was at the paper, locked in. I had to bang on the door. 
He looked terrible, thin and unshaven, his hair all which way. He smelled. There were papers all over his desk. She sighed a little. I can't remember what the weather was like, Nate, what it looked like in town, but I can remember exactly how he looked. I can remember exactly how it looked in his office. Coffee cups, dishes all over the place, trash cans overflowing, trash on the floor, ashtrays full of butts. He used to smoke. I, I wrote it down, she said and smoothed the papers again. He was working on his novel. That's what I assumed, and looked like a madman. Damn if I know why I found that so appealing. But I gave him what for, told him I was done. If he thought he could treat me that way, he could just think again, and so on. I just raved and ranted, and he didn't say a thing. When I'd run out of steam, he got down on one knee. She stopped a moment, pressed her lips together. Right there, in all that mess, he said he wanted a second chance. He needed one, and asked me to marry him. We were married that June. I wanted to be a June bride, and since I'd already missed the 30th birthday deadline... A couple more months didn't matter. Did he ever talk about the time he was away? No. And I didn't ask. It didn't seem important. All he said was that he'd learned what it was like to be alone. Really alone. And he didn't want to be alone again. Nate thought about the lines connecting the names on his list. Did he ever have a particular run-in? Or a particular friendship with Bing? Bing? No. Not a buddy sort of thing. Max tried to stay on his good side, especially since he knew Bing had asked me out. Bing? Asked me out is probably a euphemism. He wasn't interested in dining and dancing, if you follow me. And did you ever... No! <laughs> she laughed, cutting herself off in midstream and looking shocked at herself. Ah, I haven't laughed. Not really since... It's terrible to laugh at this. The thought of you and Bing strikes me funny. How do you take being turned down? Oh, I don't think it was a big deal. She brushed it off with the back of her hand. I was handy, that's all. New female in the very small pack. Men like Bing would try to cut the new one out of the herd, see if he could get some sex and maybe a couple of home-cooked meals out of it. Nothing against him, it's natural enough in a place like this. He wasn't the only one who made moves. I went out with a few that first winter. Even the professor and I had dinner a couple of times. Though it was plain as plain, he had a major crush on Charlene. That would be before Galloway left? Before, during, after? He's always had a thing for her. But we had dinner a couple of times, and he was a perfect gentleman. Maybe a little more gentlemanly than I was looking for, to tell the truth. But I wasn't looking for someone like Bing. Because? He's so big and crude and rough. I went out with John because I liked his looks and his intellect, and with Ed once because, well, why not? Even Otto after his divorce. A woman, even one who's not very pretty and past 30, has a lot of choices in a place like this if she's not too picky. I chose Max. She smiled into middle distance. I still would, and brought herself back. I wish I could tell you more. Looking back, I guess I can see that Max was troubled. But he always seemed troubled when he worked on one of his books. He put them away for months and months at a time, and everything was normal. But as soon as he'd pull one out and start, he'd close in. I was happier when he forgot the books. Anyone ever make a move on you after you were married? No. I recall Bing telling me right in front of Max that I was selling myself short or cheap or something like that. And? Nothing. Max made a joke out of it, bought Bing a drink. He wasn't one for confrontations, Nate. Went miles out of the way to avoid one, which is one of the reasons, I guess, he didn't make it on a big city paper. You saw what he did when you brushed him off after you first got here? He went to hop. That was his way. He wouldn't have come here for a showdown with you on his own because he just didn't have the tools for any sort of battle. He never did. Was Max a movie fan? Just about everyone in Lunacy is. One dependable form of community entertainment. He really loved doing reviews on what we had coming up. Speaking of movie night, I really do want a statement about what happened last night. Peach can give you the report for the log. I'll see her about that. But I think something like this 
will want to run more than an item. Otto found him. She began as she started to dig out a notebook. Yes, give us a couple of days on this carry. By then I should have something more cohesive to give you. Do you mean you expect to make an arrest shortly? Nate smiled. You've got your reporter hat right back on. What I mean is I'll have my notes, statements, the incident report coordinated. She rose. I'm glad my kids weren't there last night. I almost insisted they go just so they'd get out and do something normal. But they had a couple of friends over for pizza instead. I'll check back with you tomorrow. I was just wondering, he said as he walked her to the door. Was Max a fan of Star Wars? She stared at him. Where did that come from? Just a dot I'm trying to connect. He wasn't. Not just that he wasn't a particular fan, which was baffling to me because he'd loved that sort of thing. Big epic stories with lots of special effects. But he wouldn't watch those. We had a Star Wars marathon on movie night about six, seven years ago. Well, whenever the 20th anniversary of the original was. He wouldn't go. And the kids were mad to go. I had to take them myself and write the reviews for the paper now that I think about it. When the new ones came out, I ended up taking the kids all the way to Anchorage to see them for the first run. He stayed home. What hat did you pull that one out of? Cop hat. He gave her a little nudge to urge her out. It's not important. You see, Peach, about the log item. Nate timed it so that he walked over to the lodge when Bing and his crew broke for lunch. He stepped inside as Rose served Bing a beer. His eyes met Bing's over it. He strolled over, nodded casually to the two men on the opposite side of the booth. You boys mind finding another table so Bing and I can have a private conversation? They didn't like it, but they picked up their coffee mugs and moved to the next empty booth. I got lunch coming, Bing began, and I got a right to eat it without you sitting here spoiling my appetite. So you got that pothole filled in? Thanks, Rose, he said when she brought him his usual coffee. You ready for lunch, Chief? No, nothing right now. River's holding, he continued to Bing. Maybe we won't need those sandbags. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. February 1988. Where were you? How the living fuck do I know? Los Angeles Dodgers won the series. 49ers took the Super Bowl. Cher won an Oscar. Lower 48 crap. And Susan Butcher won her third Iditarod. Hell of a feat for a girl from Boston. Finished in 11 days in just under 12 hours. Maybe that refreshes your memory? It refreshes that I lost 200 bucks on that race. Damn woman. So, what were you doing a few weeks before you lost the two bills? A man remembers losing 200 because of a woman. You don't necessarily remember every time he scratches his ass or takes a piss. You take any trips? I was coming and going as I damn well pleased then, same as now. Maybe you went down to Anchorage, saw Galloway there. I've been down to Anchorage more times than you can spit. A couple hundred miles doesn't mean anything up here. I might have seen him there a time or two, seen plenty of people I know there. I do my business, and they do theirs. You play hard-ass on this, you'll be the one who pays for it. The heat burned into his eyes. You don't want to go threatening me. You don't want to go stonewalling me. Nate leaned back with his coffee. You figured you should be the one wearing this badge. Better than some chichaco, one that got his own partner killed. One that would have washed out if that thin blue line hadn't held him up. It seared straight into his gut, but he drank the coffee, held Bing's eyes. Been doing your homework, I see. But the fact is, I'm wearing the badge. I've got enough right now to take you in, charge you, and lock you up for what was done to that dog. I never touched that dog. If I were you, I'd put a little more effort into remembering where I was when Patrick Galloway left town. Why do you want to beat this dead horse, Burke? Make you feel important? Max killed Galloway and everybody knows it then it shouldn't bother you to verify your own whereabouts. Rose came over with a slab of meatloaf, a mountain of mashed potatoes, and a small sea of gravy. Anything else I can get for you, Bing? She set a bowl of snow peas and tiny onions beside the plate. 
Nate saw him struggle, watched him draw himself back. His voice was even a shade on the gentle side when he answered. No thanks, Rose. You enjoy that. Chief, just let me know if you want anything. I'm through talking to you, Bing said and forked up a huge bite of meatloaf. How about some lunchtime small talk, then? What do you think of Star Wars? Huh? You know, the movies. Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader. Fucking idiot. Bing mumbled under his breath and scooped up gravy-drenched potatoes. Star Wars, for Christ's sake. Let me eat in peace. Great story. Memorable characters. Under all that jazz, it's about destiny. And betrayal. It's about making a killing of the box office and merchandising. Bing waved his fork before he dug in again. Bunch of guys flying around in spaceships, whapping each other with light swords. Sabers. Light sabers. The thing is, it took some time, some sacrifice, some loss, but... He slid out of the booth. The good guys won. See you around. Twenty-five. There were eleven seniors in the last period English lit class. Nine of them were awake. John let the two snoozers catch their late afternoon catnap while one of the more alert mangled the bard's words in a reading of Lady Macbeth's out damn spot scene. He had enough on his mind, and supervising the discussion on Macbeth was only a small part of it. He'd been leading discussions like this for twenty-five years, since the first time he stepped nervously in front of a classroom of students. He'd only been a few years older than those he'd taught back then, and perhaps more innocent and eager than the majority of his students. He'd wanted to write great and awesome novels, filled with allegories on the human condition. He hadn't wanted to starve in a garret, so he'd taught. He'd written, though the novels were never as great or awesome as he'd hoped, he'd published a few. Without teaching, he might not have starved in that garret, but he wouldn't have eaten well. He'd felt the demands, and God help him the joys, of teaching overwhelming for the intellectual young man who wanted to write great novels. So he'd taken the leap, the brave and foolish leap, and had run to Alaska. There he would experience, he'd live simply, he'd study the human condition in that primitive place, that wide-open isolation it represented to him. He'd write novels about man's courage and tenacity, his follies and his triumphs. Then he'd come to lunacy. How could he have known, a young man not yet thirty, the true meaning of obsession? How could he have understood, that bright, idealistic, and pathetic young man, that one place, one woman, could chain him, could keep him willingly shackled no matter how they defied and denied his needs? He had fallen in love, become obsessed with. He was no longer sure there was a difference the moment he'd seen Charlene. Her beauty was like a golden willow, her voice a siren song her reckless and joyful sexuality. Everything about her enchanted and engulfed him. She was another man's woman, the mother of another man's child. But it made no difference. His love, if that's what it was, hadn't been the pure and romantic love of a valorous knight for a lady, but the lustful, sweaty need of a man for a woman. Hadn't he convinced himself she would cast Galloway off? He was careless with her, selfish, even if he hadn't been blinded by love, John would have seen that, resented that. So he'd stayed and waited, changed the course of his life and waited. After everything he'd done, all his plans, his hopes, he was still waiting. His students got younger and younger, and the years died behind him. He could never get back what he'd cast away, what he'd wasted. And still, the single thing he wanted would not be his. He glanced at the clock, saw another day had gone to dust, then, catching a movement out of the corner of his eye, saw Nate leaning against the jamb of the open door of his classroom. Your papers on Macbeth are due next Friday, he announced to a chorus of groans. Kevin, I'll know if Marianne writes it for you. Those of you who are on the yearbook committee, remember there's a meeting tomorrow at 3.30. Make sure you've arranged transportation home, if necessary. Dismissed. There was the general clatter, shuffle, chatter he was so used to he no longer noticed. What is it about high schools, Nate began, that can make a grown man's palms sweat? Just because we survived the hell of it once doesn't mean we can't be thrown back into the pit. Guess that's it.
You'd have done well enough, I'd wager, John said, as he packed some papers into his battered briefcase. You've got the looks, the attitude. Decent enough student, I'd say. Did well with the girls. Athletic? What did you let her in? Track. Nate's lips curved. Always could run. You? Your classic nerd. The one that screwed the curve for the rest of the class. That was you? I hated you. With his thumbs hooked in his pockets, Nate strolled in, looked at the notes in the blackboard. Macbeth, huh? I got Shakespeare okay if somebody else read it. Out loud, I mean, so I could hear the words. This guy killed for a woman, right? No, for ambition at the urging of a woman, with the seeds for it all planted by three more. He didn't get away with it. He paid, with his honor, with the loss of the woman he loved to madness, with his life. What goes around? John nodded and lifted an eyebrow. Did you drop by to discuss Shakespeare, Nate? Nope. We're investigating the incident last night. I need to ask you some questions. About Yukon, I was in town hall when it happened. What time did you get there? A few minutes before seven. He glanced over absently as some of the liberated students raced laughing down the hall. Actually, I'm doing an extracurricular group on Hitchcockian storytelling for the 10th through 12th graders. Get some of the kids involved, earns them extra credit. A dozen of my students signed up for it. Did you go out between seven and ten? I went out at intermission, had a smoke, got some of the punch the elementary school committee was selling, which was more palatable when I doctored it. Where were you sitting? Toward the back, opposite side from my students. I didn't want to inhibit them or be barraged with questions. I was taking notes on the movies. In the dark? Yes, that's right. Just a few key points I wanted to make sure to bring forward in discussion. I'd like to help you on this, but I don't see how I can. He walked over to lower the blinds on the room's single window. After Otto came in, after we knew what had happened, I went back to the lodge. I was upset. We all were. Charlene, Skinny Jim, and Big Mike were running the place. Who was there? Ah, uh, Mitch Dauber and Cliff Treat, Drunk Mike, a couple of hikers. As he spoke, he policed the room, gathering up dropped pencils, crumpled balls of paper, a hair clip. I got a drink. Meg and Otto came in shortly, and after things settled down a little, we played some poker. We were still playing when you got there. Nate nodded and put away the notebook he'd pulled out. John tossed the paper in the trash, put the other items in a shoebox on his desk. I don't know anybody who'd do that to a dog, especially Yukon. Nobody else seems to either. Nate glanced around the classroom. It smelled like chalk, he thought and that teenage perfume of gum, lip gloss, and hair gel. Do you ever take time off during the school year, give yourself a break, and just head out? I've been known to. Mental health breaks, I'd call them. Why? I'm wondering if you took a mental health break back in February of 1988. Behind his lenses, John's eyes went cool. It would be hard to say. Try. Should I be talking to a lawyer, Chief Burke? That would be up to you. I'm just trying to get a picture of where everyone was, what everyone was up to when Patrick Galloway was killed. Shouldn't the state police be the ones trying to get that picture? And if I'm not mistaken, haven't they drawn their conclusions? I like my own drawings. You wouldn't say it was a secret that you've been, let's say, partial to Charlene for a long time? No. After taking off his glasses, John began to polish them, slowly, thoroughly, with a handkerchief from his jacket pocket. I wouldn't say it's a secret. And were partial to her when she was with Galloway. I had feelings, strong feelings for her, yes. They hardly did me any good as she married someone else less than a year after Galloway left. Was murdered, Nate corrected. Yes, he replaced his glasses. Was murdered. Did you ask her? She said no. She said no every time I've asked her. But she slept with you. You're treading on very personal ground now. She slept with you, Nate continued, but she married someone else. Slept with you while she was married to someone else. And not just you. 
That's private. As much as anything can be in a place like this. I'm not going to discuss it with you. Love's a kind of ambition, isn't it? Nate tapped a finger on the copy of Macbeth, still sitting on John's desk. Men kill for it. Men kill. Half the time they don't need any excuse. Can't argue with that. Sometimes they get away with it. More often they don't. I'd appreciate it if you'd think back, and when you remember where you were that February, you let me know. He started for the door, turned back. Oh, I wondered, did you ever read any of the books Max Hawbaker started? No, though his voice was calm, a dull anger still rode in his eyes. He was secretive about them. A lot of aspiring writers are. I had the impression he talked about writing a book more than he actually wrote. Turns out he started a few. I've got the copies. They all sort of circle around to the same thing. A theme, I guess you'd call it. That's not atypical for a fledgling writer, either. Even an experienced one will explore a theme from several angles. His seems to be about men surviving nature. And each other. Or not surviving. Always ends up being three men, no matter how many it starts out with. Comes down to three. The one he did the most on is about three men climbing a mountain in the winter. It jingled loose change in his pocket when John remained silent. He only had a few chapters complete, but he had notes on the rest, like an outline or scattered scenes he was going to plug in. Three men go up the mountain, only two come back. Nate paused a moment. A lot of novels are autobiographical, aren't they? Some, John said evenly. It's often a device used for a first novel. Interesting, isn't it? It'd be even more interesting to find out who that third man was. Well, I'll be around. You let me know if you recall where you were that February. John stood where he was until Nate's footsteps stopped echoing down the hall. Then he sat, slowly, at his desk, and saw his hands were shaking. Nate walked in on an informal meeting at Town Hall. He did so deliberately and wasn't surprised when conversation snapped off when he came in the door. Sorry to interrupt. He scanned the faces of the town council, faces he'd come to know. More than one of them registered embarrassment. I can wait until you're finished if you want. I think we're about wrapped up here, Hop said. I disagree. Ed planted his Vosk sundowners on the floor folded his arms over his chest. I don't think we've resolved anything, and I think this meeting should continue, and, I'm sorry, Chief, remain closed until things are resolved. Ed, Deb leaned forward. We've hashed this around six dozen ways. Let's give it a rest. I move we continue. Oh, move it up your ass, Ed. Joe Wise got to his feet. Joe! Hop jabbed a finger at him. We're informal here, but that doesn't mean we're going to start a rumble. Since Ignatius is here and his name's come up in this meeting, let's get his input. I agree. Ken rose, dragged another chair into the circle they'd formed. Have a seat, Nate. Listen, he said before anyone could object. This is our chief of police. He should be a part of this. The fact is, Ignatius, we're discussing recent events, and your handling of them. Okay. I take it some aren't satisfied with my handling of them? Well, the fact is... Harry scratched his head. There have been some rumblings around town that we've had more trouble here since we hired you than before. Seems like we have. Not that I see how that's your fault, but it seems like we have. It might have been a mistake, Ed firmed his jaw. I'll say that right to your face. It might have been a mistake to hire you, anyone, for that matter, from outside. The reasons for going outside were valid, Walter Noddy reminded him. Chief Burke has done, he's doing, the job he was hired to do. That may be, Walter, that may be. But, Ed held up his hands, it could be some of the less lawful elements of this town look at that as a kind of dare. So they're more active, you could say. People around here don't like being told what to do. We voted to have a police force, 
Hop reminded him. I know that, Hop, and I was one who voted I. Right here in this room. I'm not saying Nate's to blame for the way it's worked out. I'm saying it was a mistake. Our mistake. I'm stitching up the Mackies less often since Nate got here, Ken put in. I had less patients coming in than usual for treatment after fights, less domestic violence. Last year, Drunk Mike was brought in twice with frostbite after somebody found him passed out on the side of the road. This year, he's still going on benders, but he's sleeping them off safe in a cell. I don't think we can blame having a police force for you getting your equipment stolen, Ed, or your shack graffitied, Deb spread her hands. We can't blame having Law for Holly getting his tires slashed or for windows being broke at the school or any of that stuff. I say we blame it on parents not sitting hard enough on their kids. A kid didn't kill my dog. Joe looked apologetically at Nate. I agree with what Deb said, and with what Walter and Ken said before that, but a kid didn't do that to Yukon. No, Nate said. It wasn't a kid. I don't think hiring you was a mistake, Nate, Deb continued, but I think we've all got a responsibility to this town. And we ought to know how you're handling it. What you're doing to find out who's doing these things and who did that to you, Khan. That's fair. Some of the incidents mentioned may very well have been kids. The broken windows at the school certainly were. And since one of them was careless enough to drop his pen knife, they've been identified. I talked to them and their parents yesterday. Restitution will be made and both of them will get a three-day suspension, during which time I doubt they're going to have a real good time. You didn't charge them? Ed demanded. They were nine and ten, Ed. I didn't think locking them in a cell was the answer. A lot of us, he said, remembering the sealed juvenile file on Ed's record, do stupid things, get in trouble with the law when we're kids. If they did that, maybe they did the other things, Deb suggested. They didn't. They got set down in school by their teacher, broke a couple of windows. They sure as hell didn't hike all the way out to Ed's ice shack or sneak out of the house at night and walk the two miles to Holly's to slash his tires and spray paint all over his truck. You want my input? Your trouble didn't start since you hired me. Your trouble started 16 years ago when somebody killed Patrick Galloway. That's something that's shaken everybody up, Harry said, nodding to the others around the room. Even those of us who didn't know him. But I don't see what it has to do with what we're discussing here. I think it does. So that's how I'm handling it. I don't follow you, Deb said. Whoever killed Galloway is still here. Whoever killed Galloway, Nate continued as everyone began talking at once, killed Max Hawbaker. Max killed himself, Ed interrupted. He killed himself because he killed Pat. Somebody wants you to believe that. I don't. That's just crazy talk, Nate. Harry pushed back air with both hands. Just crazy talk. Crazier than Max killing Pat? Deb rubbed her fingers over her throat. Crazier than Max killing himself? I don't know. Quiet. Hop held up both hands and shouted over the noise. Just quiet down a damn minute. Ignatius? She drew a breath. <sighs> You're saying that someone we know has killed twice? Three times. His gaze was flinty as it scanned the room. Two men and an old dog. My department is investigating and will continue to investigate until this individual is identified and arrested. The state police, Joe began. Whatever the findings and the opinion of the state authorities, my department will investigate. I swore to protect and serve this town, and I will. Part of that investigation will require each one of you to account for your whereabouts and activities last night between 9 and 10 p.m. Us! Ed bellowed it. You're going to question us? That's right. In addition, I'm going to be looking for the whereabouts and activities of everyone during the month of February 1988. You! You! Ed blustered to a halt, then gripping the edge of his chair, pushed himself forward. You intend to question us as suspects? This is over the top. This is beyond belief. I'm not going to be subjected to this or have my family and my neighbors subjected to this. You're exceeding your authority. I don't think so. But you guys can vote to cancel my contract, pay me off. I'll still investigate. I'll still find the person responsible. That's what I do. He rose. 
I find the people responsible. So you can have your meetings, your votes, your discussions. You can take my badge. I'll still find the one responsible. That's the only person who has to worry about me. He strode out, leaving the raised voices and insulted faces behind. Hop caught up with them on the sidewalk. Ignatius, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. She snapped when he kept walking. Damn it! He stopped, jiggling the keys in his pocket. She scowled up at him as she finished pulling on her coat. You sure know how to liven up a town council meeting. Am I fired? Not yet, but I sure don't think you want any popularity votes in there. She tugged the hip-length coat, the color of a Concord grape closed. You might have been a little more tactful about it. Murder's one of those things that short-circuits all my tact switches. Then there's the matter of walking in on a meeting where my professional status is being questioned. All right, all right. Maybe that was poorly done. If you or anyone else has a problem with how I'm doing the job, you should have come to me with it. You're right. She pinched the bridge of her nose. We're all upset. We're all on edge. And now you've dumped this in our laps. Nobody liked thinking Max had done what it seemed clear he'd done. But it was a hell of a lot easier to think that than what you're suggesting. I'm not suggesting it. I'm saying it, flat out. I'm going to find out what I need to know, however long it takes, and whoever I have to step on along the way. She pulled her cigarettes and lighter out of her coat pocket. I can see that plain enough. Where were you sixteen years ago, Hop? Me? Her eyes popped wide. For Christ's sake, Ignatius, you don't honestly think I climbed up no name with Pat and stuck an ice axe in him? He was twice my size. But not your husband's. You're a tough-minded woman, Hop. You've done a lot around here to preserve your husband's vision. You might do a lot to protect his name. That's a filthy thing to say to me. A filthy thing to say about a man you didn't even know. I didn't know Galloway either. You did. Fury covered her face as she took a step back. She turned away, marched back into town hall. The door slammed like a cannon shot behind her. He knew murmurs and mutters would be going around, so Nate decided to stay visible. He had his dinner at the lodge. From the glances tossed his way, he imagined the statements he'd made at the meeting were making their way around Lunacy's frosty grapevine. And that was fine. It was time to shake things up. Charlene brought his salmon special to the booth herself and slid in across from him. You've sure got people wondering and worried. Do I? I'm one of them. She picked up his coffee, sipped, then wrinkled her nose. Ugh, I don't know how anybody can drink this without sweetening it up some. He pushed the dispenser of sugar packets over. Help yourself if you want it. I will. She tore open two packets of sweet and low, poured it in, and stirred it up. She was wearing a shimmery gray shirt, the sort that clung to a woman's curves, and had scooped back her hair to show off dangling silver earrings. After tapping the spoon on the side of the mug... She sampled. That's better. Then she kept both hands around the mug as she leaned intimately toward Nate. When I first found out about Pat, I went a little crazy inside. I'd have been ready to believe you if you told me Skinny Jim had put that axe in him, and he didn't come along until five or six years after Pat had been gone. But I've calmed down some. That's good, Nate said and continued to eat. Maybe knowing I can bring him back here and bury him when the ground is ready helped. I like you, Nate, even though you wouldn't give me a tumble. I like you well enough to tell you you're not doing anybody any good with all this. Nate slathered butter on a roll. And what would all this consist of, Charlene? You know what I'm saying. This talk about us having a murderer running around. Something like that gets whispered about enough. People might start to believe it. It's bad for business. The tourists aren't going to come here if they think they could get murdered in their beds. Sissy, he called with his eyes still on Charlene's. Can I get another cup of coffee here? Is that what it comes down to, Charlene? It comes down to money? To your profit and loss statement? We've got to make a living here. We've got... She broke off as Sissy set another mug on the table, filled it with coffee. You need anything else, Nate? No, thanks. We do a lot of business here over the summer. 
We've got to if we don't want to live on the PFD all winter, and winter's long. I've got to be practical, Nate. Pat's gone. Max killed him. I'm not letting myself hold that against Carrie. I wanted to, but I'm not letting myself. She's lost her man too. But Max killed Pat. God knows why. But he did. She picked up her coffee again, sipped it while she gazed out the dark window. Pat took him up there. Some wild hair, I expect. Max looking for a story or article or some shit, and Pat figuring he could have an adventure and make a few dollars. The mountain can make you crazy. That's what happened. When he said nothing, she touched a hand to his. I've thought about it, like you asked me to, and I remember that Max didn't come in here for damn near a month that winter, maybe more. Back then, this was the only place for miles in any direction you could get a hot meal, and he was a regular. I used to wait on him almost every night, but he didn't come in. Absently, she reached over, broke a small chunk off Nate's dinner roll. He called in orders a few times, she said as she nibbled on bread. We didn't do deliveries, still don't. But Carl, he was soft-hearted. He ran the food over to the paper himself. He told me Max looked sick and a little crazy. I didn't pay any attention. I was brooding over Pat and busy trying to make ends meet. But you told me to think back, and I did, and I remember that. All right. You aren't paying attention to me. I heard everything you said. He met her eyes. Who else didn't come in much that February? She let out an impatient breath. <sighs> I don't know, Nate. I only thought about Max because he's dead, and because I was remembering all of a sudden that Carrie and I both got married that summer, the summer after Pat was gone. That's what made me think of it. Okay. Now think about people who are still alive. I think about you. She laughed, waved a hand. <laughs> oh, don't get all tight, asked. A woman's got a right to think about a good-looking man. Not when he's in love with her daughter. Love. She began to drum her fingers on the table. Well, you are just out for all sorts of trouble, aren't you? Taken on the town council, so everybody's looking at you sideways, getting Ed and Hop all pissed off. Now talking about loving Meg. She hasn't kept a man more than a month since she figured out what to do with one. I guess that means I hold the current record. She'll chomp a piece out of your heart, then spit it right in your face. My heart, my face. Why does it bother you, Charlene? I've got bigger needs than she does. Bigger, stronger needs. Her earrings spun and glinted when she tossed her head. Meg doesn't need anything or anyone. She never did. She made it clear a long time ago she didn't need me. She'll make it clear soon enough that she doesn't need you. That may be, or it may end up. I make her happy. Maybe that's what bothers you. The idea she might end up happy, and you can't quite get there. His hand snaked out, gripped her wrist before she could hurl the coffee in his face. Think again, he said quietly. A scene's going to embarrass you a lot more than me. She jumped violently out of the booth and stalked across the room, up the stairs. For the second time that day, Nate heard the bullet shot of a slam door, and in its echo. He finished his dinner. He drove out to Meg's, hoping his blood would cool and his brain clear by the time he got there. The gloom of the past few days had lifted, leaving brilliant stars in a black glass sky. A slice of moon rode over the trees, and a shimmery fog slithered low to the ground. Bare branches on the trees, Nate noticed. The snow was still thick on the ground, but the branches had shaken off the snow. A part of the road was still flooded, so he had to ease his way around the barricade and through the foot of standing water. He heard a wolf call, lonely and insistent. It might be hunting, he thought, for food, for a mate. When it killed, it killed for purpose, not for greed, not for sport. When it mated, he read, it mated for life. The sound died off as he drove through the night. He could see the smoke rise from Meg's chimney, hear the soar of her music. Lenny Kravitz this time, he thought, rocking on mists of doom and fields of pain. He parked behind her, then just sat. He wanted this, he realized. Wanted it maybe more than he should, to come home, to deal with the day and shake it off and come home to music and light, to a woman, the woman. Hearth and home, Meg had said, 
Well, she'd nailed him. So if he ended up with that chunk of his heart spat in his face, he had no one to blame but himself. She opened the door as he walked up, and the dogs rushed out to dance around him. Hi! Wondered if you'd find your way to my door tonight? She cocked her head. You look a little rough around the edges, Chief. What you been up to? Winning friends, influencing people. Well, come on inside, cutie, have a drink and tell me all about it. Don't mind if I do. Light. Is it so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun, to have lived light in the spring, to have loved, to have thought, to have done, to have advanced true friends, and beat down baffling foes? Matthew Arnold We burn daylight. William Shakespeare 26 Chief! Peach offered him a sticky bun and a cup of coffee almost before he got in the door. You know, you keep baking these things, I'm not going to be able to sit in my desk chair. It'd take more than a few sticky buns to poke up that cute little behind. Besides, it's a bribe. I need to ask if I can take an extra hour for lunch tomorrow. I'm on the May Day planning committee. We're going to meet tomorrow and try to finish coordinating the parade. Parade? May Day parade, Nate. It's on your calendar, not that far off. May, he thought. He played with the dogs a bit that morning in Meg's yard. In snow, up to the tops of his boots. That'd be May 1st. Come hell or high water, and we've had the parade in both. School band marches, the natives wear their traditional dress and play traditional instruments, all the sports teams are in it, and Dolly Manners' is dance classes. More people who live here participate in it than watch it, but we get tourists and outside folk come in from all over. She fussed with the vase of plastic daffodils on her counter. It's a good time. In the past couple of years, we've done some advertising. We did even more this year, drumming up media interest and whatnot. Charlene puts it on the Lodge's web page and does package deals. And hot pushed and got us included in the events page of a couple magazines. No kidding. Pretty hot stuff. Well, it is. It's a full day event. We have a bonfire and more music that night. Weather's too bad we move that to the Lodge. You have a bonfire in the Lodge. She punched his arm playfully. Just the music. Take whatever time you need. Big parade, Nate thought. Bookings at the lodge, meals served, customers in the corner store, browsing the local artists and craftsmen's work. More money, more business at the bank, the gas station, more business, period. That could be cut considerably by too much talk of murder. He glanced over when Otto came in. Isn't it your day off? Yeah. Nate could see something in his eye, but played it light. You come by for the sticky buns? No. Otto held out a manila envelope. I wrote up where I was, what I was doing and so forth in February of 88, on the night Max died and when Yukon got killed. Thought it'd be better all around if I put it down before you had to ask me. Why don't you come back to my office? Don't need to. I got no problem with this. He puffed out his cheeks. A little problem, maybe, but less doing it like this than having you ask. I don't have much of an alibi for any of the three situations, but I wrote it down. Nate set down the bun to take the envelope. I appreciate it, Otto. Well, I'm going fishing. He left, passing Peter on the way out. Hell, Nate muttered. You're in a tight spot. Peach gave him a little rub on the arm. You've got to do what you got to do, even if it means hurting feelings and getting danders up. You're not wrong. Um, Peter looked back and forth between them. Something wrong with Otto? I hope not. Peter started to follow up, but Peach gave a quick shake of her head. Well, the reason I'm late is my uncle came by this morning. He wanted to tell me there's a guy squatting north of town by Hopeless Creek. There's an old cabin there. It looks like he's moved in. Nobody'd care much except my uncle thinks he may have broken into his work shed. And my aunt says there's food missing from the cache. He grabbed the sticky bun, bit in. He, my uncle, went by to check it out this morning before he came to see me, and he says the guy came out with a shotgun and ordered him off his property. 
Since he had my cousin Mary with him, taking her into school, he didn't hang around to reason with the guy. All right, we'll go reason with him. Nate set his untouched coffee and Otto's envelope on the counter, then went to the weapon cabinet and got two shotguns and ammo. Just in case reason doesn't work, he told Peter. The sun was bright and hard. It seemed impossible that only a few weeks before he'd have made this trip in the dark. The river wound beside the road, cold blue, forming a keen edge of color against the snow that still lined its banks. The mountain stood clear as monuments carved in glass against the sky. He saw an eagle perched on a mile marker post, like a golden guard to the forest behind him. How long's this cabin been empty? Nobody's lived in it officially, as long as I can remember. It's run down and built too close to the creek, so it floods out every spring. Hikers might use it for a night now and then, and uh, kids might use it for, you know, chimney still standing, so it'll hold a fire. Smoke something awful, though. Meaning you've used it for, you know. Even as he smiled, color edged Peter's cheekbones. Maybe once or twice. What I heard was a couple of chichacos built it way back, going to live off the land, pan the creek for gold. Figured they'd get by on subsistence, and after a year start collecting their PFD. Didn't know squat. One of them froze to death, the other went crazy with cabin fever. Maybe ate some of the dead guy. Lovely. Probably just bullshit, but it adds to it when you're taking a girl there. Yeah, pretty romantic stuff. You want to turn off up there, Peter pointed. It's a little rough going. After about three yards bumping and grinding his way along the narrow snow-packed rut, Nate decided Peter was the master of understatement. The trees were thick and smote out the sun, so it was like driving through a tunnel paved by sadistic ice demons. He rolled his tongue back so it wouldn't get in the way of his teeth when they snapped together and muscled the wheel. He wouldn't have called it a clearing. The dilapidated square of logs hunched in a hacked-out square of trash willows and spindly evergreen on the icy bank of the spit of creek. It huddled there in the shadows, one window boarded, the other crisscrossed with duct tape. A sagging length of port sat over a few stacked cinder blocks. A filthy Lexus four-wheel drive with California tags stood in front. Call Peach. Have her run those tags, Peter. While Peter used the radio, Nate debated. There was smoke puffing sluggishly out of the tilted chimney, and a dead mammal of some sort hung nastily over a post by the door. Nate unsnapped his weapon but left it holstered as he eased out of the car. That's far enough! The cabin door swung open. In the dimness, Nate could see the man and the shotgun. I'm Chief Burke, Lunacy Police. I'm going to ask you to lower that weapon. I don't care who you say you are or what you say you want. I'm onto your tricks, you alien bastards. I'm not going back up there. Aliens, Nate thought. Perfect. The alien forces in this sector have been defeated. You're safe here now, but I need you to lower your weapon. So you say. But he eased out another foot. How do I know you're not one of them? Early thirties, Nate estimated. Five ten, a hundred and fifty. Brown hair, wild eyes, color undetermined. I have my ID, stamped and certified after testing. You lower that weapon so I can approach. I'll show it to you. ID. He looked confused now, and the shotgun lowered an inch. Underground Earth Forces certified. Nate tried a sober nod. Can't be too careful these days. They bleed blue, you know. I got two of them the last time they took me. Two. Nate lifted his eyebrows as if duly impressed and watched the gun lower another inch. You're gonna need to be debriefed. We'll get you back to control. Get your statement on record. We can't let them win. We won't. The gun barrel angled toward the ground, and Nate stepped forward. It happened too fast. It always happened too fast. He heard Peter open the car door, say his name. He was watching the man's face, his eyes, and he saw it come into them: panic, rage, terror, all at once. He was already cursing, already ordering Peter to get down, get down, as he cleared his weapon from the holster. The shotgun blast shook the air, sent some birds screaming in the trees. A second pumped out as Nate dived for cover under the car. 
He was set to roll out the other side when he saw the blood on the snow. Oh, God! Oh, Jesus Christ, Peter! His body went to lead, and for an endless moment he shook under the weight of it. He could smell the alley, the rain, overripe garbage, blood. His breath came too fast, the high edge of panic making his head light, the bitter wash of despair turning his throat to dust. He carried it all with him as he crawled through the snow. Peter was sprawled behind the open door of the car, his eyes wide and glassy. I think... I think I'm shot. Hold on. Nate clamped a hand over Peter's arm where his jacket was torn and bloody. He could feel the warm flow and the anvil slam of his own heart in his chest. With one eye cocked toward the cabin, he dug out a bandana. If there were prayers running inside his head, he didn't recognize them. It's not too bad, is it? Peter moistened his lips, angled his head down to look, and went white as bone. Man! Listen to me. Listen. They tied the bandana tight over the wound, tapped Peter's cheek to keep him from passing out. You stay down. You're going to be all right. Not going to bleed out on me, he thought. Not going to die in my arms. Not again. Please, God. He pulled Peter's weapon out of the holster, closed Peter's hand around it. You got this? I... I'm right-handed. He shot me. You can use your left. He gets by me, you don't hesitate. Listen to me, Peter. He comes out here, you shoot. Aim for body mass. And you shoot until he's down. Chief, just do it. Nate bellied back to the rear of the car, opened the door and slid in. He slid out again with both shotguns. He could hear the man inside the house, raving. The occasional blast of fire. He could hear the sounds of the alley merging with it. The rain, the shouts, the running footsteps. He bellied back to Peter, laid one of the shotguns over his lap. You don't pass out. Hear me? You stay awake. Yes, sir. There was no one to call for backup. This was in Baltimore, and he was on his own. Crouched, the shotgun in one hand, his service revolver in the other, he dashed across the icy stream and into the trees. Bark exploded. He felt the knife splice of a flying splinter hit his face just under his left eye. That meant the shooter's attention was on him now, and away from Peter. In the cover of trees, he plowed through the snow. His partner was shot. His partner was down. His breath whistled out as he tried to run through knee-deep snow, circling the cabin. Braced behind a tree, he studied the layout. No back door, he noted, but another window on the side. He could see the shadow of the shooter on the glass, knew he was waiting there, watching for movement. Nate pumped the shotgun, one-handed, and fired. Glass exploded, and with that sound the screams, the return fire filling his ears. He used his own tracks to run back toward the front of the cabin. Shouts and shots sounded behind him as he cracked through the ice of the stream, scrambled through the frigid water, and leapt toward the front of the house. He barreled onto the sagging porch and kicked open the door. He had both weapons pointed at the man. Part of him, most of him, wanted to cut loose with them. Drop him. Drop him cold, as he had the murdering bastard in Baltimore. The murdering bastard who'd killed his partner and ripped his own life to pieces. Red! In the shambles of the cabin, the man looked at him. His lips trembled into a smile. Your blood's red. And dropping the gun, he fell to the filthy cabin floor and wept. His name was Robert Joseph Spinnaker, a financial consultant from L.A. and recent psychiatric patient. He'd claimed multiple alien abductions over the past 18 months, stated that his wife was a reproduction and had attacked two of his clients during a meeting. He'd been listed as missing for nearly three months. Now he slept peacefully in a cell, reassured by the color of the blood on Nate's face and Peter's arm. Nate had done little more than lock him up before he'd rushed back to the clinic so he could pace the waiting room. He went over the entire event a hundred times, and each time he saw himself doing something different, just a little different that kept Peter from being hurt. When Ken came out, Nate was sitting, his head in his hands. He jerked up immediately. How bad? Getting shot's never good, but it could have been a hell of a lot worse. He'll be wearing a sling for a while. He's lucky it was birdshot. He's a little weak, a little groggy. I'm going to keep him a couple more hours, but he's good. Okay. Nate let his knees give way and lowered to the chair again. Okay. Why don't you come back? Let me clean those cuts on your face. 
Just some scratches. The one under your eye is more of a gash. Come on, don't argue with the doctor. Can I see him? Nita's with him now. You can see him after I treat you. Ken led the way, gestured for Nate to get on an exam table. You know, he said as he cleaned the cuts, it'd be stupid for you to blame yourself. He's green. He's grass. And I took him into an unstable situation. That's not showing much respect for him or the job he signed on to do. Nate hissed in a breath at the sting under his eye. He's a baby. He's not. He's a man. A good man. And you taking on the weight lessens what happened to him today. And what he did. He got up, broke cover, and got to the door after me. He could barely keep his feet, but he came to back me up. Nate met Ken's eyes as Ken fixed on a butterfly bandage. His blood was on my hands, but he came through the door to back me up. So maybe I'm the one who can't handle himself. You did handle yourself. I got most of it from Peter. He thinks you're a hero. If you want to pay him back for what happened, don't disillusion him. There. Ken stepped back. You'll live. Hop was in the waiting room when Nate came out, along with Peter's parents and Rose. They all stood, began talking at once. He's resting, he's fine, Ken assured them, and Nate kept walking. Ignatius! Hop hurried out after him. I'd like to know what happened. I'm walking back. I'll walk with you, and you can tell me. I'd like to get it straight from you rather than the various accounts blowing around town at this point. He told her, briefly. Would you slow down? Your legs are longer than my whole body. How'd your face get hurt? Tree shrapnel. Flying bark, that's all. Flying because he was shooting at you? For God's sake! The fact my face got cut up is probably why both Spinnaker and I are still standing. Fortunately, I bleed red. So does Peter, he thought. He'd bled plenty of red today. The state police coming to get him? Peach is contacting them. Well, she drew a breath. He's been out and about being crazy for three months. Squatting out there God knows how long. He could be the one who killed poor Yukon. He could be the one who did that. Nate found his sunglasses in his pocket and put them on. He could be, but he's not. Man's crazy, and it was a crazy thing. He could have thought Yukon was some alien in a dog suit. It makes sense, Ignatius. Only if you believe this guy happened to sneak into town, hunt up an old dog, brought the dog outside town hall, and sliced his throat having previously stolen the buck knife. That's a little too broad for me, Hop. She took his arm so he'd stop. Maybe because you'd rather believe otherwise. Maybe because believing otherwise is giving you something to get your teeth into. More than breaking up a few fights or keeping drunk Mike from freezing his sorry ass. Did it ever occur to you that you're tying all this together, looking for a killer among us because you want it to be so? I don't want it to be so. It is so. Damn stubborn. She set her teeth, turned to the side until she controlled her temper. Things won't settle down around here if you keep stirring them up. Things shouldn't settle down around here until they're resolved. I've got to go write up my report on this. Nate spent the night in the station, most of it listening to Spinnaker's earnest reports of his alien experiences. To keep him calm, if not quiet, Nate sat outside the cell, making notes and was deeply thrilled to see the state police arrive the next morning to relieve him of his prisoner. He was also surprised to see Coben on the detail. Maybe you should consider renting a room down here, Sergeant. I figured this would be an opportunity to touch base on other matters. If we could take a minute in your office? Sure. I've got the paperwork on Spinnaker for you. He walked into his office, picked up the paperwork. Assault with deadly on police officers, etc. The shrink will soften that up but it won't make my deputy any less shot. How's he doing? He's okay. He's young, resilient. He caught him mostly in the meaty part of the arm. Anytime you walk away, it's a good day. There's that. Coben walked over to the board. Still pursuing this? Looks like. Making any headway? Depends on where you're standing. Lips pursed, Coben rocked back on his heels. Dead dog? You're linking that? Man's gotta have a hobby. Look, I'm not fully satisfied with the resolution of my case. 
but I've got restrictions on me. A lot of it does depend on where you're standing. We can agree there was an unidentified third man on that mountain when Galloway was killed. Doesn't mean he killed Galloway or had knowledge thereof. Doesn't mean he's still alive for that matter, as it's more logical that the individual who killed Galloway also disposed of this third man. Not if the third man was Hallbaker. We don't believe it was. But if it was, Coben continued, it sure as hell doesn't mean this unidentified third man had anything to do with Hallbaker's death. Or the death of some dog. I've got a little wiggle room, unofficially, to confirm the identity of the third man, but it's not taking me anywhere. The pilot who took them up was killed in unexplained circumstances. There's no proof of that. I've looked into it. Kaczynski paid off some debts and made some more during the period between Galloway's death and his own. So that's hinky. I'll give you that. But there's no one to confirm he took them up. Because all but one of them's dead. There are no records, no flight logs, no nothing. And nobody who knew Kaczynski, or will admit to it, who remembers him booking that flight. He may very well have been the pilot, and if so, it's just as logical to assume Hallbaker disposed of him as well. Might be logical. Except Max Hallbaker didn't kill three men. And he didn't come back from the grave and slit that dog's throat. It doesn't matter what your gut tells you. I need something solid. Give me time, Nate said. Two days later, Meg strolled into the station, flipped a wave at Peach, and went straight back to Nate's office. A glance at his board barely broke her stride. Okay, cutie, I'm springing you. Sorry. Even thoughtful, dedicated, hard-working cops get a day off. You're due. Peter's on inactive. We're a man short. And you're sitting here brooding about that and everything else. You need head-clearing time, Burke. If something comes up, we'll head back. From where? It's a surprise. Peach, she called as she started back out. Your boss is taking the rest of the day off. What do they call it on NYPD Blue? Personal time? He could use some. You can cover it, can't you, Otto? Meg, Nate began. Peach, when is the last time the chief took a day off? Three weeks, a little more, by my recollection. Head clearing time, chief. Meg grabbed his jacket off the hook herself. We've got a clear day for it. He took one of the two ways. An hour. She smiled. We'll start with that. When he spotted her plane at the dock, he stopped dead. You didn't say this head-clearing time involved flying. It's the best method, guaranteed. Couldn't we just take a drive, have sex in the back seat of the car? I find that's a really good method. Trust me. She kept his hand firmly in hers and used her other to brush the cut under his eye. How's that feeling? Now that you mention it, I probably shouldn't fly with a wound like this. She cupped his face, leaned in and kissed him, long, slow and deep. Come with me, Nate. I have something I want to share with you. Well, when you put it that way. He got in the plane, strapped in. You know, I've never taken off from the water. Not when the water was... Wet. There's still some ice. It wouldn't be good to run into the ice, right? A man who faces down an armed mental patient shouldn't be so jittery about flying. She kissed her fingers, tapped them on Buddy Holly's lips, and began to glide over the water. Sort of like water skiing, but not. Nate managed, then held his breath as she gained speed, kept holding it as the plane lifted off the water. I thought you were working today, he said when he decided it was safe to breathe again. I passed it to Jerk. He'll be dropping off supplies later. We've got parade stuff coming in, including a whole case of bug dope. You and Jerk run drugs for insects? She slid her eyes in his direction. Insect repellent, cutie. You survived your first Alaska winter. Now we'll see how you fare in the summer, with mosquitoes as big as B-52s. You won't want to walk three feet out of the house without your bug dope. Roger on the bug dope, but I'm not eating Eskimo ice cream. Jesse says it's made from whipped seals. Oil, she said on a laugh. Seal oil or moose tallow. And it's not bad if you mix in some berries and sugar. I'll take your word because I'm not eating moose tallow. I don't even know what the hell it is. She smiled again because his shoulders had relaxed, and he was actually looking down. Pretty from here, isn't it? With the river, the ice, and the town all lined up behind it? 
It looks quiet and simple. But it's not. It's not really either of those. The bush looks quiet too from the air, peaceful and serene, a harsh kind of beauty. But it's not serene. Nature will kill you without a minute's thought, and in nastier ways than a crazy guy with a gun. Doesn't make you any less beautiful. I couldn't live anywhere else. I couldn't be anywhere else. She soared over river and lake, and he could see the progress of breakup, the steady march of spring, patches of green spread as the sun worked on the snow. A waterfall rushed down a cliffside with the sparkle of ice gleaming out of deep shadows. Below them, a small herd of moose lumbered across a field. Above the sky, curved like a wild blue ribbon. Jacob was here that February. Meg glanced at him. I wanted to get that out of the way, maybe off both our minds. He came to see me a lot when my father was gone. I don't know if my father asked him to, or if it was just Jacob's way. There might have been a couple of days here and there I didn't see him, but not as much as a week at a stretch. Not a long enough time for him to have climbed with my father. I wanted you to know that for certain, in case you needed to ask him to help you. It was a long time ago. Yeah, when I was a kid, but I remember that. Once I thought back on it, I remembered. I saw more of him than I did of Charlene in those first few weeks after my father left. He took me ice fishing and hunting, and when we had a storm come in, I stayed in his place for a couple of days. I'm telling you that you can trust him. That's all. All right. Now, look to starboard. He glanced right and watched them fly off the edge of the world over a channel of blue water that seemed entirely too close for comfort. Before he could object, he saw an enormous chunk of that blue-white world crack off and tumble into the water. My God! This is an active tidewater glacier, and what you're watching is called calving," she said as other boulders of ice broke and fell. I guess because in the cycle it's more a kind of birth than death. It's beautiful. He was all but plastered against the windscreen now. It's amazing, Jesus. Some of them are the size of a house. He let out a laugh as another shot off into the air and barely registered the shimmy of the plane in a pocket of turbulence. People pay me good money to fly them over here to see this, then spend most of their time with their eyes glued to the lens of a video camera. Seems like a waste to me. If they want to see this on a movie, they should rent one. It wasn't just the show, Nate thought. The spectacle of it. It was that cycle, violent, inevitable, somehow mythic. The sights, jagged boulders of blue ice heaving themselves into the air. The sounds of it, creaks, the thunder, and the cannon shots. The gushing up of the water on impact, and the rising up of the white into a shimmering island that streamed along on the churning fjord. I have to stay here. She guided the plane up, circling so he could watch from another angle. Here, in the air. No. He turned his head. Grinned at her in a way she rarely saw, easy and relaxed and happy. Here, I can't be any place else either. It's good to know that. Here's something else that might be good to know. I'm in love with you. She laughed as the plane shuddered through rough air, and she punched it through and bulleted up the channel while ice fell around them. Twenty-seven. Charlene had always loved what passed for spring in Alaska. She loved the way the days kept stretching out longer and longer until there was nothing but light. In her office, she stood at the window, her work neglected on her desk, and stared out at the street. Busy, people walking, driving, going, coming, townspeople and tourists, country dwellers in for supplies or company. Fourteen of her twenty rooms were booked, and she'd be at capacity for three days the following week. After that, the strong, almost endless light would draw people in like flies to honey. She'd work like a dog through most of April, into May, and straight through until freeze up. She liked to work, to have her place crowded with people, the noise and the mess they made, the money they spent. She'd built something here, hadn't she? She found what she wanted, or most of what she wanted. She looked out to the river. Boats were on it now, slipping their way through the melting islands of ice. She looked beyond the river. Beyond to the mountains, white and blue, with green beginning to spread slowly, very slowly at their feet, white at their peaks, forever white in that frozen, foreign world. She'd never climbed; she never would. The mountains had never called to her, but other things had. Pat had. 
She'd felt that call blow through her, a thousand trumpets, when he'd roared into her life. Not yet seventeen, she remembered, and still a virgin. Stuck. Hadn't she been stuck? In those flat Iowa fields just waiting for someone to pluck her out. The original Midwestern farm girl, she thought now, desperate for any escape. And he'd come, churning up all that dull air on his motorcycle, looking so dangerous and exotic and... different. Oh, he'd called to her, Charlene remembered, and she had answered that call. Sneaking out of the house on those chilly spring nights to run to him, to roll naked with him on the soft green grass, free and careless as a puppy, and so desperately in love. That burning, blistering love maybe you could only feel at seventeen. When he'd gone, she'd gone with him, walking out on home, family, friends, speeding away from the world she knew and into another, on the back of a Harley. To be seventeen, she thought and that daring again. They'd lived. How they'd lived. Going wherever they wanted, doing whatever they liked, through farmland and desert, through city and tiny town, and all the roads they'd wandered had led here. Things had changed. When had they changed, she wondered. When she'd realized she was pregnant? They'd been so thrilled, so stupidly thrilled about the baby. But things had changed. When they'd come here with that seed planted inside her, when she told them she'd wanted to stay. Sure, Charlie, no problem. We can stick around a while. A while had become a year, then two, then a decade. And God, God, she'd been the one to change, to push and prod at that wonderful, reckless boy, to nag and hound him to be a man, to be what he'd run from, responsible, settled, ordinary. He'd stayed. More for Meg, she knew, more for the daughter who was the image of him than for the woman who'd given him that child. He'd stayed, but he'd never settled. She'd resented him for that, resented Meg. How could she do otherwise? She wasn't built to do otherwise. She'd been the one to work, hadn't she? To make sure there was food on the table and a roof over their heads. And she knew, when he'd gone off to pick up jobs, to take a break, to climb his damn mountains, that he'd gone to whores. Men wanted her. She could make any man want her, and the only one she really wanted had gone to whores. What were his mountains but other whores? Cold, white whores that had seduced him away from her until he'd stayed inside one and left her alone. But she'd survived, hadn't she? She'd done better than survive. She'd found what she'd wanted here, most of what she'd wanted. She had money now. She had her place. She had men, young, hard bodies in the night, so why was she so unhappy? She didn't like to think long thoughts, to look inside herself and worry about what she'd find there. She liked to live, to move, to keep in motion. You didn't have to think when you were dancing. She turned, vaguely irritated by the knock on her door. Come on in. She smoothed her face out, and the sultry smile was automatic when she saw John. Well, hi there, good-looking. School's out. Is that late already? She patted her hair as she looked at her desk. And here I've been daydreaming, wasting the day away. I'm going to have to get out there and see what Big Mike's whipping up for tonight's special. I need to talk to you, Charlene. Sure, honey. I've always got time for you. I'll make us some tea and we'll get all cozy. No, don't. Baby, you look all frowny and serious. She crossed to him and skimmed a finger down each of his cheeks. Of course you know I love when you're serious. It's so sexy. Don't, he said again and took her hands. Is something wrong? Her fingers tightened on his like wires. Oh, God, is someone... something else dead around here? I don't think I can take it. I don't think I can stand it. No, it's nothing like that. He let go of her hands, eased back a step. I wanted to tell you. I'll be leaving at the end of the semester. You're taking a vacation? You're going to be taking a trip just when lunacy is at its best? I'm not taking a vacation. I'm leaving. What are you talking about? Leave? For good? That's just nonsense, John. The flirty smile faded, and something hot and sharp stabbed in her belly. Where would you go? What would you do? There are a lot of places I haven't seen, a lot of things I haven't done. 
I'll see them. I'll do them. She felt her heart sink as she looked up into his dependable face. The ones who matter, her mind whispered, leave you. John, you live here. You work here. I'll live and I'll work somewhere else. You can't just... Why? Why are you doing this? I should have done it years ago. But you get into the drift. Float your life away. Nate came to see me at school last week. Some of the things he said made me think, made me look back over too many years. She wanted to find her anger, the sort that pushed her to shout, to break things, the sort that swept her clean, but there was only dull sorrow. What does Nate have to do with this? He's the change, or the rock in the stream that caused the change. You drift, Charlene, like water in a stream, and maybe you don't notice as much as you should what's going by. He touched her hair, then dropped his hand again. Then a stone drops into the stream, and it disrupts. It changes things. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. But nothing's quite the same again. I never know what you're talking about when you go on like that. She pouted as she turned around and kicked at her desk, and the gesture made him smile. Water, rocks, and streams? What does that have to do with you coming in here like this and telling me you're leaving? You're going away? Don't you even care how I feel? Entirely too much for my own good. I loved you the first minute I saw you. You knew it. But not anymore? Yes. Then, now, all the years between. I loved you when you were with another man. And when he was gone, I thought, Now she'll come to me. And you did, to my bed, at least. You let me have your body, but you married someone else. Even knowing I loved you, you married someone else. I had to do what was right for me. I had to be practical. She did throw something now, a little crystal swan. But his destruction gave her no satisfaction. I had a right to look out for my future. I would have been good to you, and for you. I'd have been good to Meg, but you chose differently. You chose this. He spread his hands to indicate the lodge. You earned it. You worked hard. You built it up. And while Carl was alive, you still came to me. And I let you. To me and to others. Carl wasn't after sex or Hartley. He wanted a partner, someone to take care of him in this place. I kept my end, she said passionately. We had an understanding. You took care of him and this place. And when he died, you kept taking care. I lost track of the times I've asked you to marry me, Charlene. The number of times you've said no. The number of times I've watched you go off with someone else or slide into my bed when there wasn't someone else. I'm done with it. I don't want to get married. So you're just going to take off? You slept with that man the other night. Part of the hunting group. The tall one with the dark hair. She jerked up her chin. So what? What was his name? She opened her mouth, realized her mind was blank. She couldn't remember a face, much less a name, and barely remembered the groping in the dark. What do I care? She snapped out. It was just sex. You're not going to find what you're looking for. Not with nameless men nearly half your age. But if you have to keep looking, I can't stop you. That's been clear enough right from the start of this but I can stop being your fallback position. Go on, then. She scooped up a pile of paperwork from her desk, threw it into the air. I won't care. I know. If you did, really did, I wouldn't go. He stepped out of the room and closed the door behind him. He was dazzled by the light. Nate couldn't get enough of it. No matter how long the day lasted, he wanted more. He could feel it penetrating flesh and bone, charging him. He hadn't woken from a nightmare in days. He woke to light, worked and walked through it in the day. He thought in it and ate in it. He soaked in it. And each night he watched the sun slide down behind the mountains. He knew it would rise again in a few hours. There were still nights when he'd slip out of Meg's bed, walk out with the dogs for company to watch the lights play havoc with the night sky. He could still feel the wound, throbbing under the scars on his body, but he thought the pain was a healing one now. 
He hoped to God it was, a kind of acceptance for what he'd lost and an opening to what he could have. For the first time since he'd left Baltimore, he called Jack's wife, Beth. I just wanted to know how you were. You and the kids. We're okay. We're good. It's been a year since... He knew. A year today. Today's a little rough. We went out this morning, took him flowers. The firsts are the hardest. The first holiday, first birthday, first anniversary. But you get through it. And it's a little easier. I thought, hoped, you'd call today. I'm so glad you did. I wasn't sure you'd want to hear from me. We miss you, Nate. Me and the kids, I worry about you. I'm okay, too. Better. Tell me what it's like there. Is it awfully cold and quiet? Actually, it's around 60 today. As for quiet, he looked over at his board. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty quiet. We've had some flooding. Not as bad as in the southeast, but enough to keep us busy. It's beautiful. He turned to his window now. Like nothing you can imagine. You have to see it, and even then it's hard to imagine. You sound good. I'm glad you sound good. I didn't think I'd make it here. Anywhere, he thought. I wanted to. I didn't care so much until I got here. Until I was here. And then I wanted to. But I didn't think I would. Now? I think I will. Beth, I met someone. Oh? There was a laugh in her voice. And he closed his eyes to hear it. Is she wonderful? Spectacular. In so many ways. I think you'd like her. She's not like anybody else. She's a bush pilot. A bush pilot? Isn't that one of those people who fly around in those tiny planes like maniacs? Pretty much. She's beautiful. Well, she's not, but she is. She's funny and tough, and she's probably crazy. But it fits her. Her name's Meg. Megan Galloway. And I'm in love with her. Oh, Nate. I'm so happy for you. Don't cry, he said when he heard the tears. No, it's good. Jack would find a million ways to tease you, but under it, he'd have been happy for you too. Well, anyway, I just wanted to tell you. I just wanted to talk to you and tell you and say that maybe sometime you and the kids could come up. It's a great place for summer vacation, but June it won't be dark till midnight, and then they tell me it's more like twilight than dark. And it's warmer than you think, or so they tell me. I'd like you to see it, to meet Meg. I'd like to see you and the kids. I can promise we'll come for the wedding. His laugh was a little jerky. <laughs> I haven't moved in that direction. I know you, Nate. You will. When he hung up, he was smiling, the last thing he had expected. He left the board uncovered, a kind of symbol that he was investigating in the open now and walked out of his office. It still gave him a jolt to see Peter with his arm in a sling. A young deputy sat at his desk, punching keys one-handed. Desk duty. Paperwork detail. A cop, and that's what the kid was, could die of sheer boredom. Nate walked over. Want to get out of here? Peter looked up, one finger of his good hand poised over the keyboard. Sir? Want me to uncuff you from that desk for a while? Light came into his face. Yes, sir. Let's take a walk. He grabbed the two-way. Peach, Deputy Noddy and I are on foot patrol. Um, Otto's already out, Peter told him. Hey, crime could be rampant out there for all we know. Peach, you've got the helm. Aye, aye, Captain, she said with a snicker. You boys be careful. Nate took a light jacket from a peg. Want yours? he asked Peter. Nah, only lower 48ers need a jacket on a day like this. That's so. Well then. Deliberately, Nate rehung the jacket. Outside, it was brisk enough and overcast. Rain was probably on its way, and undoubtedly, Nate thought, he'd regret the gesture of leaving the jacket before they were finished. But he headed down the sidewalk with the damp, frisky air blowing through his hair. How's the arm? Pretty good. I don't think I need the sling, but between Peach and my mother, it's not worth the grief. 
Women get all fussy when a guy gets himself shot. Tell me about it, and try to be, you know, stoic about it, and they're all over you. I haven't talked to you too much about the incident. Initially, I told myself I had made a mistake taking you out there. I spooked him when I got out of the car and cited the situation. A squirrel dropping an acorn would have spooked him, Peter. I said initially I told myself I'd made a mistake. The fact is, I didn't. You're a good cop. You proved it. You were down, you were hurt and dazed, but you backed me up. You had the situation controlled. You didn't need backup. I might have. That's the point. When you stand with someone in a volatile situation, you have to be able to trust them. No reservations. The way he and Jack had trusted each other, he thought. So you'd go through the door into the alley, no matter what waited in the dark. I want you to know I trust you. I... I thought you had me on the desk because you were trying to ease me out. I've got you on the desk because you're injured. In the line, Peter. A commendation regarding your actions during the incident is going in your file. Peter stopped, stared. A commendation? You earned it. It'll be announced at the next town hall meeting. I don't know what to say. Stoic works. They crossed the street at the corner to swing up the other side. I have something else to tell you, and it's sensitive. Regarding the investigation our department is conducting, the homicides. He caught Peter's quick glance. Whatever the state police have determined, this department is treating them as homicides. I have several statements from individuals giving their whereabouts during the times in question. Most of those statements, however, can't be corroborated, at least not to my satisfaction. That includes Otto's. Oh, but Chief Otto's... One of us, I know, but I can't cross him off the list because he's one of us. There are a lot of people in this town, or outlying it, who had the opportunity for these three crimes. Motive's a different thing. The motive for the two subsequent arrow back to Galloway. What was the motive for his murder? Crime of passion? Gain? Cover-up? Drug-induced? Maybe a combination of those motives. But whoever it was, he knew. Nate scanned the streets, the sidewalks. Sometimes it was what you knew that waited in the dark. He knew them well enough to do that winter climb with his killer and with Max. Just the three of them. He knew his killer well enough to indulge in, I guess we'd call it role-playing, while they were up there, enduring harsh conditions. I don't understand what you mean. He had a journal. It was on him and left on him. Coben gave me a copy. But if he had a journal, then... He never used the names of his companions. They were on some sort of lark. The kind that tells me if he hadn't been killed up there then, he'd have died on some other climb unless he'd straightened up. They were smoking grass, popping speed, playing Star Wars. Galloway is Luke, Max is Han Solo, and ironically enough, Galloway's killer in the Darth Vader role. The mountain became that ice world they were on. Hoth, I like the movies, Peter added with a little hunch to his shoulders. I collected the action figures and stuff when I was a kid. Me too, but these weren't kids. They were grown men, and somewhere along the line the game got out of hand. Galloway wrote how Han, I believe that was Max, injured his ankle. They left him behind in a tent with some provisions and kept going. That proves Max didn't kill him. Depends on how you angle it. You could speculate that Max decided to follow, caught up with them in the ice cave and went crazy. You could further speculate that Max held the Vader role and killed both his playmates. Those aren't my personal theories, but they're theories and the state accepts the second one. That Mr. Hawbaker killed both guys? Then got himself down alone? I can't see it. Why? Well, I know I was just a little kid when all this happened, but Mr. Hawbaker never had a rep for being, you know, bold and, um, <clears throat> self-sufficient. You had to be both to handle that descent. I agree. Later in the journal, Galloway wrote that the Darth character was showing signs of... Let's call it lunacy, anger, risk-taking, accusations, a lot of drugs involved in this, and from what I've read, a byproduct of the strain, altitude sickness, the high some climbers get from being up there. Nate watched Deb come out of the corner store to take Cecil for a walk. The dog was wearing a bright green sweater. Galloway was worried, worried about this guy's state of mind, he continued as he casually exchanged waves with Deb, about getting them all down safe. His last journal entry was written in the ice cave. He never got out of it, so 
he was right to be worried. But he still wasn't worried enough to take definite steps to protect himself. There were no defensive wounds on the body. His own ice axe was still in his belt. He knew his killer, just like Max knew his. Just like Yukon knew the man who slid his throat. We know him too, Peter. He sent another wave to Judge Royce, who strode toward KLUN with a cigar clamped between his teeth. We just haven't recognized him yet. What do we do? We keep going through what we know. We keep working with the layers until we know more. I'm not telling Otto about the journal. Not yet. God! This is tougher on you. These are people you've known all your life. Or a good part of it. He nodded down the street where Harry stood on the sidewalk outside the corner store, catching a smoke and talking to Jim Mackey. Across from them, Ed walked briskly in the direction of the bank, but stopped to exchange a word with the postmistress who was out sweeping her stoop. Big Mike came out of the lodge and jogged, undoubtedly heading for the Italian place and his daily bout of shop talk with Johnny Trevani. His little girl let out belly laughs as she rode his shoulders. Just people. But one of them, out here on the street, inside one of these buildings or houses, in a cabin outside of town, is a killer. If he has to, he'll kill again. He went to Meg's every evening. She wasn't always there. Jobs were picking up as the weather warmed, but they had an unspoken agreement that he would come and stay. He'd tend the dogs, see to some of the chores. He was leaving his things there, such as they were, little by little, another unspoken agreement. He kept his room at the lodge, but it was more a storage area for his heavy winter gear at this point. He could have moved that to Meg's, too, but that would have been the line, the official, we're living together line. He saw the smoke from her chimney before he made the turn, and his mood cranked up another notch. But there was no plane on the lake, and it was Jacob's truck and her drive. The dogs bolted out of the woods to greet him, with rock carting one of the mastodon bones they liked to gnaw on. It looked fresh to Nate, and he left the dogs playing an energetic tug-of-war with it as he went inside. Nate could smell blood before he was halfway to the kitchen. Instinctively, his hand went to the butt of his weapon. I brought meat. Jacob said without turning around. There were a couple of thick planks of something bloody on the counter. Nate relaxed his hand. She doesn't have much time to hunt these days. Bears are awake. It's good meat for stew. Meatloaf. Bear meatloaf, Nate thought. What a world. I'm sure she'll appreciate it. We share what we have. Jacob continued calmly wrapping bear meat in thick white paper. She told you I was with her most days during the time her father was taken. Was taken? That's an interesting way to put it. His life was taken from him, wasn't it? Jacob finished wrapping the meat and picked up a black marker writing a date on the packages. It was such a housewifely gesture that Nate blinked. She told you this, but you don't trust her memory or her heart. I trust her. She was a child. Jacob washed his hands in the sink. She could be mistaken, or could, because she loves me, be protecting me. She could? Jacob dried his hands, picked up the packages of meat. When he turned, Nate saw he wore an amulet around his neck, a dark blue stone over a faded denim shirt. I've talked to people. He walked into the little mudroom where Meg kept a small chest freezer. People who aren't so willing to talk to police. People who knew Pat and Tutos. He began to stack packages in the freezer. I'm told by these people who will talk to me, not the police, that when Pat was in Anchorage, he had money, more money than was usual for him. He closed the freezer, walked back into the kitchen. I'm having a whiskey now. Where'd he get the money? He worked a few days at a cannery, took an advance on his pay, I'm told. He used it to play poker. Jacob poured three fingers of whiskey into a glass held the second glass up with a question on his face. No thanks. I believe this may be true, because he liked to play, and though he often lost, he would consider it payment for the entertainment. It seems this time he didn't lose. He played two nights and most of one day. Those who talk to me say his winnings were big. Some say ten thousand, others twenty, others more. It may be like a fish and grows bigger with the telling, but there's agreement that he played and won and had money. What did he do with the money? That, no one knows, or admits to knowing. But some say they saw him last drinking with other men. This isn't unusual, 
so no one can say who the men were, and why should they remember such a thing over so long a time? There was a whore. Jacob's lips curved just a little. There always is. Kate. I haven't been able to locate her. Boring Kate. She died maybe five years ago. Heart attack, Jacob added. She was a very large woman and smoked two, maybe three packs of camels a day. Her death wasn't much of a surprise. Another dead end, Nate thought. Did these people who talk to you but not to cops tell you anything else? Some say two toes flew pat and two others, or three others, no more than that to climb. Some say to climb Denali, some say no name, some say Deborah. The details aren't clear, but there's memory of the money, the pilot, the climb, and two or three companions. Jacob sipped his whiskey. Or, I could be lying and be the one who climbed with him. You could, Nate acknowledged. It'd be ballsy. A man who hunts down a bear has got balls. Jacob smiled. A man who hunts down a bear eats well. I believe you, but I could be lying. This time Jacob laughed and downed the rest of the whiskey. You could, but since we're in Meg's kitchen and she has love for us both, we can pretend to believe each other. She has more light now. She's always been bright, but now she's brighter, and she burns off the shadows in you. She can take care of herself, but... He took the glass to the sink, rinsed it, set it to drain, then turned back. Take care with her, Chief Burke, or I'll hunt you down. Noted, Nate replied when Jacob walked out. 28. Nate bided his time. It seemed he had plenty of it. Since he made it a point to stop by the lodge restaurant and see Jesse Daly, it wasn't a problem to find an opportunity for a private word with Charlene. He found Rose taking advantage of a mid-morning lull by sitting down in a booth refilling condiment dispensers. Don't get up, he said when she started to slide out. Where's my buddy today? We have cousins down from Nome, so Jesse has playmates for a few days. He's been showing off his uncle, the deputy, she said with a smile. But he wants to bring them all into town to meet his good friend Chief Nate. Really? He could feel his own grin spreading from ear to ear. Tell him to bring them on, and we'll give them a tour of the station. And he'd radio Meg, see if she could find him a bunch of toy badges when she picked up supplies. You wouldn't mind? I'd get a kick out of it. He leaned over to take a peek at Willow and her carrier. She's awfully pretty. He could say with truth now. Her cheeks had grown plump and sort of pinchable. And her eyes, so dark, seemed to latch onto his as if she knew things he didn't. He held out a finger. Willow wrapped hers around it, shook it. Is Charlene in her office? No, in the storeroom off the kitchen, doing inventory. Okay, if I go back? You'll want a flak jacket, Rose warned as she dumped ketchup into a bright red squeeze bottle. She's been in a mood the last few days. I'll risk it. Nate? Peter told us about the commendation. He's so proud. We're so proud. Thank you. I didn't do anything. He did. Since her eyes filled, he made his escape quickly. Big Mike was at the counter making what looked like enough salad to feed an army of rabbits. He had the radio on to local, and Yo-Yo Ma's deep and passionate cello streamed out. Grab Florentine a la Mike's the lunch special, he called out. Buffalo salad for the heartier appetites. Yum. You going in there? Mike asked when Nate turned toward the storeroom. Better take a sword and shield. So I hear. But Nate opened the door and since he could never tell with Charlene, left it open for safety's sake. It was a large, chilly room lined with metal shelves that were loaded with canned and dry goods. A couple of tall coolers held tubs of perishables with a chest freezer squeezed in between them. Charlene stood among them briskly scribbling on a clipboard. Well, I know where to head in case of thermonuclear war. She flipped him a glance, one that held none of her usual steamy come on. I'm busy. I can see that. I just want to ask you a question. Nothing but questions out of you, she muttered, then raised her voice to a shout. I'd like to know why we're down to two cans of kidney beans. Big Mike's answer was to turn the radio up. 
Charlene, give me a couple of minutes and I'll be out of your way. Fine, fine, fine! She slapped the clipboard against a shelf hard enough that Nate heard the wood crack. I'm just trying to run a business here. Why should that matter to anybody? I'm sorry about whatever's bothering you, and I'll make this as quick as I can. Do you know anything about Galloway having substantial poker winnings between the time he left here and when he went up the mountain? She made a sound of derision. <laughs> as if! Then her eyes narrowed. What do you mean, substantial? A few thousand, anyway. I've got a source that says he might have played a couple of nights and hit. If there was a game, he probably played. He hardly ever won, though, and hardly ever won more than a couple hundred if he got lucky. There was that one time in Portland. He won about three thousand, and we blew it on a fancy hotel room, a big steak dinner, a couple of bottles of champagne from room service. He bought me an outfit for it, a dress and shoes and a pair of little sapphire earrings. Her eyes went shiny, but she shook her head and shoulders briskly and dried the tears up on her own. Stupid. I had to sell the earrings in Prince William to pay for motorcycle repairs and supplies. A lot of good they did me. If he had one money, what would he have done with it? Pissed it away? No. She laid her forehead on one of the shelf posts and looked so tired, so lost, so sad that he risked rubbing her shoulder. No. Not right then. He knew I was on a tear about money. If he'd gotten his hands on some, he'd have played a little, maybe. But he'd have held on to the bulk of it, so he could bring it home and shut me up. Would he have banked it? In Anchorage? We didn't have a bank in Anchorage. He'd have stuffed it in his pack and hauled it home for me to deal with. He didn't have any respect for money. A lot of people that come from it don't. She lifted her head. Are you saying there was money? I'm saying there's a possibility. He never sent any home that time. He never sent home a dime. If he had money and was going on a climb, he'd have left it stuffed in a drawer if he kept his room, or if he didn't keep his room, he'd have taken it with him. The state police didn't say anything about money. He didn't have any on him. None, Nate thought as he went out again. No wallet, no ID, no cash, no pack. Just matches in the journal, zipped into the pocket of his parka. On the sidewalk, he took out his notebook. He wrote down, money, circled it. The saying was, follow the woman, he thought. But a cop knew if money was around murder, you always, always followed the money. He wondered how he could find out if anyone in lunacy had come into a tidy little windfall sixteen years before. Of course, it was just as likely Galloway kept a room, left the money in it. And the maid, the owner of the next person to occupy it, just got really lucky. Or he'd taken it with him in his pack. His killer hadn't opened it up before he'd tossed it into a handy crevice. But why should the killer take the pack at all if not for a reason? For supplies. And woohoo, look what else we've got here. Or just to dump it in a panic, thinking if the body was found it wouldn't be identifiable. But if there had been money, Nate was willing to bet the killer had known it was there and had helped himself. Who? People might wonder why they're paying taxes so the chief of police can daydream out on the street. He shook himself back, looked down at Hop. Are you everywhere? As often as possible. I'm on my way in to get a cup of coffee and brood. And plot. She wore irritation on her face as visibly as her green check shirt. What's up? John Malmont just tendered his resignation. Says he's leaving at the end of the school year. Leaving teaching? Leaving lunacy. We can't afford to lose him. She took out her Zippo, but only stood snapping the top open and shut. Talk around town was she was wearing the patch. He's a superior teacher, and added to that, he's helping carry with the lunatic. He runs all the school plays, heads up the yearbook committee, puts us on the tourist map with articles he gets published in magazines. I've got to sit down and figure out how to keep him. Did he say why he decided to leave, all of a sudden? Just that it was time for a change. One minute we're planning our summer book club, which he heads up, and the next he's packing. Son of a bitch. She rolled her shoulders. I'm having coffee and pie. Pie a la mode. She snapped the lighter violently. I'll get the brain cells working. He's not leaving without a fight. Interesting, Nate thought. Interesting timing. Burke had to go. That was the bottom line now poking and prodding into matters that were none of his business. Well, 
There was more than one way to run a pain in the ass Chichaco out of town. There were those who said Burke had risen above that status now that he'd survived his first winter. But he knew some remained Chichacos no matter what they survived. Galloway had been one. When push came to shove, he'd been gutless and mewling and sneaky. Most of all, sneaky. The man had been an asshole, pure and simple. Why should anyone give a damn that he was dead? Done what had to be done, he told himself as he carried the heavy plastic bags through the woods. Just like he was doing what had to be done now. Burke would be dealt with. Another gutless, mewling, sneaky asshole. Oh, my wife left me for another man. Woe is me. Oh, I got my partner killed. Boo-hoo. I had to run away where nobody knows me so I can wallow in my own muck of self-pity. But that wasn't good enough. Had to try to be a big shot. To take over what wasn't his. Could never be his. Yeah, he'd be dealt with, and life would get back to normal. He hung the plastic bags in the trees closest to the house while the dogs whined and batted their tails. Not this time, boys, he said aloud and hung another one from the eave by the back door, just out of sight of the doorway. Not this time, fellas. He gave the dogs a brisk rub, but they were more interested in sniffing at and licking his hands. He liked the dogs. He liked Yukon. But that old dog had been half-blind, arthritic, and damn near deaf on top of it. Putting him down had been a mercy, really. And had made a point. He walked back toward the wood, stopping at the edge to look back. There were some patches of earth where the snow was busily melting in the sun, where the rains had washed it clear. A few sprigs of green were rising out of it. Spring, he thought and once the ground thoroughly warmed, they'd bring Pat Galloway home for the last time. He planned to stand at the gravesite, with his head respectfully bowed. It was just softening to twilight when Nate got home. He waited by the side of the road while Meg walked over from the lake, over boggy green with thinning patches of snow, he noted. She carried a box of supplies and wore a bright red shirt that made him think of some flashy tropical bird. Want to trade? She looked at the pizza box he held, sniffed at it. No, I got it. And your toy badges. But I like a man who brings dinner. How'd you know for sure I'd be back for dinner? Or were you planning on eating all that yourself? I heard your plane. Finished up what I was doing. Walked up to the Italian place and got this. Figured you'd have to offload your cargo and the timing would be pretty close. Close to perfect. I'm starved. She carted the supplies into the house and straight back to the kitchen. And it so happens one of the things I picked up today is what's billed as an exceptional Cabernet. She pulled out the bottle. You game? Sure. In a minute. He set the pizza aside, laid his hands on her shoulders and kissed her. Hi. Hi, cutie. Grinning, she grabbed his hair, yanked him down for a harder, longer kiss. Hello, boys, she crouched down for a quick rub and wrestle with her dogs. Did you miss me, huh? Did you? We all did. Last night we consoled ourselves with a bear bone and mac and cheese. Jacob supplied the bone and the bear meat that's in your freezer. Mmm, good. She pulled out a plastic bag, shook it so the contents jingled, then tossed it to him. Inside he found silver pin-on stars. Cool. You said seven, but I got you a dozen. You can have some on hand if you want to deputize more kids. Thanks. What do I owe you? You're running a tab. We'll catch up. Open that bottle, will you, Chief? She slid her hand in the pizza box and tore off a slice. Missed lunch, she said with her mouth full. I had to sit down. A little engine trouble, and it cost me a couple of hours. What kind of engine trouble? Nothing dire. All fixed now. But I could use pizza and wine, a hot shower, and a man who knows how to rub me in all the right places. Looks like we can handle all of that. You keep getting this half-smile going on. What's that about? Things. You want to sit down and eat, or are you just going to stand there and stuff it in your face? Stand here. She took another huge bite. Stuff. Okay. Should this breathe or something? Not when I'm washing down pizza with it. Gimme. He poured her a glass and another for himself. Then he pulled out a slice and leaned back on the counter to eat it. 
You know the day Peter was shot? Hard to forget. He used to follow me and Rose around like a puppy. He's doing okay, right? He's fine. But that day, when I saw the blood on the snow, when I got to him and had his blood on my hands, part of my mind wiped out. No, more rolled back. To Jack. I was back in that alley again. I could see it, hear it, smell it. And I wanted to sink away somehow. Just go away. That's not the way I heard it. That's what was going on inside. He'd get this out first, Nate thought. Make sure she saw him as he'd been, as he was, and as he'd hoped to be. It seemed like a long time. A long time crouched there in the snow with him bleeding on me. But it wasn't. And I didn't sink away. No, you didn't. He drew his fire away from Peter. That's not the point. Cutie. She moved forward, gave him a little kiss, moved back again to lean on the counter. You're such a cop. I controlled the situation, did the job and got everybody out of it alive. I could have killed him. Spinnaker. He saw her take that in, just a slight angling of her head. I could have done it, and for an instant I considered it. Nobody would have questioned it. He'd shot my deputy, shot at me. He was armed and dangerous. It wasn't like in the alley with Jack. Then my partner was down. My partner was dying, he corrected. And I was down, and that son of a bitch kept coming. He looked down at his wine while she listened, while she waited. He set it on the counter. There was no choice, and here I had one. And I considered blowing him to hell. You should know that. You should know it was in me to do that. Do you expect me to care if you had? He tried to kill my friend, tried to kill you. I wouldn't have cared, Nate. I guess you should know that's in me. It would have been... Wrong? She finished. For you. For the man you are, for the kind of cop you are. So I'm glad you didn't. Your right and wrong are more defined than mine. That's just the way it is. It was a year ago that Jack died. Sympathy swam into her eyes. Oh, boy. You just keep getting punched in the gut, don't you? No. No, I called Beth on the day. Jack's wife. I called her, and it was good. She was good. In talking to her, I realized I wasn't going to sink again. I, I don't know when I got out of the pit exactly, and sometimes the ground's still a little soft and unstable under my feet. But I'm not going back down. You never were. She poured more wine in her glass. I know people who have, or who probably will. The kind who fly into the side of a mountain on a clear day, or go off into the bush to die. I know them. They're part of the outer world I run in, away from here. Burned out pilots or some outsider who stumbles up here because he can't take the world anymore. Women beat down from being abused or neglected for so long they'll just lie down and let the next man kick them to death on the street. You were sad, Nate, and a little lost, but you were never one of them. You've got too much core to be one of them. He said nothing for a moment, then he reached out, touched the ends of her hair. You burned away my shadows. Huh? The half-smile came back to his lips. Marry me, Meg. For a moment she stared at him, those crystal blue eyes full power on his. Then she tossed the half-eaten slice of pizza into the box. I knew it! Throwing up her hand, she spun around on her heels and clomped around the kitchen with enough violence to have the dogs leaping up to sniff at her. I just knew it! Give a guy some good sex, a couple of hot meals, soften up enough to say you love him, and boom! Next breath it's marriage talk. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? She whirled around to jab a finger at him. Hearth and home, tattooed on your butt. Looks like you nailed me. Don't you smirk at me! A minute ago it was a half smile, and you thought it was kind of cute. I changed my mind. What do you want to get married for? I love you. You love me. So? So? Her arms were still flapping around, and now the dogs figured it was a game and made playful little lunges at her. Why do you want to screw that up? Just crazy, I guess. What are you, chicken? She sucked air in her nose, and her eyes went to cold fire. Don't you play that crap on me. You got marriage fear? He leaned back on the counter, picked up his glass again, and sipped his wine. The brave little bush pilot gets shaky in the knees when the M-word comes up. Interesting. 
My knees are not shaking, you jerk. Marry me, Meg. His half-smile went full-blown. See? You went pale. I did not. I did not. I love you, you bastard. I want to spend my life with you. God damn it! I want to have babies with you. Oh! She gripped her hair and pulled as an indescribable sound ground out of her throat. Urgh. Cut it out! See? He contemplated another slice of pizza. Chicken. Her right hand closed into a fist. Don't think I can't take you down, Burke. You already did. First time I saw you. Oh, man! The fist dropped to her side. You think you're cute? You think you're smart? But what you are is stupid and simple. You've already been through this marriage thing, got the shit kicked out of you, and here you are asking for more. She wasn't you. I wasn't me. What the holy hell does that mean? First part's easy. There's nobody else like you. I'm not who I was when I was with her. Different people make, well, different people. I'm a better man with you, Meg. You make me want to be a better man. Oh, God, don't say things like that. She could feel her eyes burn. The tears rising up from her heart were hot and strong. You're the man you always were. Maybe you were shaky for a while, but anybody is when they've been beaten up and tossed aside. I'm not better, Nate. I'm selfish and contrary and... I was going to say inconsiderate, but I don't see why it's inconsiderate to live your life the way you want. I mean when I want to be. I don't care about rules unless they're mine. And I'm here, I'm still here in this place because I'm half crazy. I know. Don't change. I knew there was going to be trouble with you New Year's Eve when I went with that stupid impulse and brought you out to see the Northern Lights. You wore a red dress. You think I'm such a girl I'll go all squishy because you remember what color dress I wore? You love me. Yeah? She blew out a long breath, wiped her hands over her wet cheeks. <laughs> yeah, I do. What a damn mess. Marry me, Meg. You're just going to keep saying that, aren't you? Until I get an answer. What if the answer's no? Then I'll wait. Work on you a little at a time and ask you again. Giving up doesn't work for me, so I'm done with it. You didn't give up. You were just hibernating. He smiled again. Look at you, standing there. I could look at you forever. Jesus, Nate! Her heart ached, literally ached, so she had to rub the heel of her hand over it. And that ache, she realized, sweet at the center, smothered out the panic. You kill me. Marry me, Meg. Oh, well, she sighed. Then she laughed because the sweetness spread through everything else. <laughs> what the hell? I'll give it a shot. She took a running leap that would have knocked him flat if he hadn't had his back to the counter. Her legs wrapped around his waist, her mouth crushed down on his. This goes south. It's on your head. Goes without saying. I'll be a terrible wife. She rained kisses over his face, his throat. I'll irritate you and make you crazy half the time. I'll fight dirty, and I'll stay pissed off when you win, which will be rarely. She leaned back, framed his face with her hands. But I won't lie to you. I won't cheat. And I'll never let you down when it matters. It'll work for us. He rested his cheek on hers and just breathed her in. We'll make it work. I don't have a ring. You'll need to rectify that ASAP and spare no expense. Okay. Laughing, she leaned back, way back so he had to shift his stance to keep a hold on her. This is just crazy enough to be right. She reared back up, locked her arms around his neck. I think it's time you went upstairs and had insane engagement sex. I was counting on that. He hitched her up a bit and carried her out of the room. When she nipped her teeth into his throat, he took a shaky breath. Does it have to be upstairs? How about on the stairs? Or just on the floor right here? Then later we could... Damn it. The dogs ran barking to the door, and an instant later he saw the glare of headlights cross the window. Lock all the doors, Meg murmured dreamily, still working on his throat.
turn out all the lights, we'll hide, we'll get naked and hide. Too late. But we're going to remember where we were, and after we get rid of whoever that is, even if we have to kill them, we'll pick it up again. Deal. She hopped down. Hold! She ordered the dogs who sat, quivering at the door. She opened it, recognized the man who got out of the car. Friend! She told the dogs, then lifted a hand in greeting. Hey, Stephen! Hey, Meg! He bent to pet the dogs. Hi, guys, hi! How's it going? Uh, I saw Peter and he said Chief Burke was out here. I wanted to see him a minute if that's okay. Sure, come on in. Outside, boys, time for a run! Hi, Stephen, how you doing? Chief? He shook hands with Nate. A lot better than the last time you saw me. I wanted to thank you again, in person and when I was a little more with it, for what you did for me, for us. You too, Meg. Heard you kept all your digits. Ten fingers, ten toes. Well, nine and a half toes. Really lucky. All of us were. I'm sorry to bother you at home. I mean, when you're off duty. It's no problem. Go ahead and sit down, Meg invited. You want some wine, a beer? He's underage, Nate said even as Stephen started to accept. And he's driving. Cops, Meg grumbled. Always pooping on the party. Maybe a Coke or something if you got it handy. Sure. Stephen sat, drummed his fingers on his knees. I'm home for a couple of days, spring break. I wanted to come sooner, but I've got a lot of stuff to catch up on. Missed a lot of classes when I was out, you know. You making them up? Yeah, putting in a lot of long nights, but I'm making up time. I wanted to come when I heard about you, Con. His voice trembled and the fingers on his knees dug in. I'm sorry. I remember when we got him. I, I was just a kid and he was this goofy ball of fluff. It's hard. Hardest on my mom. He was like her baby or something. I don't know what I'd do if anyone hurt my dogs, Meg said as she came back into the room. She handed Nate one of the glasses of wine she had in each hand, then took the can of Coke under her arm and gave it to Steve. I, I know you're doing all you can. Somebody told me you had some crazy guy around. Jesus, he shot Peter. He shook his head as he opened the can. And some think maybe this guy did that to Yukon? You don't think so, Nate prompted. Yukon was friendly, but he wouldn't have gone with a stranger. I just don't think he'd have gone with somebody he didn't know, not without a fight. He was old and mostly blind, but he wouldn't have left the yard with somebody he didn't know. He drank deep. Anyway, that's not why I came by. I just wanted to get that out. It's about this. He hitched up his hips as he dug in the front pocket of his jeans. He pulled out a small silver earring in the shape of a Maltese cross. It was in the cave, he said. Nate took it. You found this in the cave? With Galloway? Scott did, actually. I forgot about it. I guess we all did. He saw this about a foot from... He glanced at Meg. From the body. Sorry. It's okay. He chipped it out. I don't know why. Something to do. He put it in his pack. By the time we all got off the mountain, the shape we were in, the hospital and shit, he just forgot about it. He found it in his stuff and remembered and gave it to me because I was coming home. We thought it was probably your father's, Meg, so you should have it. Then I thought how it should probably go through the cops first, so I figured I should bring it to Chief Burke. Did you show this to Sergeant Coben? Nate asked. No. Scott passed it to me right before I left to come home, and I wanted to get home. I thought it was all right to do it through you. That's fine. Thanks for bringing it by. I don't know if it was his, Meg said when she was alone with Nate. It could have been. He wore an earring. He had a few. I can't remember exactly. A couple of studs, a gold hoop. But it might have been his. It could have been something he bought in Anchorage while he was gone. It might have been... His killers. Nate finished, studying the earring in his palm. Are you going to give it to Coben? I'm going to think about it a while. Put it away, will you? Can we put it away for tonight? 
I don't want to be sad. Nate slipped it into the breast pocket of his shirt, buttoned it closed. Okay? Okay. She laid her head on his shoulder, laid a hand over the pocket. You can show it to Charlene tomorrow. Maybe she'd know. But for now... She set her hands on his shoulders, boosted herself up again. Where were we? I think we were over there. And now we're here. And look, there's a nice comfy couch behind you. How quick can you get me naked on it? Let's find out. He dropped backward, pulling her around at the last minute, so she fell, laughing under him. Her legs were still hooked around him as she tugged his shirt out of his pants, scraped her nails up his back. I expect you to ring the big bell tonight, since I'm an engagement sex virgin. I'm going to work my way up to the big bell. He unbuttoned her shirt, taking his lips on a trail down the opening to the button of her jeans. Ring all the little ones on the way up. Mmm, I admire a man with ambition. She felt his tongue slide over her, his teeth scrape over exposed flesh as he peeled the jeans down her legs. She was going to marry this man. Imagine that, Ignatius Burke, with his big sad eyes and strong hands, a man just packed with patience and needs and courage and honor. She brushed a hand through his hair. She'd done nothing in her life to deserve him, and somehow that made it all that much more wonderful. Then his teeth nibbled along her inner thigh, her system shuddered, and she stopped thinking altogether. He worked his way up her and down her, over her, around her, washed through with the knowledge that she belonged to him now, to cherish and protect, to hold up and to lean on. Love for her was like a sun inside him, shining strong and white. He found her lips again, sank into them, into all that heat and power. In some part of his brain, he heard the dogs barking, a frenzied cacophony that cut through the sexual buzz. Even as he lifted his head to tune into the sound, Meg was shoving him away. Something's at my dogs. She sprinted out of the room, even as he rolled off the couch. Meg, wait a minute. Wait a damn minute. He heard something, something that wasn't a dog sound outside the house and he ran after her. 29. She had a rifle and was yanking open the back door by the time he caught her. He made a leap, slapped the door closed. What the hell are you doing? Protecting my dogs. They're going to get mauled out there. Back off, Burke. I know what I'm doing. Two rushed for niceties. She wrapped the butt of the rifle into his belly and was both furious and astonished when instead of buckling, he stood his ground and shoved her back. Give me the gun. You've got your own. They're my dogs. A pulsing, clacking roar cut through the frenzied barks. It'll kill my dogs. No, it won't. He didn't know what it was, but from the sound of it, it was bigger than any dog. He slapped on the outside lights then picked up the gun he'd laid on her counter, pulled it out of the holster. Stay here. Later, he would wonder why he'd thought she'd listen to him, listen to reason, be safe. But when he opened the door, his gun lifted, held in combat stance, she bolted out, ducking under his arm, whirling her body and the barrel of the rifle toward the sounds of vicious war. There was an instant of wonder struck into him, tangled with fear and a terrible respect. The bear was massive, a great hulk of black against the patchy snow. Its teeth gleamed sharp and deadly in the light as its jaws opened, and it bellowed viciously at the dogs. They went at it, short testing lunges, snapping, snarling. He saw blood splattered over the ground, a pool of it soaking into the thawing ground, the raw smell of it, and the pungent odor of wild animal stung the air. Rock! Bull! Here! Come here now! Too far gone was Nate's only thought as Meg called out. Too far gone to listen even to her. They'd already made their choice between fight or flight, and the bloodlust was on them. The bear dropped onto all four, its back hunched, and the sound it made was nothing like the growls Hollywood assigned to its breed. It was more, more savage, more chilling, more real. It swiped out, razor claws sweeping and sent one of the dogs tumbling off into the snow on a high-pitched yelp. Then it rose up on its hind legs, taller than a man, wide as the moon, blood on its fangs and its eyes mad with battle. He fired as it charged, 
fired again as it got down on all fours to rush them. He heard the explosion of Meg's rifle. Once. Twice. Booming through his own fire. It screamed. It seemed like a scream to him as blood flew as it matted its fur. It fell less than three feet from where they stood and shook the ground under Nate's feet. Meg shoved the rifle at Nate and jumped down to run to the dog who limped toward her. You're all right. You're okay. Let me see. Just grazed you, didn't he? You stupid, stupid dog. Didn't I tell you to come? Nate stayed where he was a moment, making certain the bear was down for good while Rock sniffed around the body, nosed into the blood. Then he walked down to where Meg knelt in nothing but a pair of panties and an open shirt. Get inside, Meg. It's not too bad. She was crooning to Bull. I can fix it. Baited. Baited the house, do you see? Bloody meat. Her eyes were hard stones as she gestured to the chunks of half-eaten meat near the back of the house. Hung meat. Fresh meat at the house. Probably at the edge of the woods. Lure the bear in. Bastard. That's what the bastard did. Get inside, Meg. You're cold. He pulled her to her feet, felt her trembling. Take these. I'll get the dog. She took the guns, whistled for rock. Inside, she laid the guns on the counter and dashed for a blanket and first aid supplies. Lay him on that, she called out when Nate carried the dog in. Get down with him. Keep him quiet. He's not going to like this. He did as she asked, held the dog's head and said nothing while she cleaned the cuts. Not deep. Not too deep. Probably scar. War wounds, that's okay. Rock, sit! She snapped out when he tried to wiggle under her arm to sniff at his companion. I'm going to give him a couple shots here. She took out a hypo, tapped it with a steady hand, squirted out a small stream. Hold him still. We can take him into Ken. It's not that bad. He wouldn't do any more than I can do here. Going to give him this. Make him groggy so I can stitch up the deeper cuts. We'll give him an antibiotic after, wrap him up, let him sleep it off. She pinched a hunk of fur and slid the needle in. Bull whimpered and rolled his eyes pitifully up at Nate. Just relax, big guy. You're going to feel better in a minute. He stroked the dog while Meg started to suture. You keep all that stuff around the house? Out here you never know. Maybe you slice your leg or whatever, cutting wood, power's out, roads are blocked. What are you going to do? Her brows were knitted as she worked, her voice calm and matter-of-fact. Can't depend on getting to a doctor for every damn thing. There now, baby doll. Nearly done. We're going to keep you nice and warm. I've got this salve here. It'll help it heal and keep him from gnawing at it because it tastes foul. Going to bandage him up. Take him in tomorrow, have him looked at. But it's not too bad. When the dog was sleeping under a blanket with rock curled beside him, she picked up the wine bottle and drank from it. Now her hands shook violently. Jesus Christ. Nate took the bottle from her, set it carefully aside. Then he gripped her elbows and jerked her an inch off the floor. Don't you ever, ever do anything like that again! Hey! Look at me! Listen to me! She hardly had a choice as his voice was booming, and his face, rigid with fury, engulfed her vision. Don't you ever take a risk like that again! I had to! No, you didn't! I was here! You didn't have to go running out of the house half-naked to take on a grizzly. It wasn't a grizzly, she shouted back at him. It was a black bear. He dropped her back on her feet. Damn it, Meg. I can take care of myself and what's mine. He spun back around, his face so full of rage, she backed up a step. This wasn't the patient lover. It wasn't the cold-eyed cop. This was a furious man with enough heat blasting out to boil her alive. You're mine now. So get used to it. I'm not going to stand around and act helpless because... Helpless my ass. Who wants you to act helpless? There's a big fucking difference between acting helpless and running out of the house in your underwear when you don't know the situation. There's a big damn difference, Meg, when you try to shove me aside by ramming the butt of a rifle in my gut. I didn't. Did I? Oddly enough, it was his full-blown temper that cut hers down to manageable, that allowed her to think again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was wrong. She pressed her hands to her face, took several deep breaths until the fear, the anger, the shaky aftermath of both eased. Some of the other stuff was probably wrong, but I just reacted. I... She held out a hand, palm out for peace, then picked up her wine again. She slipped slowly to soothe her raw throat. 
My dogs are my partners. You understand. You don't hesitate when your partner's in trouble. And I did know the situation. There wasn't time to explain it. And I haven't taken time to tell you it felt all kinds of good and different things to know you were beside me out there. Even if I didn't act like it, I knew you were there, and it mattered. Her voice thickened, so she pressed the fingers of her free hand to her eyes until she had it under control. You want to be mad? I won't hold it against you. But maybe you could wait to finish yelling at me until I get some clothes on. I'm cold. I guess I'm finished. He stepped toward her, pulled her into his arms, and held on like fury. Look at that. I'm shaking. She burrowed into him. I wouldn't be if you weren't here to hang on to. Let's get you dressed. He kept an arm around her until they were in the living room, and he walked over to put another log on the fire. I've got a need to take care of you, he said quietly. I'm not going to drown you in it. I know. I've got a need to take care of myself, but I'll try not to shove you away with it. Okay. Now, explain about the baiting. Bears like to eat. That's why you bury or seal your scraps when you're camping, while you carry any food supplies in sealed containers and hang them up, away from camp. That's why you build a cache for supplies and have it on stilts. And the ladder you use to get up to them comes down every time you do. She pulled on her pants, scooped a hand through her hair. Bears get a scent of something to eat. They mosey on over to snack, and they can climb a ladder. You'd be surprised what can climb a ladder. They'll even wander into town, a populated area, to get into garbage cans, bird feeders, and so on. You might have one try to get in the house just to see if there's something more interesting to eat inside. Mostly, you can scare them off. Sometimes you can't. She buttoned up her shirt, edged closer to the fire. There's meat on the ground out there, and I bet we'll find some shreds of the plastic it was in. Somebody put it there, hoping to bring a bear in toward the house. And you can be pretty confident that kind of baiting will work this time of year. Bears are just waking up; they're hungry. Someone laid the bait, hoping you'd step into the trap. No, not me. You. And that had her stomach churning. Think about it. Had to be baited some time today before I got back. If someone tried that while we were here, we'd have heard the dogs carrying on. Say you were out here alone tonight, like you were last night. What would you have done if you'd heard the dogs start up like we did? I'd have gone out to see why, but I'd have gone out armed. With your handgun, she said with a nod. Maybe you can take down a bear with a handgun, or scare it off with one, if you're lucky enough, and get off enough shots before it takes it out of your hand and eats it. Mostly, you're just going to make it mad. And a bear who's busy chowing down or fighting a couple of angry huskies? You'd have gotten through my dogs, Nate. Odds are they'd have done some damage before it ripped them to pieces. And if you'd been out there alone with that nine millimeter, you might have been ripped to pieces too. Odds are, wounded bear, enraged bear, he'd come right through the door after you two. That's what someone was counting on. If so, I must be making someone very nervous. That's what cops do, don't they? She rubbed a hand over his knee when he sat beside her. Whoever it was wanted you dead, or in a world of hurt, and it didn't mind sacrificing my dogs to do it. Or you, if things had gone differently. Or me. Well, he's got me pissed off now. She patted his knee before she rose to pace. Killing my father—that hurt me. But he'd been gone a long time, and I could deal. Tracking him down, tossing him in a cell—that'd be enough. But nobody. Comes after my dogs. She turned and saw that half smile was back. Or after the guy I'm going to marry, especially before he's bought me a really expensive ring. He's still mad at me. Not so much. I will always have that image of you standing out there in your red panties, with that red shirt open and blowing back in the wind while you held the rifle. But after a while, it's going to be erotic instead of terrifying. I really do love you. It's the damnedest thing. Okay, she scrubbed her hands hard over her face. We can't leave that carcass out there. It'll bring all kinds of other interested visitors, and the dogs will be rolling over it in the morning. I'm going to call Jacob, have him help me deal with it, and he can see if he can find any signs from whoever left the bait. 
She saw his face, stepped forward. I can see your brain working. Jacob was here today and with bear meat. He wouldn't have done this, Nate. I can give you several specific reasons why, over and above the fact that he's a good man who loves me. First, he'd never put my dogs in jeopardy. He loves them and respects them too much. Second, he knew I was coming home tonight. I touched base with him after I did the engine work. Third, if he wanted you dead, he'd just jam a knife in your heart and bury you somewhere you'd never be found. Simple, clean, straightforward. This? This was sneaky and cowardly and not a little desperate. I agree with you. Call him. In his office the next morning, Nate studied his most recently collected evidence, some scraps of white plastic, which looked like the same material used at the corner store to bag produce, some scraps of meat he'd sealed in an evidence bag, and a silver earring. Had he seen it before, that earring? There was something on the fringes of his memory, a finger tap on the brain, trying to wake it up. A single silver earring. Men wore them more now than they once had. Fashions changed and evolved, and even a suit wouldn't be smirked at for sporting an earring these days. But sixteen years ago? Not as mainstream, not as common for a man. More a hippie sort of thing, or a musician, an artist, a biker, a rebel. And this wasn't a discreet little stud, or a tiny, sporty hoop, not with that cross dangling. It made more of a statement. It wasn't Galloway's. He'd checked the photographs, and Galloway had died with a hoop in his ear. Best he could tell, using a magnifying glass, Galloway's other ear had been unpierced. He'd checked with the M.E. to be sure. But he knew what he was looking at belonged to the murderer. A little back piece, what the hell did they call that, was missing. He could see in his mind's eye that faceless figure rearing back with the axe and the little earring falling off, unnoticed, bringing the axe down, bringing it home. Had he stood there, watching Galloway's shocked face as his friend had slid bonelessly down that icy wall? Had he stood there, staring, studying, shocked himself or pleased, thrilled or appalled? Hardly mattered, Nate thought. The job was done. Take the pack, check it. No point in leaving supplies or the money if the money was in there. Have to be practical. Have to survive. How long before he'd noticed the loss of the earring? Too late to go back and check. Too insignificant a detail to worry about. But it was always the details that built the case. And the cage. Nate! Still holding the earring, he reached for his intercom. Yeah. Jacob's here to see you, Peach told him. Send him back. He didn't get up, but instead leaned back in his chair as Jacob came in and closed the door behind him. Expected you to come by this morning. There are things I want to say I didn't want to say last night in front of Meg. Jacob wore a buckskin shirt over faded jeans, and the thin string of beads around his neck held a polished brown stone. His silvered hair was drawn back in a long tail. His exposed lobes sported no jewelry. Have a seat, Nate invited, and say them. I'll stand and say them. You'll use me to finish this, or I'll do what I have to do on my own, but this will end. He stepped forward, and for the first time in their acquaintance, Nate saw undisguised rage on Jacob's face. She is my child. She's been mine more years than she was Pat's. This is my daughter. Whatever you think about me, whatever you wonder, you will know that. I'll be a part of finding who put her in danger last night, one way or the other. Nate rocked forward in his chair, rocked back again. You want a badge? He saw Jacob's hands fall into fists, then open again, slowly, just as slowly as the rage went under some enigmatic mask. No, I don't think I'd like a badge. Too heavy for me. Okay, we'll keep my use of you unofficial. That suit you better? It does. These people you were asking questions of, the ones who told you about the money? Is it possible wind of that blue back here to lunacy? More than possible. People talk, especially white people. And if that wind blew... It wouldn't be a stretch to conclude, due to your connection to Galloway and to Meg, that you'd pass the information to me. Jacob shrugged. 
Why not just shut you down before you got it to me? And now Jacob smiled. I have lived a very long time, and am very hard to kill. You haven't, and aren't. This business last night was sloppy and stupid. Why not just shoot you in the head when you're alone by the lake, weigh you down with stones and sink you? I would. I appreciate that. He doesn't use the direct approach. No, not even with Galloway, Nate said as Jacob looked at the board. That was a moment of madness, of greed, of opportunity. Maybe all three. It wasn't planned. No. Considering now, Jacob nodded. There are easier ways to kill a man than climbing a mountain. One stroke of the axe, Nate continued. One. Afterward, he's too... delicate to yank it out again, to dispose of the body. That would be too direct, too involved. Same with Max. Stage a suicide. Max was as responsible as he is. He can look at it that way. The dog? Just a dog. A cover, a distraction, and an indirect slap at Stephen Wise. He won't come at me face to face. He pushed the earring across the desk. Recognize that? Jacob frowned over it. A bauble, a symbol, not a native one. We have our own. I think the killer lost it sixteen years ago, long forgotten. But he'll remember it if he sees it again. I've seen it before, somewhere. Nate picked it up, let the cross twirl. Somewhere. He carried it with him. It wasn't strictly procedure, but Nate kept the earring in his pocket as he went about town business. He said nothing to anyone about the incident at Meg's, and he asked her and Jacob to do the same. A little game with a killer, he thought. In that burgeoning spring, while the days lengthened and the green overtook the white, he went about his duties, talked with the people of his town, listened to their troubles and complaints, and checked the earlobes of all the men he came in contact with. They can close up. Meg told him one night. What? The holes in your ear? Or wherever you decide to skewer yourself? She danced her fingers lightly over his penis. Please. He couldn't quite submerge the shudder and made her laugh. Wickedly. I've heard it can really add something to the... Thrust? Don't even think. What do you mean, close up? They can heal up. If you haven't had it for long, and you quit wearing anything in it, they... <laughs> she made a slurping sound. Close up again. Son of a bitch. Are you sure? I used to have four in this one. She tugged her left ear. Got an urge and jabbed a third and fourth hole in. Yourself? You did it yourself? Sure. What am I, a weenie? She rolled over on him. And since she was naked... His mind wandered away from the conversation before he dragged it back again. I wore four for a few weeks, but it started to be too much trouble, so I ditched the extras, and they closed up. She reached over to turn on the light, then angled her head. See? You could have told me that before I looked at earlobes all over town and made notes on who had piercings. She rubbed his earlobe. You might look cute with one. No. I could do it for you. Absolutely no. Not in the ear or anywhere else. Spoil sport. Yeah, that's me. I've got to rethink this now, since my short list is no longer viable. She rose up to straddle him, to take him in. Think later. He dropped into the lodge and spotted Hop and Ed having a meeting over buffalo salad. He stopped at their booth. Can I interrupt a minute? Sure, slide in. Hop made room for him. We're going over what you'd call fiduciary matters. Gives me a headache and perks Ed here right up. We're trying to figure out how to stretch the budget to building a library. Section off part of the proposed post office for it, at least for now. What do you think? Sounds like a nice idea to me. We're agreed on that. Ed dabbed his lip with a napkin. But we need a little more elastic in the budget to make it stretch. He winked at Hop. I know that's not what you want to hear. We get people involved, get donations for materials for labor. We get books donated or go begging for them. People pull together if you get them excited about a project. You can count me in, Nate told them, if and when. Meanwhile, I got a fiduciary type of question myself. 
I was going to drop by to see you, Ed. Bank question. Goes back a few years, so it may tax your memory. No hole in his ear, Nate thought as Ed nodded. When it comes to banking, my memory's long. Hit me. It deals with Galloway. That? He lowered his voice, glancing around the restaurant. Maybe we shouldn't discuss this here. Charlene. It won't take long. I've got a source saying Galloway got himself a good pile of cash playing poker when he was in Anchorage. Pat loved to play poker, Hop commented. That he did. I played with him more than once. Small stakes, though, Ed added. I can't imagine him winning much. Source says otherwise. So I was wondering, did he send any money back into his account here in town before he went on that climb? Not that I recall. Not even a paycheck. We were a smaller operation in those days, as I told you before. His eyes narrowed in thought. Though by the time Pat left, we built an actual vault and had two part-time tellers. Still, I was involved in nearly every transaction. Rubbing his chin, he sat back. Pat didn't bother with the finances. He wasn't one to come into the bank to deposit or withdraw for that matter. How about when he left town for work? Did he usually send money back? Now he did, sometimes. I do remember Charlene coming down once, even twice, every week, more than two months, checking to see if he had anything direct deposited after he left that time. If there was any big money, which I tend to doubt, he might have banked it there or just as likely stuffed it in a shoebox. I'll go with that on the second, Hop said. Pat never did think twice about money. People who come from it usually don't, Ed gave a shrug. Then there's us, he said with a wink at Hop, who have to do some finagling if we want to have a town library. I'll let you get back to that, Nate scooted out. Thanks for the time. He ought to spend his time on town business, Ed shook his head as he lifted his coffee. I guess he figures this is. We need May Day, Hop, if we're going to get that library. Agreed. So far he's keeping it low-key. He's just going to have to see it through until he's satisfied it was Max who killed Pat. Tenacious Ignatius, she said. That's how I'm thinking of him these days. Boy just won't let go. It's a good quality to have in your chief of police. Jacob had been right. Some people wouldn't talk to cops. Even with Jacob there, Nate hadn't been able to squeeze any more juice out of the trip he took to Anchorage. Not that it was a wasted trip. He hadn't gone to see Coben. He should have, he admitted as Jacob skimmed over the lake. He should have taken the earring in, but he hadn't. He wanted a little more time there, a little more time to pull it together. He let his shoulders relax when the plane was on the water. Thanks for going with me. You want me to secure the plane? You coming in? You know how. It's a boat with wings at this point. I know how to secure a boat to a dock. Jacob nodded toward Meg who walked down to meet them. You have other business. Yeah, I do. See you later, then. He stepped out onto the flotation, praying he didn't lose his balance and mortify himself by pitching into the lake. But he stepped safely on one end of the dock just as Meg stepped on the other. Where's he going? She called out when Jacob glided away. Said there was other business. He reached for her hand. You're back early. No, you're back late. It's nearly eight. He looked up at the sky, still bright as noon. I'm not used to it yet. Woman, where's my supper? Ha, ha, ha. You can throw a couple of moose burgers on the grill. Moose burgers, a personal favorite. You get anything more in Anchorage? No, at least not investigationally. And how was your day? Actually, I was in Anchorage briefly myself. And since I was there, I happened to wander into this shop where they happened to have wedding dresses. Really? Stop grinning. I'm still firm on not wanting a big fancy deal. Just a wild party right here at the house. But I decided I do want a kick-ass dress. One that'll make your eyes pop out. Did you find it? That's for me to know and you to find out. She stepped up on the porch ahead of him and gave him a smacking kiss. I like my moose burger well done and the bun lightly toasted. Check. But before we dine, I did a little marriage shopping today myself. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah.
he pulled the ring box out of his pocket. Guess what this is? Mine! Gimme! He flipped the top open and had the pleasure of seeing her eyes pop when she saw the full-cut solitaire flanked by sparkling channel cuts on a platinum band. Holy shit! She grabbed it out of the box, held it aloft, and jumped off the porch. She danced around the yard, crowing out sound as he took his approval. <laughs> Does that mean you like it? Sparkly! She spun laughing circles all the way back to him. This, Chief Burke, is a ring. How much did it set you back? Jesus, Meg. She kept laughing like a loon. <laughs> I know, tacky. And I don't really want to know. It's a killer, Nate. An absolute killer. It's stupid and extravagant, so it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. She held it out, then dropped it into his open palm. Okay, put it on me, and hurry up. Excuse me, but can we have a little dignity for this part? I think we've already crossed the point of no return on that. She wiggled her fingers. Come on, give it up! Good thing I didn't rack my brain trying to come up with something poetic to say when I did this. He slipped it on her finger where it sparkled insanely. Be careful you don't put your eye out with that thing. When do I go splat? Sorry? I just keep falling more and more in love with you. When do I finally hit bottom and go splat? She framed his face in the way that always made his heart roll over in his chest. I don't know if I'm perfect for you, Nate, but you sure as hell are for me. He took the hand that wore the ring and kissed it. If and when we splat, we'll do it together. Let's go make moose burgers. 30. What are these? Meg looked at the ring of keys in Nate's hand, deliberately furrowed her brow. Those would be keys? Why do you need so many keys? Because there are so many locks. Is this a quiz? He jingled them in his palm while she continued to give him a sunny, innocent smile. Meg, you don't even lock your doors half the time. What are all these keys about? Well, there are times a person needs to get into a place, and hey, that place is locked. Then she would need a key. And this place that, hey, is locked wouldn't be the property of that person. Would that be correct? Technically. But no man is an island, and it takes a village, and so on. We're all one in the Zen universe? So these would be Zen keys. Exactly. Give them back. I don't think so. He closed his fist around them. You see, even in the Zen universe, I'd hate to arrest my wife for unlawful entry. I'm not your wife yet, buddy. Do you have a search warrant for those? They were in plain sight. No warrant necessary. Gestapo, delinquent. He cupped her chin in his free hand and kissed her. Opening the rear hatch of his four-wheel, he called the dogs. Come on, boys. Let's go for a ride. She refused to leave the dogs alone at the house now. They went with her, to Jacob's, or on a day when jobs made that inconvenient, to the run at the lodge. He gave the still-healing bull a little help on the jump. Fly safe, he said to Meg. Yeah, yeah. With her hands jammed in her pockets, she headed down to the plane, then turned and walked backward. I can get more keys, you know. I have my ways. You sure do, Nate murmured. He waited, as was his habit, for her to take off.
He liked to watch her glide from water to air and to stand while the stillness erupted with her engines. While he did, he let himself think of nothing but her, of them, of the life they were building. She was already working in what he'd discovered, after the snow had melted, was a pair of flower beds flanking her porch. She talked of columbine and trolleus, and of the wolf urine she sprinkled around to protect them from moose. Her delphiniums, she promised, would reach near ten feet in the long days of summer. Imagine that, he thought. Imagine Meg Galloway, bush pilot, bear killer, illegal entry addict, tending a garden. She claimed her dahlias were as big as hubcaps. He wanted to see them. Wanted to sit on the porch with her on some endless summer night, with the sun ruling the sky and her flowers spread out in front of the house. Simple, he thought. Their life could be made up of thousands of simple moments, and still never be ordinary. Her plane rose up and up, a little red bird in a vast blue sky. And he smiled, felt the quick lift in his heart when she dipped her wings, right and left, in salute. When there was stillness again, he climbed in the car with the dogs and thought of other things. Maybe it was foolish to pin so much on an earring, a small piece of silver, and an unsubstantiated claim that Galloway had possessed an undisclosed amount of cash. But he'd seen that earring before, and he'd remember. Sooner or later, he'd remember. And money was no stranger to murder. He let it sift through his head as he drove into town. Galloway had possessed ready cash and a beautiful woman, tried and true motives for murder. And in a place like this, women were rare commodities. The parade committee had already started hanging the bunting for May Day. It wasn't the red, white, and blue usual for small-town parades. Why would it be usual in lunacy? Instead, banners and bunting were a rainbow of blues, yellows, greens. He saw an eagle perched on a swag of it, as if granting his approval. Along the main street, people were sprucing up their homes and businesses for spring, pots and hanging baskets of pansies and curly kale, both of which he'd learned didn't mind the chill, were already set out. Porches and shutters sported fresh coats of paint. Motorcycles and scooters replaced snowmobiles. Kids started to ride bikes to school, and he saw more Doc Martens and Timberlands than bunny boots. And still the mountains that ring the shimmers of spring that rose into a sky that held the light for fourteen hours a day clung relentlessly to winter. Nate parked, led the dogs to the run. They gave him pitiful looks, their tails sinking between their legs as they trudged inside. I know, I know, it sucks. He crouched, sticking his fingers through the chain link so they could be licked. Let me catch the bad guy, and your mom won't worry so much, and you could stay home and play. They whined when he walked away and gave him a belly full of guilt. He went in through the lobby and tracked down Charlene in her office. I hired three college students for the summer. She gave her computer a pat. I'm going to need them with the bookings we've got. That's good. Local guides always take on a few, too. The place will be hopping with pretty college boys by June. There was a glitter in her eyes as she said it, but to Nate it looked more like defiance than anticipation. That'll keep us all busy. Charlene, he closed the door. I'm going to ask you something and you're not going to like it. Since when has that stopped you? No way to be delicate, he decided. Who's the first person you slept with after Galloway left? I don't kiss and tell, Nate. If you'd ever taken me up on it, you'd know that. This isn't gossip, Charlene, and it isn't a game. Does it matter to you who killed Pat Galloway? Of course it does. Do you know how hard it is to plan his funeral? Knowing he's still in some morgue, and not knowing exactly when I can bring him home? I ask Bing every other day when he thinks the ground will be soft enough to dig. To dig my Pat's grave. She snatched two tissues out of the box on her desk, sniffled into them. When my mother buried my father, Nate said, she walked around the house like a ghost for a month. Longer, I guess. She did everything she had to do, like you are. But you couldn't reach her. You couldn't touch her. She went away somewhere. I was never able to reach her again. Charlene blinked at tears, lowered the tissues. <laughs> That's so sad. You haven't done that. You haven't let it make a ghost out of you. Now I'm asking you to help me. Who moved on you, Charlene? Who didn't? I was young and fine to look at. You should have seen me back then. Something stirred. He reached out to grab the tail of it when she exploded. And I was alone. I didn't know he was dead. 
If I'd known, I wouldn't have been so quick to... I was hurt, and I was mad. And when the men came swarming around, why shouldn't I have taken my pick? Taken lots of picks. There's no blame here. I slept with John first. Her shoulder jerked, and she tossed the tissue into her pink wastebasket. I knew he had a crush on me. He was so sweet about it. Attentive, she said wistfully now. So I went to him. But not only him. I filled up on it. I broke hearts and I broke up marriages. And I didn't care. She steadied herself and for once looked quiet, almost thoughtful. Nobody killed Pat because of me. Or if they did, they wasted their time because I never cared about any of them. I never gave them anything I didn't take back. He isn't dead because of me. If he is, I swear I don't think I can live with it. He's not dead because of you. He walked around her, behind her, and laid his hands on her shoulders to rub gently. He's not. She lifted a hand, closed it over his. I kept waiting for him to come back, for him to see I wasn't pining for him, and want me again. I swear to God, Nate, I think I waited for that until you and Meg went up there, until you found him. I was waiting for him. He would have come back. He tightened his grip when she shook her head. You get to know the victim when you do what I do. You get inside them and understand them better, a lot of the time better than people who knew them living. He'd have come back. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me, she said after a moment. Especially somebody who's not trying to get in my pants. He gave her shoulders a pat and took the earring out of his pocket. Do you recognize this? Mm hmm She sniffled again, flicked her finger over her lashes to dry them. It's sort of pretty, but I don't know. Male? Not my kind of thing. I like splashier. Could it have been Pat's? Pat's? No. He didn't have anything like that. No crosses. He didn't go for religious symbols. Have you ever seen it before? I don't think so. Wouldn't remember if I had, I guess. It's not much of a thing. He decided to start showing it around, get reactions. Since Bing was having breakfast in the lodge, Nate walked by his table, let the earring dangle from his fingers. Lose this? Bing barely gave it a glance before staring back into Nate's eyes. Last time I told you I lost something, I got nothing but grief. I like to get things back to their rightful owner. It ain't mine. Know whose it is? Don't spend a lot of time looking at people's ears, and I don't want to spend any more time looking at your face. Nice to see you again, too, Bing. He put the earring away. Bing had trimmed his beard an inch or so, Nate noticed, and figured it was his warm weather look. February, 1988. I can't find anybody around who can tell me absolutely you were here through that month. I found a couple who think maybe you weren't. People should mind their own, like I do. Max was gone. I hear you had a hankering, let's say, for Carrie back then. No more than any other woman. Seems like a good time to have moved in on her some. You strike me as a man who doesn't let opportunities go to waste. She wasn't interested, so why waste my time? Shit. Easier to find one and pay the hourly rate. Maybe I went down to Anchorage that winter. There was a whore named Kate I had some transactions with. Sewed Galloway. His business. Whoring Kate. Yeah, dead now. Damn shame. He shrugged it off as he ate. Dropped dead of a heart attack between Johns. They say, anyway. He leaned forward. I didn't kill that dog. You say, anyway... You seem more concerned with that than with two dead men. Men can take care of themselves better than an old blind dog. Maybe I was in the city some that winter. Maybe I ran to Galloway going through Kate's swinging door. Didn't mean a damn to me. You talked to him? I had other things on my mind. So did he. Poker game. Nate lifted his eyebrows as if mildly surprised, mildly interested. Is that so? 
You're remembering a lot of details all of a sudden. You're in my face all the damn time, aren't you? Spoiling my appetite, so I've been thinking on it. You get in on the poker game? I went for a whore, not to gamble. Did he mention plans to climb No Name? He was yanking his pants up, Christ's sake. And I was about to yank mine down. We didn't chat. Said he was riding a streak, took a break to bank Kate and was heading back. Kate said something about the place being lousy with lunatics and that was fine with her. Business was good. Then we got down to it. Did you see Galloway again after your business was concluded? Don't remember seeing him. Bing stabbed at his food. Maybe he came in the bar, maybe he didn't. I headed on up to see Ike Transky, trapper I knew used to have a place outside Squenta. Bunked with him a few days and did some hunting, little ice fishing. Came back here. Transky back you up on that? Bing's eyes went hard as agate beads. Don't need anybody to back me up what I say. Dead now anyway. Died in 96. Convenient, Nate thought as he walked out. The two people Bing named as potential alibis were dead or gone. Or he could turn the prism and look at it from a different facet. Stolen gloves, a stolen knife, both left near a dead dog, property of a man who'd seen and spoken to Galloway. It wasn't too much of a stretch to imagine Galloway going back to that game or stopping for a drink with friends. Guess who I just ran into on his way to bang whoring Kate? Small world, Nate thought. Small, old world. If Bing was telling the truth, it might be the killer was worried Galloway had mentioned who else from Lunacy was playing poker and paying for whores. Nate decided to make a few stops, dangling his single piece of evidence on the way to the station. Later in the day, he showed it to Otto. The deputy shrugged. Doesn't mean anything to me. A coolness had come between them, a stiff formality Nate regretted, but it couldn't be helped. I always thought the Maltese cross was more military than religious. Otto never blinked. Marines I served with didn't wear earrings. Well, as he had at every stop through the day, Nate put the earring back in his pocket, buttoned it. It's going around that you're showing that thing to everybody. People are wondering why their chief of police is spending time on a lost earring. Full service, Nate said easily. Chief! Pete said from her counter. We got a report of a bear in Ginny Man's garage off Rancor. Her husband's out with a hunting party, Peach added. She's home alone with a two-year-old. Tell her we're coming. Otto? When they pulled onto the pitted lane a mile and a half north of town, Otto flicked a glance at Nate. I sure hope you don't plan to have me drive this thing around like a maniac while you lean out the damn window there and shoot warning shots over some bear's idiot head. We'll see what we see. What the hell is a bear doing in a garage? He's not fixing a carburetor. At Nate's snicker, Otto grinned, and sobered again as he remembered what was between them. Somebody forgot and left the door open, most likely. They might have a can full of dog food or bird food in there when that dumbass bear went in to see if there was anything interesting. When they pulled up in front of the two-story cabin with attached garage, they saw the garage door was indeed open. He didn't know if the bear was responsible for the mess he could see inside, or if the man's just pitched things in there like it was the town dump. Ginny opened the front door. Her red hair was piled up on her head, and her loose overshirt and hands were splattered with paint. He went around back. He's been crashing around inside there for twenty minutes. I thought he'd just go on, but I was afraid he'd try to get through the door to the house. Stay inside, Ginny, Nate ordered. You get a look at him? Otto called out. I got a look at him through the front when he lumbered up. Behind her there was the sound of insane barking and the wail of a toddler. I had the dog inside and was upstairs working in the studio when Roger started carrying on. Woke the baby. I'm about to go crazy from the noise. Brown bear. Didn't look full grown, but big enough. Bears are curious, Otto commented as they checked their rifles and started around the side of the garage. If he's a young one, he was likely just poking around and he'll run off quick enough when he sees us. Around back, Nate could see the mans had roped off a patch of ground for a garden. Apparently, the bear had tromped through it coming or going and had spent some time beating up a plastic crate full of newspapers and mail-order catalogs. Nate scanned and then gestured when he spotted a brown rump through the trees. 
There he goes. Better give him a little scare, get him running. Discourage him from coming back. Otto aimed the rifle skyward, fired two rounds, and Nate watched with some amusement as the bear hustled its fat rump and ran away. He stood watching its progress beside a man who was on his list of suspects. That was easy enough. More often than not, it is. Sometimes it's not. Meg and I had to take one down the other night at her place. Is that what got at her dog? I had her dog got clawed up some. Yeah. It would have gotten at us, too, if we hadn't killed it first. Somebody baited the house. Otto's eyes narrowed into slits. What the hell are you talking about? I'm talking about somebody hanging meat, fresh, bloody meat, in thin plastic bags on Meg's house. Otto's mouth went tight. Then he turned sharply away, paced off several steps. Nate rested his hand on the butt of his weapon. You're asking if it was me? Otto strode back, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nate. You want to know if I do something that cowardly, that vicious? If I do something that could get two people ripped to pieces, and one of them a woman? He jabbed his finger into Nate's chest, twice. I'll take you tossing my name into the hat when it comes to Galloway. Even when it comes to Max, it galls me you tossed it in there over Yukon. But I swallowed it. But I'll be goddamn if I'll take this. I was a Marine. I know how to kill a man if I need to. I know how to do it quick, and I know plenty of places I could get rid of a body where nobody on this earth would find it. That's what I figured. So I'm asking you, Otto, because you know the people around here. Who'd stoop that low? He trembled. The rage was still on him, Nate could see. He had the rifle in his hand, but even in temper it was pointed at the ground. I don't know, but he doesn't deserve to live. The earring I showed you belongs to him. Interest won over the anger in his eyes. You found it out at Meg's? No, in Galloway's cave. So here's what we're going to think about. Who did Galloway like and trust who could handle a winter climb? Who gained something by his death? Who wore this? he added, patting his pocket. Who considered himself a badass back then, and who could leave town for a couple of weeks without anyone commenting? You're letting me back in. Yeah. Let's go tell Jenny the coast is clear. It was a toss-up who was more surprised when Meg swung by to pick up her dogs. She herself, or Charlene, who was caught red-handed feeding the dogs table scraps. Didn't see why she'd go to waste. These dogs hate being penned up. It's just until Bull's fully healed. They stood there, awkwardly, while the dogs ate. Do you know what got at him? Charlene asked after a moment. Bear. Well, God! He's lucky he only got a few scrapes. Charlene crouched and made kissing noises at Bull. Poor baby! I always forget you like dogs. You never keep one. I've got enough to look after around here. She glanced over and Meg's ring caught the sun and shot light. I heard about that, too. She gripped Meg's hand, pulling it up under her nose as she rose. Joanne at the clinic got a load of it, told Rose, and Rose told me. Seems I might have heard about it from you. He really stepped up to the plate, didn't he? Lucky me. Yeah, lucky you. Charlene let Meg's hand go. She started to walk away, stopped. Lucky him, too. Meg said nothing for a moment. I'm waiting for the shot. No shot. You look good together. Better together than you look otherwise. If you're going to go and marry somebody, it might as well be somebody you look good with. How about somebody who makes me happy? That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Meg repeated. Um, maybe I could give you a party. Like an engagement party. Meg dipped her hands into the pockets of her jean jacket. We're not going to wait very long. Doesn't seem like we need a party when we'll only be engaged about a month. Well, whatever. Charlene, Meg said before she could leave. Maybe you could help with the wedding thing. She watched pleasure and surprise run over Charlene's face. I don't want fancy, just something out at the house. But I want a party with it, a big one. You're good at putting those things together. I could do that. Even if you don't want fancy, you need good food, lots of liquor. 
And it should be pretty. Flowers and decoration. We could talk about it. All right. There's... There's something I have to do now. Maybe we could talk about it tomorrow? Tomorrow's good. Maybe since they've just eaten, I could leave the dogs here a little while, pick up some supplies and things. I'll see you tomorrow then. Charlene went in quickly before she could change her mind. She went straight up to John's room, knocked. It's open. He sat at his cramped little desk but stood when she came in. Charlene. Sorry, I'm grading papers. I really need to get this done. Don't go. She leaned back against the door. Please, don't go. I can't stay, so I have to go. I've turned in my resignation. I'm helping Hop find a replacement for me. There's no replacement for you, John. Whatever you think about... about the other men, I've been bad to you. I knew you loved me, but I didn't let myself care. I liked knowing there was somebody who was there whenever I needed him, but I didn't let myself care. I know. I know that all too well, Charlene. I finally got the belly to deal with it. Please, let me say this. Eyes pleading, she crossed her hands over her breasts. I'm scared. I've got to get it out before I run out of courage. I liked having men want me, seeing that look in their eyes. I liked taking them to bed, especially the young ones, so I could believe in the dark when their hands are on me in the dark. I haven't seen Forty yet. She touched her face now. I hate getting older, John. Seeing new lines in the mirror every day. As long as men want me, I can pretend the lines aren't there. I've been scared and angry a long time. And I'm tired. She took a step forward. Please don't go, John. Please don't leave me. You're the only one since Pat I could rest with, feel quiet with. I don't know if I love you, but I want to. If you stay, I'll try. I'm not Carl Heidel, Charlene, and I can't settle any more. I can't sit in here with a book for comfort when you've taken someone else to bed. There won't be anyone else. There won't be other men, I swear. If you'll just stay and give me a chance, I don't know if I love you, she said again. But I know thinking about being without you is breaking my heart. That's the first time in more than sixteen years you've ever come in this room and talked to me. Said anything real to me. It's a long time to wait. Too long? Tell me it's not too long. He crossed to her, put his arms around her, his cheek to the top of her head. I don't know. I don't think either one of us knows. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Nate pinned his badge on a khaki shirt that carried the lunacy PD symbol on the sleeve. He'd been informed by Her Honor the Mayor that May Day required a more official look. When he strapped on his gun, Meg made a long, Mmm, cops are so sexy. Why don't you come back to bed? I've got to go in early. Should already be there. Including the participants, we're expecting close to 2,000 in town today. Hop and Charlene did some major PR. Who doesn't love a parade? All right. Since you're being so official, give me ten and I'll fly you in. It'll take longer for you to do your systems checks and fly there than it will for me to drive it. Besides, you can't get ready in ten. Can too, especially if somebody goes down and makes the coffee. Even as he looked at his watch and sighed, she dashed into the bathroom. When he came back with two mugs, she was pulling her red shirt over a white scoop neck tee. Consider me amazed. I know how to budget time, cutie. This way we can have some wedding talk on the way in. I managed to pull the plug on Charlene's notion of renting a pergola and covering it with pink roses. What's a pergola? Beats me, but we're not having it. She's majorly bummed because she claims it's not only romantic, but essential for the wedding photos. It's nice that the two of you are getting along. It won't last, but it makes life marginally easier for the time being. She gulped down coffee. Two minutes for the face, she said and scooted back into the bathroom. She and Big Mike have their heads together on this behemoth wedding cake. I'm giving her her head there. I like cake. We're tangling about the flowers. I'm not being buried in pink roses, but we've agreed on a few things. 
like getting a professional photographer. Snapshots are great, but this is a monumental deal, so we go with a pro. Oh, and she says you have to get a new suit. I already have a suit. She says you have to have a new one, and it has to be gray, steel gray, not dove gray. Or maybe it was dove gray and not steel gray? I don't know. And I'm tossing you to the wolves on that one, Burke. You argue with her. I can buy a suit, he muttered. I can buy a gray suit. Do I get to pick out my own underwear? Ask Charlene. There. Done. Let's go. Aren't you ready yet? You're holding up the parade. She laughed when he made a grab for her and let him chase her down the stairs. They were at the door when he stopped, when it clicked into place for him, when that jolt of memory became knowledge. Snapshot. God damn! What? Meg pushed at her hair as he charged back upstairs. You want a camera? Men, Jesus! And they're always harping about women not being on time. She trudged back upstairs, then stared in astonishment while he dragged her albums and boxes of photos from the closet to dump them on the bed. What are you doing? It's in here. I remember. I'm sure of it. What's in there? What are you doing with my pictures? It's in here. Summer picnic? No, no. Campfire shot. Or... Damn it. Just a minute here. How do you know there's a campfire shot in there or summer picnics or anything else? I snooped. Scold me later. You can count on it. The earring, Meg. I saw it when I was looking through here. I know I saw it. She shoved him aside so she could grab a stack. Who was wearing it? Who did you see? She scanned pictures, tossed them out like toy airplanes. Group shot, he murmured, straining to bring it into focus. Party shot. Holiday. Christmas. He grabbed the album she reached for and flipped through to the end. There. Bullseye. New Year's Eve. They let me stay up. I took that picture myself. I took it. Her hand trembled as she peeled back the plastic, pulled the photograph free. The edge of the tree was in the corner, the colored lights and balls blurry. She'd gone in close, so it was just the faces. Nearly only the faces, though she remembered now that her father had his guitar on his lap. He'd been laughing, with Charlene pulled tight against him so her cheek was pressed right up against his. Max had mugged his way in from behind the couch, but she'd cut off the top of his head. But the one who sat on the other side of her father, his head turned slightly as he smiled at someone across the room, was clear, as was the silver Maltese cross dangling from his ear. 31. It's not proof, Meg. Not a hundred percent. Don't give me that cop bullshit, Burke. As he drove, she sat with her arms folded tight at her waist, as if holding in a pain. It's not bullshit. It's circumstantial. It's good, but it's circumstantial. His mind worked back, forward, covering the ground. The earring was handled by at least two people before it came to me. No forensics. It's a common design, probably thousands of them out there during that time. He could have lost it, given it away, borrowed it himself. The fact that he wore it in a photograph taken more than 16 years ago doesn't prove he was on that mountain. A brain-dead defense attorney could smash it in a trial. He killed my father. Ed holds a grudge. Hop had told him that after the run-in with Holly. All those connecting lines. Galloway to Max. Galloway to Bing. Galloway to Stephen Wise. You can add more. Woolcott to Max, the concerned old friend helping the widow with the memorial. Woke it to Bing, implicating the man who might know, who might remember a casual conversation from sixteen years before. Hawley's slashed tires and spray-painted truck, payback for the wreck, disguised as childish vandalism. Money. Ed Woolcutt was the money man. What better way to hide a sudden cash windfall than your own bank? That bastard Woolcutt killed my father. That's right. I know it. You know it. He knows it. But building a case is a different thing. You've been building a case since January. Piece by step by layer when the state basically closed it up. I've watched you. Let me finish it. What do you think I'm going to do? She squinted against the sun. She'd walked out of the house without her sunglasses, without anything but her own bubbling need to act. Walk up to him and put a gun in his ear? Because he heard it in her voice. The dark grief along with the bright rage, he laid a hand over hers, squeezed. 
wouldn't put it past you. I won't. It took an effort to turn her hand over, to return that connection when it would have been easy to yank it back. Stay alone with the storming emotions. But I'm going to see his face, Nate. I'm going to be there when I can see his face when you take him in. The main street was already lined with people staking their claim on position. Folding chairs and coolers stood on curb and sidewalk, many already occupied or in use as people sat and slurped on drinks and plastic cups. The air was already buzzing with noise, shouts and squeals and laughter spearing up through the blast of music from KLUN. Trucks offering snow cones, ice cream, hot dogs and other parade food were parked on corners and down side streets. Rainbow bunting waved in the breeze. Two thousand people, Nate estimated, and a good chunk of them kids. A normal day in lunacy, he could have walked into the bank and taken Ed quietly in his office. It wasn't a normal day, in any stretch. He parked at the station, pulled Meg inside with him. Otto and Peter, he demanded of Peach. Out with the horde where I should be. Irritation marred her eyes as she smoothed the flowing skirt, the color of daffodils over her ample hips. We thought you'd be here before. Call them both in. Nate, we got over a hundred people already lining up on the school grounds. We need... Call them both in, he snapped. He kept walking, one hand on Meg's arm, into his office. I want you to stay here. No. It's not only stupid and wrong for you to expect that, it's disrespectful. He's got a concealed license. So do I. Give me a gun. Meg, he's already killed three times. He'll do whatever he can to protect himself. I'm not something you can bundle away safe. I'm not... Yes, you are. It's your first instinct, but get over it. I won't ask you not to bring your work home or complain when it interferes with my life. I won't ask you to be what you're not. Don't ask that of me. Give me a gun. I promise I won't use it unless I have to. I don't want him dead. I want him alive, rotting. I want him healthy so he rots for a long, long time. I want to know what's going on. Her hands fisted on her hips. Peach filled the doorway. I called those boys back, and now we've got no one out there keeping order. A bunch of high school boys have already run a tie-dyed bra up the flagpole. One of the draft horses kicked a tourist who's probably going to sue. And those lame brain Mackie boys hauled in a keg of Budweiser and are already skunk drunk. Frustration had the words shooting out like machine gun fire. They stole a bunch of balloons, too, and are, right this damn minute, marching up and down the street like fools. We've got reporters here, Nate. We got media attention, and it just isn't the image we want to project. Where's Ed Wolcott? With Hop at the school by now, they're supposed to ride behind those damn horses. What is going on? Call Sergeant Coben in Anchorage. Tell him I'm taking a suspect in the Patrick Galloway homicide into custody. I don't want to spook him, Nate told his deputies. I don't want violence or a panic in the kind of crowd we're dealing with. Civilian safety is first order. The three of us ought to be able to take him down pretty quick and simple. Maybe. Nate acknowledged. But I'm not risking civilian lives on maybe, Otto. He's not going anywhere. At this point, he has no reason to attempt flight, so we can contain him. While we have this parade to deal with, at least one of us will have him in visual contact at all times. He turned to the corkboard. We've got Peach's parade route and schedule right here. He comes right after the high school band. That's position six on the program. They'll go from the school into the town proper, down Lunatic, and out again. We'll stop here at Buffalo Inlet, then turn off to come around the back way to the school to offload. At that point, it won't be as crowded there and we can take him quietly, with minimal civilian risk. One of us can go back up to the school grounds, Peter put in. After they've gotten to the far end of town, clear out the civilians. That's exactly what I want you to do. We take him quietly at the end of the route. We bring him back here and let Coben know the suspect is in custody. You're just going to turn him over to the state cop? Otto demanded. Just here you go, pal, after you've done all the work. It's Coben's case. Bullshit. State brushed this off. Didn't want the mess and bother and took the easy way. Not entirely true, Nate said. But regardless, this is how it's done. How it's going to be done.
He didn't need collars and commendations. Not anymore. He just needed to finish the job. From dark to light, he thought. From death to justice. Our priorities are to maintain civilian safety and take the suspect into custody. After that, it's Coben's game. It's your call. Looks like I'll have to be satisfied to watch Ed shit bricks when you slap the cuffs on him. Bastard killed that poor old dog. Otto glanced at Meg, colored a little. And the others, Pat and Max. Just the dog was most recent, that's all. It's okay, Meg offered a grim smile. As long as he pays for all of it, it's okay. Well, Otto cleared his throat, stared hard at the maps pinned to the corkboard. <clears throat> when they go around the back roads, we'll lose visual, he pointed out. No, I'll have that covered. A couple of civilian volunteers. He glanced up as Jacob and Bing walked in. Said you had a job, Bing scratched his belly. What's it pay? Meg waited until he'd dispensed two ways and sent the men out to take up their initial positions. And where am I in all this? With me? Good enough. She'd pulled her shirt out to cover the holstered thirty-eight at the small of her back. They might question why you're not doing the flyby, as scheduled. Engine trouble, she said as they started out. Sorry about that. The crowd was full of color and noise and cheers with the smell of grilling meat and sugar filling the air. Kids were running around a streamer and flower-decorated maypole erected for the event in front of Town Hall. He saw the doors of the lodge were open, and Charlene was doing a brisk business with those who wanted a more substantial lunch than could be had on the street. Side streets were barricaded against vehicular traffic. A young couple sat on one of the barricades making out with some enthusiasm, while a group of their friends played hacky sack in the street behind them. A television crew out of Anchorage was doing a pan of the crowd from the opposite corner. Tourists shot videos or browsed the folding tables and portable booths where local crafts and jewelry were sold. Beaded leather bags, dream catchers, elaborate native masks hung on folding screens. Plain and fancy mucklucks and hand-woven grass baskets ranged over the folding tables or slabs of plywood set on sawhorses. Though it was warm and sunny, caps and scarves made of kiviet, the underwool of the Arctic musk ox, sold briskly. The Italian place sold slices of pizza to go. The corner store had a special on disposable cameras and bug dope. A spin rack of postcards stood just outside the door. They ran three for two dollars. An enterprising little town, Meg commented as they drove through. It is that. And after today, a safer one. Thanks to you. I don't nailed it. It's thanks to you, Chief. Ah, oh, shucks, ma'am. She rubbed a hand over his. You say that like Gary Cooper, but you've got Clint Eastwood, dirty hairy ears in your eyes. Just don't... I'm trusting you. You can. There was an icy calm over the rage now. If there was overflow, if that rage bubbled up and cracked the calm, she'd freeze it up again. I need to be there, but we can say this is your bear to take down. Okay. It's going to be a beautiful day for a parade, she said after a long breath. <sighs> The air's so still, though, like it's waiting for something. They pulled up at the school. I guess this is it. The marching bands were decked out in the bright blue uniforms with their brass buttons and instruments gleaming with polish. Horns clashed as different sections practiced, and adults in charge shouted out instructions. Drums boomed. The hockey team was already loading up, sticks clacking as they herded into position. They'd lead the parade with their regional champion's banner hiding the rust on Bing's flatbed truck. A test of the recording and speakers had Queen's We Are the Champions pouring out. There you are. Hop, snappy in a suit of hot candy pink, hurried up to him. Ignatius, I thought we were going to have to run this show without you. Handling things in town. You've got a full house. And an NBC affiliate to document it. Her cheeks were nearly as pink as her suit with the excitement of it. Mag, shouldn't you be getting up there? She pointed skyward. Engine's down, Hop. Sorry. Oh, well, poop. Do you know if Doug Clooney's got his boat out on the river yet? I've been looking for Peach or Deb. They're supposed to be driving herd around here, but everyone's running around like chickens. I'm sure he's out there, and Deb's right over there getting the hockey team settled. Oh, good God. God, we're starting. Ed, stop primping for five seconds. 
I don't know why I let them talk me into riding behind these horses. Don't see why we couldn't have gotten a convertible. It's more dignified. But not as much of a spectacle. Ed smiled broadly as he joined them. He wore a navy three-piece suit, bankerly with its chalk stripes and flashy with its paisley tie. Guess we should have had our chief of police behind the horses. Maybe next time, Nate said easily. I haven't congratulated you on your engagement. His eyes were watchful on Nate's as he held out a hand. He considered doing it now, right now. He could have him down and cuffed in under ten seconds. And three elementary kids rushed between them, chased by another with a plastic gun. A pretty young majorette in sparkles hurried over to retrieve the missed baton that landed near his feet. Sorry. Sorry, Chief Burke. It got away from me. No problem. Thanks, Ed. He extended his hand to complete the aborted shake and again thought, maybe now. Jesse ran up, threw his arms around Nate's knees. I get to be in the parade, the boy shouted. I get to wear a costume and march right down the street. Are you going to watch me, Chief Nate? Absolutely. Don't you look handsome, Hop commented and crouched down to Jesse as the boy slipped his hand trustfully into Nate's. Not here, Nate told himself. Not now. No one gets hurt today. Hope you'll come to the wedding, he said to Ed. Wouldn't miss it. Couldn't settle for a local, eh, Meg? He survived a winter. That makes him local enough. I suppose it does. Jesse, you better get back to your group. Hop gave him a little pat on the butt, and he ran off shouting, Watch me! Help me up into this thing, Ed. We're about to go. We're going to walk back down a ways, Nate said as they climbed into the buggy. Things seem under control here. I want to make sure the Mackies are behaving themselves. Stealing balloons, Hop cast her eyes to heaven. I heard about that. Nate took Meg's hand and strolled away. Does he know? She asked him. I'm worried. Too many people around, Meg. Too many kids. I know. She gave his hands a squeeze as the marching band's boots began to click on the pavement. It'll be over soon. It doesn't take that long to get from one end of town to the other and back again. It would be interminable, he knew, with the crowds, the shouts and cheers, the blaring music. An hour, he told himself. An hour tops and he could take him without anyone getting hurt. No need to run into an alley this time. No need to risk the dark. He kept his stride steady but unrushed as he passed the fringes of the crowd and made his way to the heart of town. The trio of majorettes danced by waving and tossing their batons to enthusiastic applause. The one who'd nearly beamed him shot Nate a big, toothy smile. The drum major strutted in his high hat and the band cut loose with We Will Rock You. He spotted Peter at the first intersection and turned his head to press his lips to Meg's ear. Let's keep walking. Down there to the balloon guy. I'll buy you a balloon... Will pass us and we'll keep them in sight a little longer. A red one? Naturally. End of town circle around, he thought. The hockey team would already be done and moving back into town to see their friends mixed with the crowd. The band would head into the school to change out of their uniforms. Out of the way. Most everyone out of the way. And Peter there to move any lingerers along. He stopped by the clown with the orange mop of hair and a fistful of balloons. Geez, Harry, is that you in there? Deb's idea. Well, you look real cute. Nate angled himself to see the buggy, the crowd. My girl wants a red one. Nate reached for his wallet, listening with half an ear as Harry and Meg debated which shape would do. He watched Peter move down the opposite sidewalk, and as the band marched by, taking the sound with them, he heard the clip-clop of the horses. Kids squealed and dashed out as Hop and Ebb tossed handfuls of candy. He passed bills to Harry and continued to turn as if watching the spectacle, and spotted Coben, with his white blonde hair catching the sunlight in the crowd. So, he saw instantly, did Ed. Damn it! Damn it! Why didn't he wait? Panic streaked across Ed's face. Seeing it, Nate began to fight his way through the crowd that was massed into a wall long curbside. He couldn't get there, not in time. He heard the cheers and shouts of the crowd like a tidal wave rushing around him. They applauded when Ed leaped out of the buggy, even when he pulled a gun from under his suit jacket. As if anticipating a show, they started to part for him as he dashed for the opposite side of the street. 
Then there were screams and shouts as he knocked people aside, trampled over them when they fell. Nate heard gunfire as he shoved his way to the street. Down! Everybody down! He sprinted across the street, leaped over shocked pedestrians, and saw Ed backing down the empty sidewalk behind the barricades, holding a gun to a woman's head. Back away! he shouted. You just toss your gun down and back away! I'll kill her! You know I will! I know you will! He could hear the shouts behind him and the fading music as the band marched on without a clue. There were cars and trucks parked at the curb here and buildings had side doors that would almost certainly be unlocked. He needed to keep Ed's focus on him, before the man could use his panic brain enough to think about dragging his hostage into a building. Where are you going to go, Ed? Don't you worry about that! You worry about her! He jerked the woman so that the heels of her jogging shoes bumped the sidewalk. I'll put a bullet in her brain! Like you did, Max. Did what I had to do. That's how you survive here! Maybe. There was sweat on Ed's face. Nate could see it glinting in the sunlight. But you won't walk away from this one. I'll drop you where you stand. You know I will. You don't throw that gun down. You'll have killed her. Ed dragged the weeping woman back another three feet. Just like you killed your partner. You're a bleeding heart, Burke. You can't live with that. I can. Meg stepped up beside Nate, aimed her gun between Ed's eyes. You know me, you bastard. I'll down you like I would a sick horse, and I wouldn't lose a wink of sleep over it. Meg, Nate warned. He's back. I can kill her and one of you first, if that's what it takes. Her probably, Meg agreed. But she doesn't mean anything to me. Go ahead, shoot her. You'll be dead before she hits the ground. He's back, Meg. Nate lifted his voice now and his eyes never left Ed's. Do what I tell you, and do it now. Then he heard a chaos of voices, stumbling feet. The crowd was surging forward, Nate knew, with curiosity, fascination, and horror outweighing simple fear. Drop the weapon and let her go, Nate ordered. Do it now, and you've got a chance. Nate saw Coben come around the back and knew someone was going to die. Hell broke loose. Ed whirled, fired. In a flash, Nate saw Coben roll for cover and the splatter of blood from the bullet that caught him high in the shoulder. Coben's service revolver lay on the sidewalk where it had flown out of his hand. Nate heard a second bullet thud into the building beside him and the sound of a thousand people screaming. They barely penetrated. His blood was ice. He shoved Meg back, sent her sprawling to the ground. She cursed him as he stepped forward, his gun steady. Anyone dies today, he said coolly. It'll be you, Ed. What are you doing? Ed shouted as Nate continued to walk toward him. What the hell are you doing? My job. My town. Put down the gun, or I'll take you out like that sick horse. Go to hell! With one violent move, he shoved the weeping woman at Nate and dived behind a car. Nate let the woman slide bonelessly to the sidewalk. Nate rolled under another car, came up street side. Crouched, he glanced over to check on Meg and saw her soothing the woman whose life she'd claimed didn't mean anything to her. Go! She snapped out. Get the bastard! Then she began to belly forward toward the injured Coben. Ed fired, the bullet exploding a windshield. This ends here! It ends now! Nate shouted. Throw out your gun, or I'll come and take it from you! You're nothing! It was more than panic, more than rage in Ed's voice. You don't even belong here! There were tears. He broke cover, firing wildly. Glass shattered and flew like lethal stars. Metal pinged and rang. Nate stood, stepped into the street with his weapon lifted. He felt something sting his arm like a fat, angry bee. Drop it, you stupid son of a bitch! On a scream, Ed swung around, aimed, and Nate fired. He saw Ed clutch his hip, saw him go down, and continued forward at the same steady pace until he'd reached the gun Ed had dropped as he'd fallen. You're under arrest, you asshole. You coward. His voice was calm as June as he shoved Ed onto his belly, yanked his arms behind him and cuffed his wrists. Then he crouched, spoke softly while Ed's pain-glazed eyes flickered. You shot a police officer. He glanced, without much interest, at the thin line of blood just above his own elbow. Two. You're done. We need to get Ken up here. Hop's query was conversational, 
but when Nate looked up to see her coming toward him, crunching broken glass under her dressy shoes, he saw the tremor in her hands, her shoulders. Couldn't hurt. He jerked a chin toward the people who'd jumped over, crawled under, or simply shoved barricades aside. You're gonna need to keep those people back. That's your job, Chief. She managed to smile, then it frosted as she stared down at Ed. You know, that TV crew got damn near all of this on camera. Cameraman must be certifiable. One thing we're gonna make clear in the upcoming interviews on this unholy mess. This one's the outsider now. He's not one of us. She shifted deliberately away from Ed, held out a hand to Nate as if to help him to his feet. But you are. You sure as hell are, Ignatius, and thank God for it. He took her hand and felt that light tremor in hers as she squeezed his hard. Anybody back there hurt? Bumps and bruises. Tears trembled in her eyes were willed away. You took care of us. Good. He nodded when he saw Otto and Peter working to move the crowd back. Then he looked over, found Meg crouched in a doorway. She met his eyes. There was blood on her hands, but it appeared she'd fashioned an expert field dressing on Coben's wounded shoulder. She brushed a hand absently over her cheek, smearing blood, and she grinned and blew him a kiss. They said it was fortunate no lives had been lost, and injuries to civilians, while plentiful, were mostly minor, broken bones, concussions, cuts and bruises, all caused by falls and panic. They said property damage wasn't extensive, broken windows, windshields, a streetlight. Jim Mackey, with considerable pride, told the NBC affiliate reporter he was going to leave the bullet holes in his pickup. They said, all in all, it was a hell of a climax to Lunacy, Alaska's May Day Parade. They said a lot of things. Media coverage turned out to be more extensive than the injuries, the violent and bizarre capture of Edward Wolcott, the alleged killer of Patrick Galloway, the Iceman of No Name Mountain, was national fodder for weeks. Nate didn't watch the coverage and settled for reading reports in The Lunatic. As May passed, so did the interest from outside. Long day, Meg said as she came out on the porch to sit beside him. I like them long. She handed him a beer and washed the sky with him. It was nearly ten and brilliantly light. Her garden was planted. Her dahlias, as expected, were spectacular, and the delphinium speared up, deeply blue on five-foot stalks. They'd reached taller yet, she thought. They had the whole summer, all those long days washed with light. The day before, she'd buried her father at last. The town had come out for it, to a man. So had the media, but it was the town that mattered to Meg. Charlene had been calm, she thought. For Charlene, anyway. She hadn't even played to the cameras, but had stood, as dignified as Meg had ever seen her, with her hand gripped in the professor's. Maybe they'd make it. Maybe they wouldn't. Life was full of maybes. But she knew one sure thing. Saturday next, she would stand out here in the light of the summer night, with the lake and the mountains in front of her, and marry the man she loved. Tell me, she said. Tell me what you found out today when you went down to talk to Coben. He knew she'd ask. He knew they'd talk it through, not just because of her father, but because what he himself did, who he was, mattered to her. Ed switched lawyers, got a hot shot from outside. He's claiming your father was self-defense. That Galloway went crazy and he feared for his life and panicked. He's a banker and he kept bankers' records. He's saying he won the 12000 that suddenly showed up in his account in March of that year but they'll have witnesses that say different, so it won't fly. He says he had nothing to do with the rest of it, absolutely nothing. That won't fly either. There was a cloud of mosquitoes near the edge of the woods. They buzzed like a chainsaw and made him grateful for the bug dope he'd slathered on before coming outside. He turned his head to kiss her cheek. Sure you want to hear this? Keep going. His wife's turned inside out, enough so she's spilled enough to rip his alibis for the time of Max's death and Yukon's. Put that in with the yellow spray paint in his tool shed, and Harry stating Ed bought some fresh meat from him the day we had our little encounter with the bear. Weave it all together, you've got a tight little net. Added to all that is the fact that he held a gun to a tourist's head, shot a state cop, and our chief of police. She gave his bicep a quick kiss. All of which, she added, was caught for the record by the NBC cameraman. She stretched, one long, sinuous move. Great TV.
our brave and handsome hero shooting the bastard's leg out from under him while he himself was wounded. Flesh wound. Standing that bastard down like Cooper in high noon. I'm no Grace Kelly, but I get hot just thinking about it. Gosh, ma'am. You slapped at a sparrow-sized mosquito that got through the dope. It weren't nothing. And I look pretty damn good myself. Even when you sent me to the damn sidewalk. You look even better now. The lawyers will try to work it. Diminished capacity, temporary insanity, but... It won't fly. Meg finished. Coben will wrap him up, or the DA will. Got their teeth in it now. If Coben had listened to you, you'd have wrapped him up without all that show. Maybe. You could have killed him. Nate took a small sip of beer and listened to an eagle cry. You wanted him alive. I aim to please. You do please. You wouldn't have done it either. Meg stretched out her legs, looked down at the worn toes of her ancient gardening boots. Probably needed new. Don't be too sure, Nate. He's not the only one who can bait. You were razzing him, Meg, pushing his button so he'd pull the gun off her and try for one of us. Did you see her eyes? No. I was looking at his. I did. I've seen that kind of scared before. A rabbit with its leg caught in a trap. She paused to rub the dogs when they galloped up. If you tell me, no matter how many fancy lower 48 lawyers he hires, that he'll go to jail for a long, long time, I'll believe you. He'll go to jail for a long, long time. Okay, then. Case closed. Would you like to take a walk down by the lake? He drew her hand to his lips. I believe I would. And would you then like to lie down on the bank of the lake and make love until we're too weak to move? I believe I would. The mosquitoes will probably eat us alive. Some things are worth the risk. He was, she thought. She rose, held out a hand for his. You know, in a little while, when we have sex, it'll be all legal. That going to take any of the spark out of it for you? Not a bit. He looked up at the sky again. I like the long days, but I don't mind the long nights anymore, because I've got the light. He wrapped his arm around her shoulder to draw her close to his side. I've got the light right here. He watched the sun, so reluctant to set, glimmer on the cool, deep water, and the mountains, so fierce and so white, mirrored their eternal winter on the summer blue. Thank you.